This is Audible. Barbarian Conqueror Princesses of the Ironbound, Book Six. Written by Aaron Crash. Narrated by Stephanie Savannah. Summary The one last ring might be one ring too many. Ymir now has six beautiful wives, seven Akiric rings, and only a year left before he graduates from Old Ironbound, if war doesn't kill them all first. The demon king from the southern continent has come to conquer Thera, but there's a new winged warrior at the school who might have the secret to stopping him. And that secret includes forging the last magical ring, delving into forbidden texts, exploring alchemical necromancy, and uncovering the obscure history of an ancient deathless emperor. Ymir and his wives have never been closer to understanding the true nature of the lonely man's curse. To finish his journey, the barbarian with Aduja will need more potions, more wives, and one final delicious encounter the whole harem has been waiting for. One thing is for sure, demons or not, Ymir won't stop until he has conquered the world. Chapter 1 Ymir, son of Yamak of the Black Wolf Clan, left the Grand Library of Kifu Yunliram University bearing a dozen books that weighed down his satchel. The sun was sinking into the west, and the light was finally softening after another hot summer day. He'd been in Four Roads, the heart of the Holy Theranus Empire, for nearly two weeks, and part of him couldn't believe it. From Castle Skyreach to the World Square to the Dynasty Bridge spanning Long River, he'd studied so much of the city's history that the place seemed almost familiar to him. It was a pity that in a little more than a week, he'd have to make the long journey back to Old Ironbound. He had to get back and finish up his last year at the Magestrial Collegium Universitas, and he had to forge the eighth and last Akiric Ring. It was why he and his wives had journeyed south to four roads at the center of the continent, to look for information on ringology and the Night of Fire. Ymir knew what had happened on the night Egil Acrador died, but in order to write a book, he would need sources other than the visions he'd had while wearing the veiled tear ring. In the end, the Lyrum Archive had books that Old Ironbound didn't have. Lily Nehenna and Gatha caught up to him. They walked together toward the gates of the university. The Kifuyun Lyrum University was the oldest school on Thera. It was a sprawling place with ancient buildings and stone walls. The iron on the gate was rusted. Gatha growled, I wouldn't check out books to strangers, especially since they don't have the form magic to keep their books from falling apart. Gatha had her tusks out. Even then, she was beautiful and savage, in her worn leather tunic with her white hair braided. Her sandal straps reached to her knees. It's our fame, Lily said in a quiet voice. Next to Gatha's green skin, Lily looked so pale. Her platinum blonde hair was also braided, and her green eyes were alive and bright, taking in the sights. She's right. Ymir walked with the two women at his side. The head archivist, Becca Villar, knew who we were. Della told Kifu Yun Lirum's princept, Ojan Tej, we were coming. Gatha laughed. But she didn't tell her what you were studying, did she? Ymir laughed along with her. No, Della is very good at keeping secrets. Scholars in robes hurried along pathways lit with sunfire lanterns. The big front gate led them to Dynasty Bridge and then on to the World Square, the biggest marketplace on Thera, where all the guild halls were, along with any number of casinos and brothels. The Undergem Guild's pyramid was on the left side of the square. Their room was five floors up, in the middle and on the side, so they had two full walls of windows. Ymir, Gatha, and Lily walked through the throngs of students, guild members, tourists, 
and other travelers. Food stalls on the Dynasty Bridge were open, frying all manner of meats and vegetables. Ymir was tempted by fish grilling on sunfire coals, but Tori would be furious if they didn't eat her cooking. It would be ready by the time they got home. Ymir spoke to Lily as they walked. Gatha stayed a couple steps behind them, a hand on the pommel of her curved sword as she scanned the crowd for trouble. As if anyone would want to rob them for their books, however elaborately bound. What did you check out? Ymir asked. Lily looked pained. Don't ask. It's just a storybook, written by a friend of my mother's. I came upon it quite by accident. Your mother? Ymir was surprised. Lily's mother had cut Lily off when she'd been marked as sullied. Lily's mother had attended the gruel gladiatorial death match at Old Ironbound, but she hadn't even tried to speak with her disgraced daughter, even before her husband, King Sabor, had been slain. Lily sighed. My mother. She and my father had a friend, Edrin Hyendel, who lived in Four Roads. He was a writer. Lily wore a sleeveless gown and delicate sandals. A few elves walked by and grimaced, both at the stylized S and her bare left arm. Was, Ymir asked. Is a writer, I suppose. He hasn't published much in centuries, though. He supposedly chased, which, as you know, is important to the Olira. There have been many rumors about him. Some say he didn't wear his S's when he was young, that he was a wild rogue, an adventurer, but then he put on his cuff to become a scholar, if not a true artist. My parents spoke of him often when I was younger. I didn't even know he was still alive. How do you know anything about him? Ymir asked. Lily adjusted the strap of her own satchel, weighted down by the old elf's storybook. A sand letter from my mother. I... I sent her a letter, saying I was coming to Four Roads. She mentioned Edrin was alive, though his health was failing. He's ancient for an Oliran, nearly twelve hundred years old. Most of us only live to a thousand. A thousand years, Ymir mused. What adventures we'll have in our thousand years, Lily. What wonders we'll see. What things we shall do. We, my love? Lily tilted her head. You won't get so many years. And I will live centuries in agony. Her voice broke. Ymir took her hand. If Egil Acrador could rule for a thousand years, I can love you for twice that long. I'm surprised that you sent a letter to your mother. Why would you pursue her affections when she has spurned you at every turn? Lily didn't say anything for a long time. Ymir squeezed her hand. My grandmother Rabbit used to tell me that it's foolish to enter a tent where you aren't welcome. She'd say the wind might be cold, but the hatred of a bad family is colder. I believe she spoke the truth there. She'd say a good family's love is like fire, and that fire can warm friends and strangers alike. Her words are beautiful. Lily leaned in close to him. Before school ended, my mother sent me a sand letter. She asked that I tell her if I left old Ironbound, that perhaps we could speak to each other. About father. About our family. About our future. She made the first move. I answered it. And you didn't tell me? Ymir asked. I could hardly admit it to myself. I could hardly hope. I thought nothing would come from it, and so I sent her a sand letter telling her I was coming here. She said she couldn't come now, but she would come soon to the Magestrial, to see me. She then mentioned our old family friend, and said that if I wanted, I could check with the Painted Pen Guild to see where he lived. I don't think I will, though. I would like to see this book he wrote. It's beautifully bound. Perhaps I'll do something similar for my book. Ymir pulled her in close. We'll make the crippled cicada a work of art, my love, when you finish it.
Lily let out a tortured breath. If I finish it. You will, Gatha snarled behind them. Even if I have to chain you to your desk. Lily turned and smiled. You'd like to chain me up, I think. Gatha retracted her tusks and tilted her head. Then she smiled. You know I would, Lily Nehenna. They left the Dynasty Bridge and made their way to the center of the World Square. There they stopped, craning their necks at the guild halls to the north and south, as well as Castle Skyreach to the west. There were gambling halls and taverns and cramped apartments surrounding the marketplace. The biggest and brightest casinos were clustered around the Undergem Guild Hall. The size of the city strained Ymir's mind. To think, they were standing in a place so rich in history. How many countless souls had lived and died in the streets around them? For a moment, he didn't want to leave. He glanced down to see his feet standing on the spot where the four roads connected. There was a plaque there with writing in ancient Theranus. From here to everywhere, all roads are hopeful for the traveler who walks with a full heart. Currently, there were more than four roads that met in the city, but historically, there had only been the four. One led north to the orcs and the dwarves that lived in the Sunset Mountains. One led south to the Swamp Coast. One led east to the elves in Greenholm. One led west to the Sorrow Coast, to the humans there and to the mermaids who swam in the waters of the Weeping Sea. The whole world met here, and that was why it was called the World Square. Ymir turned to Lily. He bent and kissed her cheek. You are my love, my woman, and my wife. I am grateful to be here with you. Lily gripped him. Gatha didn't join them. She was keeping watch. Let's get back to our rooms before we start the lovemaking. Besides, I want to read this old elf storybook. The illustrations are gorgeous, and the text looks mildly interesting. It should be far better than the books I have. So far, Ymir's research had only frustrated him. History, as the people of the South told it, was a lie. Why else would they write such nonsense about the death of Egil Acrador? Even in the tundra, a warrior might add little flourishes to his deeds when he returned from a hunt. But like Grandfather Bear always said, the truth is buried at the heart of a good story. The Southerners didn't just believe the lies some of their so-called historians fashioned. They embraced them. Getha prodded them to keep walking. The day had been hot, but the lands around them were dry, and so the night cooled the air quickly. A breeze from the west helped. The stalls around them sold all sorts of things, from candies to dressers to books to weapons and armor. Sorcerers sold little magical baubles. Every so often, a barker would send flames shooting through the air. Other merchants used moon's magic to draw the attention of potential customers. Lightning crackled here and there, lighting the faces of people from any number of races. Humans from all across the continent had come to steal, to barter, to brag. Dwarven merchants waddled along, while gruel soldiers looked for a fight. Elves stood back, judging everyone. There were a few merfolk, rough-looking women and hulking men, with products from the Weeping Sea or the Blue Sea to the south. Winkin in armor, armed with spears, looked about in wonder. They were ragged, probably refugees fleeing the war on the southern continent of Reta. King Shapta, a demon conqueror, had been seizing cities there. So far, Thera had not felt his evil at all. Gruel guards, members of the Bloody Dawn Guild, guarded the front entrance of the Undergem Guild, though no one would be stupid enough to try to trifle with the merchant's guild. The foolish saw the guild's mistress as a silly fairy, but the wise knew of her ruthlessness. Few could guess the truth, that the merchant guild was run by powerful fairies who controlled most of the commerce on the continent. On the ground floor was the most famous of casinos, and from inside came the shouts of winners, the groans of losers, and the rough yells of the drunks. 
Ymir thought that he'd like to come back to play Seven Devils in the gambling hall. However, he also knew that it would be foolish to waste money in there. He thought back to all of the clansmen who'd lost a season of pelts in the gambling houses of Summertown on the coast. He'd have to be careful, but he also could afford to lose a fortune in there. At this point, he'd spent far more time in the library than the casino. Oh, how his life changed. Ymir, Lily, and Gatha tipped their heads, and the orc guard stepped back. It was five sets of stairs to get up to their rooms, but they wouldn't be doing that climb. Queen Dilly Day Everjewel, Ziziva's mother, had asked them to check in with the guards before casting any magic. So once the guards nodded, Ymir and his two wives all murmured the same thing. Calum Kalorum. The three went floating up the side of the pyramid and onto the balcony of their rooms. Standing on the marble balcony, they immediately heard the tiny cries of little Gertie. And they heard Jenny Bell shout something. From the kitchen came the sound of Tori cooking and yelling, Dinner is almost ready! Where is Ymir? We're here! Gatha roared. Finally! Tori called back. Lily winced. We must have the loudest family in all of Thera. Ymir strode inside the suites. The floors were polished wood, and not just any wood, but wood from the sacred sanctum tree, which was precious and expensive. The Undergem Guild could afford it. There were bookcases in the main living room, and three sets of bathrooms, where flow magic kept the water warm. There were three spacious bedrooms as well. Ymir slept in the front master suite, which had a balcony of its own and a view of the university across the long river. He could also look down into the world square, which provided him endless entertainment. At the back, near the door, was a full kitchen with a connected dining area. Ymir kicked off his boots and felt plush red carpet under his toes. He set his satchel on the table and started stacking books. Calum Kalaram! Tori sent dishes flying onto the table, and Ymir snatched up his tomes. Tori had flour on her freckled face, and her red hair was frizzy. She looked a bit frazzled, but then she gave him a huge smile. Don't you start reading, Mr. Man. We're about to eat dinner. I have a stuffed quail recipe. You stuff the bird full of bacon and cheese and fry it. You'll like it. Sit, sit. I also have fruit. The happy little dwab reconsidered. Don't sit. Go help Ziziva with your daughter. Gertie has had quite a day, I'll tell you what. She is not a happy little woggle baby. Ymir put the books back in his satchel and set it near the bookcase. He hurried over, hugged the dwab, and kissed her cheek. She smelled like her own sweetness mixed with cooking and kitchen grease. The wide little woman giggled before pushing him away. I know, I know, I'm very sweet. But I'm busy with the final bit of dinner. Ziziva needs you. Ymir loved his little dwab like he loved his fairy wife. As for his little baby Gertie, Ymir couldn't wait to see her and hold his tiny daughter in his hand. Dinner and his books would have to wait. There probably wouldn't be anything important in them anyway. Just more lies. Chapter Two Ymir was on his way to check on his fairy wife and baby when Jenny Bell handed him a glass of wine. She looked good, a little blush on her white cheeks, her black hair fixed up perfectly. Her blue eyes sparkled. She might have been a little drunk. Hey, baby, you're going to need a glass of wine for this. Gertie is pissed, and I don't blame her. I shopped all day and only found one dress that I could tolerate. Ymir kissed the swamp witch. Shopping all day? I thought you were going to see about more of your swamp magic. Your blood cross mist is powerful, but how can we use it as armor? You don't think I should use my ice armor? Jenny asked with a pout. What's wrong with my ice armor? Ymir left her before he got himself in more trouble. I want to see you in that dress you bought, but I'm serious about the magic. Magic, 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 Jenny Bell sighed. 
Why do magic when I can gossip? I had tea with one of my great-great aunties. She's one of the refugees from the Swamp Coast trouble, which is only getting worse because my fucking sister is so stupid. She's murdering people she don't need to, which is generally a bad idea. You'll want to hear the news. I do, Ymir agreed. I will. He left her and found both Gatha and Lily in the side bedroom, which had a bed, desk, and bookcase, but also a little perch for fairies. It was a room within the room, so the Fei could be comfortable. Ymir liked to sit in a chair by the window that showed the lights of the city, especially the gambling halls, which employed sunfire magic and moon's magic to create light shows to lure in customers. Across the room from the window, Ziziva sat on the balcony of her perch. The fairy mother was trying to breastfeed little Gertie, but wasn't having much luck. The little blonde fairy woman looked beyond exhausted. Yamiri, my dearie, it's been a day. You've been gone, but at home I stay. The baby cries, and I don't know why. The baby cries while the swamp witch sighs. Ziziva was so tired, she'd slipped into her winkle tongue. I heard that, Jenny Bell shouted from the other room. Little Gertie must have smelled him, because she turned from Ziziva's breast to give Ymir a big, toothless smile. Ymir opened his palm, and Ziziva laid her baby in his hand. Covered in her little gown, Gertie kicked her legs. She swung her arms. She gurgled at him. Love filled Ymir's heart. It was the strangest of things to be holding his little daughter in his hand. He gently curled his fingers around her. She immediately wrapped her tiny arms around his finger and started gnawing on it. He hardly felt her teeth. Ziziva let out a scream of frustration. You won't leave me tomorrow, Ymir. You'll stay here with your dear and bring her cheer. Now I'm going to fly away from the cry before I die but I'll be back for the next feeding attack. I'll get myself a snack. But yes, I'll be back. I'll be back. The fairy girl flew off into the other room. The sound of glass shattering followed. And then Jenny screamed, Watch the wine, bitch. It's expensive. Ziziva laughed in a little screechy voice. We can afford it, you bad Jenny Jenny, not helping me and complaining all the time. Bye-bye, baby, bye-bye. Lily looked pained. I'll go help clean up. I wish Ziziva wouldn't tease Jenny so. The elf girl left the room. Gatha knelt next to Ymir, her eyes on the baby. Jenny and Ziziva burn each other because both burn so bright. It's their similarities that trouble them. Ymir had to think about that for a minute. Then he realized that Jenny and Ziziva had both grown up in secretive families that had forced them to watch every word they said, and the expectations laid on them were equally as heavy. They were both royalty and had felt the demands of their positions. Both could lie so very well, though they took little pleasure in it. You are wise, Gatha Dragonslayer. And you are wise to call me that, Ymir Virtorg. The she orc grinned at him. She had killed a dragon, and Ymir had earned the title of Virtorg, or Conqueror, when he'd helped kill Gulnash the Betrayer. In a very real sense, he could have walked right up to the Blood Steps and claimed leadership over the three city-states there. Of course, he'd have to fight to prove himself in the fighting pits of Sunash, Rucklor, and Goyote, but that wouldn't be a problem. For now, Glaga the Blade was on her way to winning over the hearts of the Gruul, even as she won tournament after tournament. Gatha said she didn't care about the blood steps, but even Gatha listened for news of Glaga's latest victory. Gatha touched Ymir's arm. I needed that victory. I needed to be the one to kill Unger. Thank you. You are mighty, Gatha of the Magestrial, Death's Bride, the princess of the pits. The old titles made the she-orc smile wistfully. Yes, all of that. But I am at peace. I don't even have the warrior's boredom we've spoken of before. I am content for now, 
though I know more war will find us. How can it not, given that you and I are destined to live lives of consequence? Sounds fancy. Jenny Bell stood in the doorway in a black and red dress that showed cleavage like a valley in heaven. The dress also accentuated her waist and showed her strong legs. Well, this is the dress I bought. What do you think? Gatha looked her up and down. You wear such a thing in hopes someone will take it off you. I would be that someone. Jenny did a little twirl. Ah, oh, Gatha, you know just what a girl wants to hear. The she-orc frowned. I once asked our Charybda why she wears the clothes she wears. She said something similar. I miss her. Gatha closed her eyes. She and the mermaid had a very special relationship. Charybda Delfino, the mermaid, had volunteered to stay back and mind the paradise tree, their Zocolati shop. Ribby said she didn't like the idea of being so far inland, though the mermaid was going to miss them all terribly. They'd already spent so much time separated. However, Ribby was very independent, and she valued her solitude. To take care of her sexual desires, she'd have to resort to chitubbing. But then, she'd probably just wait until Ymir and her sister wives came home. It was only five weeks. Two weeks for travel and three weeks studying at the capital city of the Holy Theranus Empire. While Jenny Bell and Lily rode in the carriage with the rest of Ymir's wives, Gatha and Ymir preferred to travel by horseback. Anyeshka, one of Old Ironbound's guards, rode with them. Garam Sornap, the gruel professor, worried like an old woman, so he insisted Anyeshka go with them to help with the horses and to take care of other travel considerations. Garam had wanted to go, but he had to work that summer repairing the damage the dragon attack had caused, and he didn't want to leave the princep there alone. Garam had become very protective of Della, the campus, and all the professors. Jenny nodded. We all miss Rib Rib. But on a brighter note, we'll be back home soon. I'll be glad to put some distance between me and the swamp coast, I'll tell you what. If I survive the carriage ride, that is. You two get to be on horses. I'm stuck with Lily, who reads all the time. Tori, who can't sit still. And, of course, Ziziva and the baby. Gertie is wonderful and cute, don't get me wrong. But being trapped for days on end with a baby in a small, enclosed space don't do anything good for my nerves. If only we could just do a little portal magic to get back. Or if Ymir could turn into a dragon again. Gatha patted his arm. Gertie let go of Ymir's finger and tried to crawl off his palm. He caught her before she could. Yes, using the flesh steel ring has been a challenge, but I'll master it with practice. I'm not sure I'll be able to turn into a dragon if I'm not close to a dragon. We might have killed the last one. There are rumors of a dragon over in Ethra, Jenny said. But closer to home, I got other news. A whole bunch of gossip. Gatha snapped out her tusks. The Vemper Irwin thinks that his successor shouldn't be from the Appleford family. He thinks it should be a new line of educated rulers. Jenny put a fist on her hip. Now, Gatha, are you stealing my story? The she-orc grinned. I am. I overheard you talking with Tori. This is interesting, Ymir said. When they'd first met the new Vemper, He'd been an arrogant young man with a certain weakness of character. However, spending time at Old Ironbound had changed him. He was in awe of Ymir and his wives. They'd killed the dragon that had killed Irwin's brother. Poor Jake Appleford wouldn't be ruling anything except the crypts at Castle Sky Reach. Interestingly enough, though, Vemper Irwin had come to almost worship the Princept of the Magestrial. She'd handled crisis after crisis over the years, and Irwin saw that she was strong and capable. It's my story, Gatha, Jenny rolled her eyes. Only, you know where this is heading. Irwin thinks the Applefords are too fucking loony of a family to go on ruling a joke of an empire. 
He wants Della to take over when he's dead. Gatha grinned around her tusks. That will never happen. Erwin might be the vampire, but his mother is in control. Arlinda Appleford will force Erwin to breed, and one of his brood will ascend to the throne. Ymir thought Gatha was exactly right. The rest was just rumor and wishful thinking on Erwin's part. Jenny gently gripped Gatha's tusk and turned her head so they could face each other. Normally, the Shiork would kill anyone who touched her tusks like that. But there was love and respect between the two. I got a story you don't know about, Gatha Dragon Slayer, Jenny said. You want to hear it over dinner? What's it about? Gatha asked. Jenny fluttered her eyelashes. A subject you two love. War. Ymir was intrigued. Would Jenny have news of King Shapta? Who better to war with than a demon conqueror? Chapter 3 Ymir sat at the head of the table, with Lily on his right and Jenny Bell on his left. Farther down were Gatha and Tori, though the little dwab didn't sit much. She was too busy running back and forth from the dining room to the kitchen for final sauces, a bit more bread, or to refill their wine. Gatha finally caught Tori by her arm. Sit, eat, we have all we need. Tori laughed and shook her head. You're right about that, I guess. I will have to take my pies out of the oven here soon, unless you all want burnt pie. Gosh me underground, I don't want to know if you do. Gatha chuckled. Not many people could make Gatha laugh. Tori could, and the two smiled at each other before Gatha cut into her stuffed quail. Little Gertie had some mashed roots on a tiny plate, but she didn't like to sit still. She crawled around on the table, begged for a bit of sweet juice, and then found a napkin. Ymir made sure to keep his tiny daughter on his side of the table so he could keep an eye on her. If she crawled off the table, she might fall and hurt herself. Ziziva said the little baby would grow her wings later. Gertie finally tired herself out and fell asleep, wrapped in the napkin. Ymir ate Tori's very good food. There was a crust of thick breading covering the bird, and inside was a greasy mixture of pork and cheese. Ymir thought it was very exotic, but then his new life on Thera had become one wonder after another. He'd had mixed meats on the axe tundra. Usually it was spicy elk innards inside a white bear's stomach, along with a good amount of tundra barley, sisi berries, and nene, the smoked ground nuts that were so precious among the northern clans. Ymir wondered if he'd ever eat Nene again. He doubted it. That delicacy wasn't something the clans traded with outsiders. However, his people probably would never taste Zokolati. Zoka and Nene just might make Ymir die of pleasure. No, if death by pleasure was possible, he would have left the world long ago because of his harem, his patur, his onesla. His sharab. Gatha pounded the table. So, Jenny Beldrosen, tell us your news. Gertie was shaken awake. She looked up at Ymir and gave him a sleepy little smile before falling back asleep. Jenny had only eaten a little of her meal. She wasn't going easy on the wine, however. So, while you bookworms were at the Lyrum Archive... I spent the afternoon drinking tea and eating cookies with my Auntie Daisy Bell Josen. Daisy is fucking old, nearing 90. She's seen some shit, I'll tell you what. Ymir listened to the lilt of Jenny's accent. He'd teased her about her grammar when they first met, and it had knocked the swamp witch off her guard. He was glad he'd kept her unbalanced. It had tipped her into his bed and into his life. To quote Wilmer Swordwright, brevity is the soul of wit, Gatha spat. Get to your point. Jenny Bell's mask of coolness and control slipped. Tears sparkled in her eyes. But Auntie Daisy is the point. 
What is a Josentown dowager doing in Four Roads? Not that us Swamp Coast women don't appreciate the big city, but we'd rather have our wrought iron railings, stained glass, and narrow stone streets than this glitz. She gestured to the window and the vivid colors of the city lights below. There was a popular brothel called the Red Fire, where the sunfire lanterns burned with a crimson light. Ymir knew why Jenny was upset. The war has started. King Shapta has invaded the Swamp Coast Queendoms. Tears slid down Jenny's face. They were drunk tears, so they weren't all that valid. But they showed how upset the woman was. Then again, Jenny ran hot with passion. You aren't wrong, but you ain't right either. The Swamp Coast Queendoms are really just the one. The Josens. And Queen Ari Bell is at the top. She and Darisbo tied the knot this summer, once they killed or intimidated all the other queens into joining them. It's a fucking done deal. Daris has the brains, Ari has the fucking evil, and put them together, and you have a dynasty. A lot of my friends are dead. Most, if you want to know the truth. There was grief on Jenny Bell's face, surely. But Ymir also saw regret. She'd been ambitious, she'd wanted power, and she'd backed Ymir, thinking he'd conquer the world. And perhaps he would, if King Shapta didn't beat him to it. The Swamp Woman continued. Hell Knights, that's what they're calling them. Daisy lived into her 90s because she's smart. Got out a week before the trouble. Kept track of things through sand letters. She knew about the trouble early. But tonight, the shitstorm is really starting. The town criers are going to be filled with the news of the war come the morning. But yours truly knew about it first. You're welcome. Ymir wasn't surprised, but he didn't like the sound of these hell nights. Did Josentown fall? Not yet, Jenny Bell whispered. We have walls, but there are these rat wings that can fly. Only, they don't know about our swamp magic. And I guess there are demons on both sides. And ghosts. Lots of ghosts in Josentown. Ghosts can fly. She laughed and brushed her hand across her cheek. I thought all that talk about demons and ghosts was so much horseshit. It's not. We all know it's not. They sat quietly for a long time until Lily got up, took her chair, and brought it over to sit next to Jenny. The elf girl put her hand on the swamp woman's shoulder. What does Daisy know of the Hell Knights? Ymir asked. Jenny laughed a little. Oh, she's old, so she has all sorts of ideas. Knights in armor with black wings, fiery eyes. Like the Corvidae, Ymir said. I don't know about that, Jenny said, but there are spiders as well. Giant spiders to go along with your giant flying rats. And remember how Ari Bell said she had a secret army? Well, she did. She sold off some of the family's jewels and brought in Winkin mercenaries. It's why Josentown hasn't fallen, but it's only a matter of time. Lily continued to pet Jenny. It was clear the swamp woman was upset. And she'd said it was all so much gossip. She'd been very mistaken. King Shapta invading the swamp coast was something out of a story, out of one of the histories that Ymir was studying. Tori's eyes were wide, her face pale. Gatha took her dining knife and sank it into the wood of the table. I say good. I say we leave Four Roads and go kill this King Shapta. We know it will come to that. Ymir laughed. And there's my girl. War's wet cunt. Just this day you said you didn't have any warrior's boredom. Yet, at the first hint of war, you suggest we run right toward it. Gertie was shaken awake. She crawled over to Ymir's hand and patted it. He opened his palm and she climbed onto it. She sat and seemed to listen as they continued to talk. Jenny held up both hands. Wait, you two. 
We ain't gonna go running off on the words of an old woman who sometimes wets herself. Daisy said that King Shopta hasn't won the Swamp Coast yet, and he might not. My fucking sister, the Queen, hasn't left Josentown yet. And Darius is there, and he studied warfare at Old Ironbound. Nellie Bell is there as well. We might not like them, but we have to admit they've grown in power. At this point, we should just wait to see what happens. Maybe the Winkin mercenaries will stop the siege. Ymir covered Gertie with his other hand, and she let out a little yelp of delight. She patted his fingers and toyed with his fingernail. The Demon King. The Conqueror. King Shapta. I wish I knew more about the southernmost continent, he chuckled. And I thought Thera was far south. You can take a world history class, Lily murmured. Ymir looked Jenny in the eye. If you tell us you want to go save your homeland, we'll go. Jenny returned his gaze. You and your crazy bitches are my home. Josentown is where I grew up, but I gave up my family when we made our own. And I don't want to be queen of a few swampy cities full of ghosts. I want the world, baby. And I think you can give it to me. There was such ambition in her blue eyes. Ymir swiped a finger through the mashed root on his plate and gave some to Gertie. And what do you think of this, Tori? You big overtoppers sure love your wars. Not to say that the Morbiscore don't have our issues, but I find all of this exhausting. For one, war cooking is hard, or so I've been told. For another, unless this King Shapta comes to Old Ironbound or threatens anyone we love, I don't see how this is any of our business. No offense, Jenny Bell. None taken. I agree. Lily frowned. But it's easy for you to say such things, Tori. Your family and your stonehold will never be in much danger. Tori raised a finger. Nope. Lil, you and Ymir and the rest of these women are my family. My parents sent me out in the world to find a home, and a home I found. You're not wrong about the dwarves being safe, though. We can seal our doors and hold up for years on end. We can live on nothing but darkness and mushrooms. And we have water. You better bet we do. I know six underground rivers in the Sunset Mountains alone. This King Shapta won't ever touch us. Ymir felt icy fingers on his spine. His vision blurred. And suddenly, he wasn't sitting at his dining room table in his luxurious suite. No, he was taken into a vision, and he was wise enough to let himself be taken. Magic had led him this far, and he'd learned to trust it. What he saw, though, astounded him. It was his past, it was his present, and yes, he was shown his future as well. Chapter Four Ymir found himself far away from their apartment in the Undergem Guild. For a second, Ymir was on a ridge overlooking the tents and campfires of the Black Wolf Clan. He smelled the dry autumn mosses burning. He heard the deep voices of the men talking, the women laughing, the children squealing. He looked down, and on his fingers were all eight of the Akiric rings, even the Veil Tear Ring. How could that be? Looking down at his people, he felt a stab of homesickness. They were lost to him. Lost forever. An old man laughed, and that laughter took Ymir away from the axe tundra. He saw an elderly elf, wrinkles and wispy white hair and sagging ears. Such an ancient thing, so ravished by time, sitting in a house full of books. This was Edrin Hyendel, the friend of Lily's parents. Ymir would find Hyendel in Four Roads. He would prove invaluable. Ymir, one of his wives said to him. But he didn't answer. He was too far into the flow magic. He saw a woman with white wings, alabaster skin, and flaming red hair. Her bright blue eyes were filled with tears. 
And then a rage filled her, and she screamed, her mouth open to show her perfect white teeth. She was beautiful, tragic, deadly. And there was so much sorrow in her. She was so very alone, and always had been. Ymir understood what it was like to be alone, to be the lonely man. The lonely man, the demon who had cursed Ymir. I curse you. I curse you forever. Let the sleeper wake from the dream. Ymir was taken back to the lonely man's lair, the demon's temple home with the eight boiling pools. The five pools to the east were full of boiling green water. The water was clear enough for him to see gears churning, a machine in each pool, crafting monstrosities. Then a pit of boiling mud to the south. A wingkin was there, but not the fire-headed woman, a different woman with golden hair. The winged woman was being pulled down into the southern mud pit, screaming, weeping, and begging for her life. The mud pit on the north side of the cavern bubbled ever more violently. Someone was trying to crawl out of that pit. Ymir couldn't see who it was, but the shape of the figure looked familiar. His eyes were shown the central pool of darkness. Only this pool wasn't round. It was in the shape of Thera. And he saw the lights of the Librarium Citadel gleaming there, right on the coast of the Weeping Sea where Old Ironbound was. The sea was so dark. A face appeared in that darkness. It was Professor Linny Lynn Albatross from the Scatter Islands south of the Swamp Coast. She'd come to Old Ironbound with Helicia Heen, an assassin from the Midnight Guild. Heen was killed while Linny took over as head of the Moons College, the Studia Dukes. Linny was also a member of the White Rose Society, a secret society that wanted Ymir to finish crafting the Akiric Rings. Linny also had a passion for the occult and demonology of all sorts. If anyone could tell them more about the demon conqueror of the southern continent, it would be her. Ymir, that was Jenny Bell. Lily's smell filled Ymir's nose. He felt the elf girl ease Gertie out of his hands. Tori and Gatha had come to touch him. He couldn't lose focus. He had to see what was crawling out of the north mud pit. The figure flopped down onto his back and wiped mud from his face. On that hand were four rings. The other hand also had four rings. He wore all eight of the Akiric rings. The screams from the wingkin filled the lonely man's lair. While the boiling mud destroyed her wings and burned her flesh, this other man, this other figure, smiled. It was Ymir's own face. The realization shocked Ymir out of the vision. He fell back into the chair, but he didn't fall over. He smelled smoke. At first he thought it was the stench of the bird woman being burned alive. But no, this had a sweet smell. Tori leapt to her feet. Gosh me underground, my pies! It seemed they were destined to eat burnt pie after all. Tori was able to salvage parts of the pie, but it still put her in a grumpy mood, even when Ymir told them about his vision. They all thought it was interesting that he'd seen Professor Linny Lynn Albatross's face. As a member of the White Rose Society, she'd been using all of her efforts to find out something about the last Akiric ring. So far, she was as baffled as the rest of them, and Ymir didn't have much faith in the books he'd checked out from the Lyra Archive. After dinner, Lily and Tori cleaned while Jenny Bell went to bed. It had been a rough day for her. Gatha played with Gertie while Ymir drank kaif and started going through the borrowed tomes. It wasn't long before he was snapping books closed one after another. They were useless. They had nothing about Lanala Hanna and the rest of her brave company, who had been the real cause of Aegle Acrador's death. And not a single one even mentioned Aegle's rings. Once the dishes were done, Tori went to put Gertie to bed. That freed up Lily and Gatha, who came to sit with Ymir. Lily put her beautiful book on the table. 
Gatha touched the elaborate gold leaf binding. Yes, Lily, when your book is done, we will fashion a book such as this. The binding should be as beautiful as your writing. I wish my writing were as golden, Lily said softly as she opened the book to the title page. The calligraphy was gorgeous. Gatha snapped out her tusks. I've read volumes upon volumes of fucking trash, and your book is beautiful. Take courage, write it, finish it, and let the world tremble before your genius. Gatha's rage was always a sight to see. Yet Ymir could understand Lily's reluctance. He'd written his own story, Eric's Sorrow, and he knew how troublesome words could be. At times, they wouldn't come. Other times, it was like a river that captured you in an unstoppable current. How that worked, Ymir didn't know. But there was a certain magic there. Magic that couldn't be studied or captured. Lily winced. Let's not talk about me and my work. Did this selection of books have anything on Aegil Acridor? She said that name softly. Even now, in Four Roads, the name was ominous. Families told stories of the Vemper and his long, bloodthirsty reign. Aegil Acridor tortured those he didn't trust, and he slew anyone who crossed him outright. Aegil was ruthless and cruel, and he didn't act alone. He had his seven elite guards, called the Corvidae. They wore black armor, and flames filled their eyes, if the stories were true. Could the Hell Knights and King Shapta's army be modeled after them? Ymir had often pondered the true nature of Aegil Acridor's Corvidae. Seven elite guards, seven wives, seven governors. The evil Vemper must have liked the number seven. I've had the same problem I've had for days now, Ymir said. But first, I agree with Gatha. If Old Ironbound publishes Eric's Sorrow, Della will publish The Crippled Cicada, and it will be a wonderful book, the best ever published. Lily squeezed her eyes shut. As if I wasn't pressuring myself enough. Please, let's talk about your next book. Your history of the Night of Fire is going to be your Dominus Studier, right? The Dominus Studier was a special project that all the fourth years had to complete to graduate. For most, it was combat or magic-oriented. For Ymir, he'd already mastered combat and most of the spells required. This history he was working on was far more important. Ymir glanced around at the stacks of books. This entire venture seems to have been a waste of time. I've found nothing that I haven't read before. There are four main theories. One, a dragon killed Aegil, which we know is true. However, there is no mention of that dragon accidentally destroying the Akiric rings with his shadow flame. The second theory is that a clansman from the north came down to murder the Vemper. That is also true, though none of the histories can name him. The third theory, the Corvidae turned on their master, murdered Aegil, his wives, his governors, and then each other. That theory is false. Lastly, that Aegil Acridor never died, nor did his Corvidae, and they became demons, waiting to return. Waiting for what? Gatha slowly retracted her tusks. Ymir regarded a few notes he'd taken. For the reveler's moon, at the turn of the epics, when the world will know blood and fire, and a soulless warrior from the north will rise to conquer the world. We'll see the reveler's moon soon, Gatha said. Your people call it the wolf moon. Yes, this autumn, the wolf moon returns. The next new year is the year 6,000, and I just might be the soulless warrior from the north. But Aegil Acridor is dead, as are his Corvidae. I watched Unger bathe everyone at the top of Castle Skyreach in shadow flame. But we also know that the dead can get restless, Getha countered. Serena Sia hasn't known peace since we took her hyoid bone to fashion two of the rings. Speaking of the rings, Lily could try using the Veil Tear Ring 
to learn more. Wait, Lily lifted a hand. She'd been reading from Edrin Hyendel's book. This is a story about a fellowship of heroes who go on a quest to slay a mad king. An elven princess, a princeling of the Sorrow Coast, a dwarven warrior, a fairy, one of the Winkin, and two orcs, a man and wife. That is seven. The eighth man in their party? A wild man from the north. Lily shifted the book to show him a picture of a man with a square-cut mane of black hair and ice-blue eyes, wielding an axe, the same kind of axe Ymir preferred. That was Fionn Yamal. Ymir had seen him before in his vision of the Night of Fire. Suddenly, it was perfectly clear why Edrin Hyendel had been in Ymir's vision. He knew the true history of the Night of Fire, and if he knew that he just might know about the Akiric rings. Ymir felt icy fingers on his spine. It seemed like their trip to Four Roads had been fated to happen. Lily had stumbled upon a book that was far more accurate than all of the histories Ymir had read. To think, it was a storybook that just might help him. Grandfather Bear wouldn't have been at all surprised. Chapter 5 The honored princep, Della Panez, stood in the sand chamber on the ground floor of the Imperial Palace and read the town crier from Josentown. Town criers were news from different cities sent out using form magic that allowed them to communicate across vast distances. The sand fell from a container at the top into a basin at the bottom. Paper was fed through the sand, and the communication either personal letter, report, or town crier, appeared there out of the magical sand. Sending out letters, written with magical ink, worked the same way. Della stood with hands shaking a bit. King Shapta had finally left Rata to try his luck on Thera. No one was very surprised. What was surprising was that the conqueror didn't take a single one of the Scatter Islands, not Buscatau and not Wilhelminaville. He'd taken his ships to the swamp coast and swept through any number of cities, killing royalty and seizing palaces. Joe's town alone remained standing, and Della took some pride in the fact that two of her students, Darius Bokujan and Nellie Bell Tucker, were there defending it. They had help. Aribel's secret army of Winkin mercenaries had saved her city and her life. Queen Aribel had chosen very well. Money wasn't the only motivation for the winged warriors. From her long experience with the Jataksha, Della knew them to be very honorable and loyal to their generals. Like the Gruul, they were a culture of warriors. They would fight the demons down to the last sky warrior. Not that Della knew if King Shapta was a demon or not. He'd taken the name of a demon, an old name, which permeated the myth stories of the southern continent. Della and Ymir had fought a dragon out of myth. Why not some demonic lord? Della realized that the sand letters were just starting. Rather than stand in the sand chamber reading, she could retire to her desk. She found a gruel guard to bring her the news as it came in. It would be a long night. The princept crossed the moat and entered the librarium citadel. She stood for a moment on the seal showing the symbols of the four schools of magic. The burst of flame, the three moons, the closed fist, and the open palm. Sunfire, moons, form, and flow. Those were the four studier magica. Those were broken down into the five Categoria Magica, Cantrep, Armatus, Prolium, Fashionara, and Devocho. So there were twenty categories of magic altogether. Della walked up the steps to her mezzanine office. Since it was late, very few scholars, mostly post-dominists, haunted the coruscation shelves. Lightning crept around the six stories of books, keeping the iron-bound books free of rust. A few of the scholars spoke in hushed voices about the news of war. Della sat at her desk, 
still holding the original report from Josentown. The library was so hushed and empty. It was still a month until school started, yet she longed for the year to begin. This new war might not affect them at all, or that was the hope. However, she knew that the continent would be wondering about what the Magestrial Collegium Universitas thought about the current events. They'd want the Princeps' opinion. At this point, she wanted to see what Glaga the Blade was thinking. If anyone could stop this new army, it would be the orcs. The Olira would only want to stay in their forests with their art and chastity. The Morbiscor would hide away in their underground kingdoms. And what about King Velis Naor the Ninth of the Naor dynasty in Crean? What would the Sorrow Coast Kingdom think about their neighbors being invaded? King Velis might only care about waxing his mustache. One unlikely ally that Thera might have would be the Aquaterab families. Della was close personal friends with Beryl Delfino, the matriarch of the Delfino family, the Ocean Mother Divine. The merfolk had wanted to change how the world saw them. What better way than to stop an invader? Beryl hadn't just been a friend. No, they'd been lovers. They still talked some, but the heat of their passions had mellowed. Beryl had her many lovers under the ocean, a variety of men and women who fucked her senseless in their bitter bibs. The merfolk loved their orgies, and saw masturbation as a waste of time. Della would have loved to have weekly orgies. As it was, her masturbation, her chitubbing, kept her sane. Regardless, it would be interesting to see if Beryl would come to their aid. And Beryl's daughter, Charybda, might have an opinion on the matter. Della saw she had some leftover cave. She sipped it anyway, cold and bitter, she knew what her professors would think of the news. Garam Sornap would want to send scholars into a fight, while Professor Issa Leal would warn them to be cautious. Brodor Bootblack would agree with the elven teacher. And what would Professor Linny Lynn think of the news? She'd grown up in Wilhelminaville. It could be Linny would want them to take a more active role, especially since Wilhelminaville might be affected. More than anyone, the Princept longed to speak to Ymir. The clansmen would have an opinion, as would the remarkable women in his harem. Jenny Bell was a master strategist, as was Ziziva. Gatha was a warrior through and through. Lily was brilliant, and Tori was also very clever and blessed with a kind heart. Ribby had grown up feuding with the other Aquaterab families and preparing for war with the land people. That man, those women. Della closed her eyes. She'd sent Agnieszka with them, and so Della didn't have anyone to give her Karo. She shouldn't smoke anyway. At the same time, she knew she'd break down eventually and buy a stick from the Sweet Cough, a smokery on the sea stair market. How could her school seem so empty without the barbarian and his women? Why did her job seem meaningless and her life barren? What would she do when they graduated? She hoped that Ymir would stay on for some post-dominist work. In her wilder fantasies, she dreamed he'd teach there. That was laughable. Ymir wouldn't teach the magestrial. He wasn't meant to be in a classroom. He was meant to be out in the world, seeking his pleasures, engaging his mind and body, and ruling. Ymir was destined to be a king, though he didn't see it. Over and over, Della had asked him what he wanted, and over and over, Ymir had replied with pleasantries or quips about finishing his schooling, protecting his family, and protecting his home. For now, Ymir saw that as old ironbound. But could he see that the continent was his home? Perhaps all of Raxed would be his, if he could only embrace his destiny. Ymir was such a paradox, a man of action who was obsessed with reading, a muscle-bound warrior who had a mind as sharp as undergems, a man meant for glory, but also a man who was satisfied with his books and his women. 
It had been a little over three weeks since Ymir had left. Della had never felt so lost. Even when she'd left home, even when she'd joined the silent scream and murdered people for money, even when her studies seemed bland, she had never, ever felt so unmoored. She felt like she was alone on a dark sea in a leaky boat taking on water. And the dreams, the visions at night, the perversions that Serena Sia showed her didn't help Della any. In fact, the midnight sex dreams felt like they might drive Della insane. A darkness was rising in the world, and Della could feel it. That darkness scared her. It also turned her on like nothing else. Many poets had written about the interplay between sex and death. The idea that the living fought death with sex was nothing new. Nevertheless, Della hadn't really understood the full extent of those ideas until that summer, when the dreams started. Movement from below interrupted Della's reverie. It was Charybda hurrying across the floor. She wore a sparkling gown that hardly covered her. Over her shoulders were her scholar's robes, the blue and white of moons. But the robes were open to show her lithe body. She had very little in the way of breasts. What she did have was accentuated by her gown, clinging to her. The mermaid was tall and thin, with skin that glittered from her scales, which came and went. A striking purple stripe cut through her blue hair. She had dark green eyes, almost brown. On the back of her legs, above her heel, was a barbed spike of bone. When she had legs, that is. Ribby could change her legs to a single fin, or into eight long tentacles. Della had asked Beryl about the spur, and Beryl had said that the merfolk kept the barb to remind themselves they weren't human, nor did they want to be. Beryl was such a beautiful woman, and her daughter had that same beauty. However, Della didn't dare let her gaze linger on Ribby. Not only was she a scholar, but Della had taken her mother as a lover. To leer at the daughter would cross too many lines. Yet the taboo, like always, fascinated the princept. She would have to stay strong. Ruby marched up to her desk, breathing hard and sweating a little. Princept, or Della, what are we fucking calling you now? Ruby didn't wait for an answer. She sat down. Her breasts jiggled. Della kept her eyes on the girl's face. Princept is fine. Please keep your voice down. Whatever inappropriate things I've done in the past with Ymir and his Sharab are just that. In the past. Going forward, I am your Princept. You are my scholar. Fuck, Ribby hissed. That was not what I wanted to hear. Her eyes drifted from Della's face to her chest and then to the floor. Della felt a sexy thrill in her belly. She had to shift the conversation. Have you heard? King Shapta and his army have invaded the swamp coast. At this point, Josentown is still standing. I'm wondering if this demon king gets a foothold on the continent. Will the Aquaterab families help us? Ribby squinted at her. She opened her mouth. It was going to be something sharp. At one point, this sea princess would have said whatever she wanted. Now, though, the girl paused. As you know, historically, my people have mistrusted and loathed you who walk on the land. Us dirt worms? Della asked. Ribby gestured at her with a long, slender hand. You said it. I didn't. I can't, because I'm madly in love with five dirt worms. Well, the Aquaterab never considered the Fei to really be of the land. They are a more mystical folk. Della counted Ymir and his Sharab. Why not six? Ribby rolled her muddy green eyes. Ziziva and Jenny Bell don't really get along, and I've tried, but Jenny can be such a bitch. More than Gatha? Della asked. Ribby couldn't hide the fact that she considered the question stupid. 
Gatha isn't a bitch. She's a fucking orc. With Gatha, you know exactly where you stand. She'll tell you if she hates you. She doesn't hate me. She... Ribby didn't finish the sentence. The emotions were too much for her. The mermaid adored Gatha as much as the she-orc loved her. Ribby steeled herself. Let's just say that Gatha and I have a special relationship. Like me and Ziziva, which is the only fucking reason I'm working at the Paradise Tree all summer long, even though it's so fucking boring. And I'm lonely and horny as fuck, which is why I came to you. Me? Della wasn't all that shocked, though she probably should have been. She sipped more of her cold, bitter cafe. You, Ribby said. Mother said you were a very good lover. I heard how you kissed Lily and Tori so you could use the veil tear ring. Then, of course, there was the night of the glow rain, when Ziziva gave birth to her woggle sparks. I heard about you, Gatha, and Ymir. You're all those little sluts can talk about. Most of them got to kiss you. I wanted a turn. It would give me something to think about during my dumb chitubbing. Della glanced around. With the Librarium Citadel so deserted, no one could hear them. For one mad moment, Della thought about going around her desk. The princept would get on her knees. She'd part the legs of the mermaid and see her oheezy. She'd give this mermaid a kiss, all right. Right on her pussy lips. Ribby was smart. The girl smiled smugly. Are you thinking about it, Princept? Della hated that smug look on this little bitch's face, but she remembered herself and her position. I've thought about it, Ribby, but I've been with your mother. Surely you wouldn't want to share me with your mother. Not at the same time, Ribby agreed. But now, you're not with my mother. You're here with me. We're alone. You don't have your fairy lovers. I don't have my Sharab. We could help each other. Della knew the morality of the Aquaterab was vastly different than her own. She'd heard of bitrabibs that included any number of perversions. But she'd thought that they were only in the minds of pornographers. However, here was proof. Ribby had no qualms at all about fucking the same woman who'd fucked her mother. Surely the ocean mother divine would protest, Della said weakly. This girl was such a temptation. Della felt so weak. It had been so long, months and months since she'd been with Ymir and Gaffa. She'd replayed the scene repeatedly during her own chitubbing. It was my mother who suggested you. That smug smile was back on Ribby's face. Now, though, it had a certain allure to it. We've exchanged sand letters. She said you would be discreet. She said that in her flow magic, she's seen you joining Emir Shareb. It was why she cooled on you, Della. She knew that your heart would forever belong to the barbarian with a douja. Good thing I don't want your heart. I just want your lips. Ribby was so brazen, but she'd always been forward and troublesome. She'd learned some humility during her exile, yet her vibrant spirit remained. From the past, Gatha's voice reverberated through Della's memories. It looks like this bitch is a horny one, Ymir. I liked Della as a warrior, but I think I might like her more as a slut. The Princept wanted to ask Ribby not to call her by her first name. The mermaid and the rest of Ymir's Sharab should call Della by her official title. But she couldn't speak. Her mouth was suddenly so dry. Ribby stood. As for this war, let's see if this demon king can do more than harass swamp witches. As for you and me, Princept, keep it in mind. You'll know where to find me, either at the zoo or at the paradise tree, though I do sometimes swim out to the Stormlight Islands for old time's sake. You and I could have such fun together. Della still had her key to the zoo. 
That very night, she could creep inside and down to where Ribby slept. She could wake the mermaid with any number of kisses. What Della really wanted was to get naked and straddle Ribby's face and make the horny woman lick her until she came. Ribby waved, and it wasn't a minute later that Frugla, one of the Gruel guards, came up with a stack of more sand letters. Della was very glad for the distraction. Still, whenever she shifted, she could feel how wet she was. Ribby had gotten to her, and Della wasn't sure she could stay strong, especially at night when Serena Sia visited her. Della knew what the former Princept would say, the living should enjoy life while they could, and that forbidden fruit was undoubtedly the sweetest. Chapter 6 The next day, Ymir walked with Jenny Bell, Lily, and Zizva through the World Square. The sun was getting ready to set, and the revelers were getting ready for the night. They'd already eaten dinner, but the smells of the food stalls still tempted him. There was his favorite fried dough place, a sweetness he had trouble resisting. However, that night he had a full belly and business to attend to. Ymir had made Zizava swear to be on her best behavior, and he'd also told Jenny Bell she was to mostly listen. Having Jenny around made sense, since she had such a good mind. Lastly, Lily was their connection to the ancient elf. Clearly, Edrin Hyendel knew the real story behind the Night of Fire and the death of Aegil Aquador. He would be very useful for Ymir's research, without a doubt. It had only taken a matter of hours to find where Edrin lived, since it wasn't Lily who reached out to the Painted Pen Guild. It was actually Queen Dilly Day Everjewel, which brought immediate results. The Painted Pen Guild Hall was also on the World Square. Though it wasn't as tall or as grand as the Undergem Guild, it was impressive nonetheless. The Guild had its own amphitheater, sunk down into the earth, with a roof over the stage fashioned from four magic. There was also a maze-like museum of artwork as well as a bookstore. The offices were underground, beneath the complex, which Tori appreciated. She thought that the overtoppers, as she called them, spent far too much time outside under the sky. Edrin Hyendel had never been very successful as an artist, no one had embraced his masterpiece, the Plenta Spiritex, and his other works received even less attention. And yet, every writer, artist, painter, and actor in Four Roads knew Edrin Hyendel. He was legendary, both for his advanced age and for his knowledge of all aspects of the arts. His house was also something of a library. The painted pen honored Edrin's anonymity. Otherwise, the old elf might have been swamped with artists looking for information or inspiration. Zizava said her mother had made her swear to keep the location of Edrin's house a secret. Zizava also insisted on coming with them. She said she was tired of being stuck at home with a baby, even if Gertie was such a good sleeper. Tori and Gatha were both very excited to babysit. Tori was a natural mother, and Gatha adored the infant, showing a gentle side that pleased Ymir. The she-orc seemed to be made of angry steel most of the time. However, Gatha wasn't just affectionate with Gertie. She also loved Zizava and the rest of the women in their patour, especially Ribby. That in and of itself was remarkable, since Gatha thought she'd be ig patour a woman without a family. Zizava clung to Ymir's collar and kept kissing his neck. I'm out, I'm out. Little Zizava is out. No babies and no diaper changes. No spitting up or crying binges. Out, out, out. Hooray. She was in a blue dress that hardly covered her. None of them had many clothes on, since Summer still had several weeks left. Jenny Bell wore her new red and black dress with big black boots. Lily wore a loose white gown. Already they could see the refugees from the swamp coast filling the world square. 
Word had it that the Grand Vimper Irwin, as some people called him, was looking to set up a tent city outside the city limits to handle the overflow. For now, there were any number of women, and a few men, all with their worldly belongings on their backs. The thieves and scam artists would eat well that night. The ancient elf's house was in Cloud Reach, a walled section of four roads north of the World Square. Cloud Reach had many parks and canals, water channeled from Long River itself. Cloud Reach also had guards monitoring the gates in and out of the wealthy section of town. It was very cushy work for mercenaries from the Bloody Dawn Guild, and it paid well. Ymir flashed a special pass from the Undergem Guild, compliments of Queen Didi, and the two men let him pass. Ziziva giggled. Mother opens all the doors. Queen Didi makes all men whores. She buzzed around Ymir and switched from Winkle Tongue to Verum Tongue. Have I told you, Ymir, how happy I am to get out of the house? Ymir chuckled. A time or two, yes. About fifty times too many, Jenny Bell said with a sigh. Then she flashed Ziziva the fakest of smiles. But we're glad you're with us. Lily nudged the swamp woman. Be kind, Miss Josen. Smile with both your eyes and your lips. Oh, she's just a jealous little girlie, Ziziva said, not seeming to care. She just wishes she was me. You are something. Jenny Bell didn't even try to hide the sarcasm. But you're also all right. That's enough, Ymir said sternly. We need to focus on the task at hand. He touched the satchel carrying the Lyrum Archive's copy of the Plentus Spiritex. He and Gatha had stayed up late to read as much of it as they could. It matched Ymir's vision, for the most part, though the motivations of the dragon were murky. Of course. How could Edrin know that Unger had wanted the flesh steel ring? Lily had woken up early to start the novel, and she was impressed with the artistry. She'd made notes, but she was nervous. She was going to use the Veil Tear Ring for the first time to delve into Edrin's past, a past that might give Ymir more information about the Night of Fire. The ring was in a secret pocket in her gown. Ziziva fluttered ahead. Streetlights, sunfire lanterns in brass sconces, winked on. Edrin might not have done well as an artist, but he was living in a very nice part of town. The streets were clean. The alleys were free of thieves. All the pedestrians were dressed well. However, Ziziva guided them to the most dilapidated of houses, around a park where the grass had died and the sanctum tree limbs drooped. The paint was peeling. The windows were dirty, and the door had been fixed with extra pieces of wood hammered over broken glass panes. Ymir knocked. A very old she-orc answered the door. She wore a leather jerkin that struggled to keep her huge breasts in check. Her white hair was thinning, and she had her tusks out. One was cracked. She eyed him with bloodshot pink eyes. You are the barbarian with the douche. You fuck Gatha of Sunesh. Some call her the dragon slayer now. The she-orc pointed a finger with a long yellow nail at Ymir's wives. Lily Nehenna, the solid princess of Greenholm. Jenny Bell Josen, who might have one day sat on Josen Town's throne. And there's the fairy girl, the one who might change the fae forever. Queen Dilly Day's favorite. Yes, 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 Ymir. Come in, you three. I'll bring you what? Beer? Tea? The Epa? Since you're fucking Gatha, you know about the Epa. Don't give them the Epa Pog Epa, Gracie. Bring them in, bring them in. I want to see if he's anything like Fion. The voice was just a creak. 
It had to be Edrin. That was surprising. The she-orc made a face. I'm Gracie Glick. I'm Edrin's least favorite wife. But I do the most for the old fucker. She waved them inside. The entryway was packed with books. The house was more library than residence. It smelled good, though, of baking, candles, and a sweet caro smoke. Ymir and his wives were taken into the back room, which was just a wall of books. Through a door was the back deck, which overlooked a backyard pond. Strange fish with long fins slithered through the depths of the green water. Sunfire torches surrounded the pond. The brick wall of the house next door rose up above them. Windows from that other house added as much light as the torches. Surrounded by more books sat Edrin Hyendel. He had the bulk of his she-orc wife. Grandmother Rabbit always said that time either fattens you up or thins you out before it kills you. It had fattened the ancient elf, and it had taken the hair on his head. It seemed to have thickened his eyebrows, however, and stuffed his ears and nostrils with cotton. His face was nothing but wrinkles. Even his pudgy fingers were wrinkled. He sat in a velvet robe and velvet pants, but his gnarled feet were exposed. He was settled into a chair between two tables, which were piled with books, a plate of cookies, and a few cups. There was also an ashtray there, where a thick caro cigar smoldered. It smelled good. Edrin grinned, showing only a few teeth. Well, now, it's not every day I'm visited by a legend. Ymir of the Black Wolf Clan. Is it true you have magic, boy? True enough, Ymir said. That smile on Edrin's face spoke volumes. The old elf wasn't surprised that Ymir was there. He gestured to the two cushioned chairs. A human woman rushed forward with a third. She was middle-aged herself, probably in her late thirties or early forties. She wasn't thick like the other two. She had long, sinewy arms and legs. Ziziva was back on Ymir's shoulder. And who is this one? And who is she? Who can this woman be? Now that they were in public, Ziziva had to use the winkle tongue. The middle-aged woman curtsied in a short dress. I'm Missy May. I'm another one of Edrin's wives. I think Gracie mentioned something about the Ipa. No, Ipa, Edrin thundered. Wine or caif or water? Caif, Ymir said. Jenny Bell and Lily had wine. Could I have some sweet mead, Mr. Elfman? Ziziva asked. The sweeter the better, the meader the matter. Edrin chuckled. Fairies, I do enjoy fairies. They are so very silly. To think Queen Dilly Day has such silliness, even as she has so much power. To say nothing of wealth. His glittering blue eyes showed that he knew far more than he was letting on. Missy May left to get their drinks. Queen Dee Dee basically ordered me to talk to you. The ancient elf grabbed his cigar with yellow fingers and put it to his yellow-stained mouth. I can't say no, now can I? When I have all my money there, when I'm such an important investor. Ymir couldn't help but smile. Edrin didn't make his money off book sales or his scholarly knowledge. He'd used his long life to make his money. He must have backed any number of lucrative deals to be able to afford a house in that part of town. Or perhaps when he had it built, Cloudreach had been a slum, and he'd merely gotten lucky. The houses around him were gentrified, and he stayed. Regardless, this ancient elf had a keen intellect, even at his advanced age. He probably had the money to fix up his house, but decided not to bother, he spent most of his time lost in books. Edrin sucked in smoke and breathed it out. But Queen Dee Dee didn't need to order me to do shit. Of course I'd want to talk with you. 
You remind me so much of another clansman who came down from the north. Fion Yamal, Ymir said. Strange name. He slipped the book out of the satchel. Only you don't call him that in your book. You changed his name to Yorn Skullsplitter. You made other changes as well. Edrin's hands trembled as he set the cigar into the ashtray. I thought I'd die before anyone said the name Fee on your mouth to me again. He took up a cup of brandy and sipped from it. One thousand years and nearly three months. One thousand years and eighty-six days, to be precise. Since the night of fire. I was there. I was her lover. Lenala Hana. He stopped talking. They sat quietly. Ziziva was on her best behavior. She waited, sitting on Ymir's shoulder. Jenny Bell, though, wasn't going to be sitting in silence. You have a lovely house, sir. The ancient elf ignored Jenny's pleasantries. He looked closely at Lily. You weren't born the last time I saw your mother, but you have Velia's eyes. You're young. You don't understand how young you are. I don't, sir, Lily said quietly. She had her hand closed around the veiled tear ring. She said she would wait until it felt right to put it on. Ymir thought he could trust Edrin, but he also knew that he wasn't going to waste this chance to get a look at the ancient elf's life and memories. King Sabor didn't call her Velia. Edrin rasped. He called her Ellen Velia every time. It's a great many syllables to say the same thing, to say the word love. He pointed at her arm. No cuff. He touched his temple and spoke in Olyran. Ymir caught several words he knew. It took him a moment to translate. To be sullied is to sully one's family. The only freedom is through the Esses. Better lot than Canara. Is that what you learned, girl? Lily responded in Elvish. Yes, that is what I was taught, but it was a path I couldn't follow. Edrin nodded. Very few can follow it. They don't tell you that. Your father could. Your mother couldn't. But her life is her story. My life is mine. Missy returned with wine for the ladies, strong caif for Ymir. Sweet alcohol had been added to his bitter caif. Ymir didn't mind the addition. Gracie stormed in. I'll get dishes. I'll take them away. Have you warned them yet, you old fucker? Edrin laughed. I'm old, yes. And still a fucker, which is why I have eight wives. He laughed and pointed at Ymir. Surely you've Octavato at your school. He said eight wives was the perfect number. You can barely keep half that number satisfied, the old she orc spat. She collected plates and cups and went back into the house. From the look of him, Ymir thought that was rather surprising. He hoped if he lived to be as ancient as Edrin, he'd managed to keep four women satisfied. Ymir did wonder what kind of warning Edrin had for them. Lily didn't wince at the cursing or at the talk of sex. She'd come a long way. Warn us of what? Jenny Bell asked. If you don't mind me asking. I'd have asked if you didn't, Jenny Jen, Ziziva sang out. I would have asked it. For the task is to learn why he wrote the book as fiction and not fact. We want the truth, and maybe a snack. The fairy flew down to her cup of mead and put a hand in the sweet liquor. She then drank it from her little hand. Edwin closed his eyes. I didn't think I'd see this day. I shouldn't have written the book. I shouldn't have risked it. When he opened his pale blues... He was gazing at Jenny Bell. You know about the Orishas, don't you, girl? Jenny nodded. I do, sir. I just never thought they were real. 
How wrong I was. How very wrong you were, Edrin said. For there are demons worse than we can ever imagine, watching us from the veil, waiting for us to make mistakes or to die. Though when you get to be my age, death becomes a friend. The ancient elf rested his hand on his belly. I'm glad you're free of your family, Lily Nehenna. I'm sorry your mother clung to a path she shouldn't have walked. Then again, the minds of the young can be as rigid as that of a scared old man. Some old men fear death, and it makes them inflexible. I pity them. Zizava drank more from her hand, and then she flung away the droplets. Okay, Mr. Elfman, we came to talk about the book and to look into the distant past, and it's our desire to inquire about the Night of Fire. Get on with the warning and get on with the talk. Ymir won't leave, but I might walk. Ymir thought Zizava's timing was perfect. He himself was getting impatient. It was clear that Edrin Hyendel would much rather talk about Lily's mother and Lily than talk about the book or the warning his wife wanted him to give them. From out of the corner of his eye, he saw Lily put on the veil tear ring. Good girl, Ymir thought. Chapter 7 Ymir glanced over and it was like Lily was merely sitting there, but he knew she was journeying through the life of the old elf. A fish splashed in the pond below. The torches flickered in a cool breeze that managed to find them on Edrin's large back porch. You're not like any O'Learan I've met before, Ymir said. It's the only benefit of old age. I'm free of most expectations, and I get to say what I want. The O'Lira want to bind everyone in the beliefs of a few. It's sad, really, for the young, for the old. With each passing day, there are fewer consequences. I do still have to be careful, though, because what I do, what could happen, it would affect my wives. Edrin had to pause to clear his throat. Zizava sighed and sent sparkles into the air. What is this wicked warning of woe your she-orc wife mentioned a minute ago? Edrin retrieved his cigar and puffed it. I didn't come to you, fairy girl. You came to me. I can take as long as I want. What is your interest in that book, clansman? It couldn't be to reprint it. The thing didn't sell well. None of my writing did. Am I cursed, or am I talentless? Perhaps both. No, Lily whispered. Was she responding to him or to her vision? You know the Plenta Spiritex is good, Ymir said quietly. False humility is ugly. It doesn't become you. Because I'm ugly enough the old elf guffawed. Jenny Bell shrugged and sipped her wine. I won't look that good when I'm over 1,200 years old. Zizava fluttered over, right through the smoke of the old elf's cigar. She landed on a table and waved her little hand in front of her face. It's so smelly. The ugliness I can stand, but not the smelly smell smell. None of my wives like it, Edrin agreed, but they tolerate me. I pay the bills, and I treat them well, as well as I can. He cast a glance at Lily and then dropped his eyes. The book is fine. I didn't write it for an audience. I wrote it because the truth couldn't come out in any other way. Ymir was losing patience. Speak plain. Why did you hide the truth? If you knew Lenala Hana... If you loved her and she loved you, why not write history and not fiction? Edrin pointed his cigar at Ymir. And there is the warning. Spirits, midnight spirits, warned me to keep it to myself. If I spoke of the Akiric rings, 
If I told the world the truth, they would find me and kill me and everyone who knew the truth. And that would include my wives. Orishas? Jenny Bell asked in wonder. Or the Akira Kor? Edrin's face grew white. His lips trembled. How do you know about the Akira Kor? His eyes went to Ymir's finger. Ymir was wearing the winter flame ring as his focus ring. Lily sat with her hand covering her finger, so only her normal gold focus ring could be seen. Edrin dropped his cigar. Ziziva immediately flew down and tried to pick it up, but it was too big. She grimaced at the smoke. Jenny Bell picked up the fat stick of Caro and put it back on the ashtray. We know a bit about the Akiric rings. Only most fuddy-duddy scholars think they're just baubles. The real question is, what do you know? Ymir saw the truth in the shocked face of the old elf. So, Edrin, you've read the scrolls of Octavado and Bikusli's Magius Articia Moditicia, and perhaps you've even glanced at Circulum. I'd truly be surprised if you had a copy of the Arboris Almaris Almanac, or if you've read the Yimaganya by the Mad Elf Celestia. All of them, the ancient O'Liran muttered. I've read all of them, and if you know those names, then you must have read them too. And the demons haven't come for you? They haven't visited you in dreams? Such lust, such desire, visions of madness and fucking. It was clear that Edrin was frightened. Seeing the terror on the old elf's face hurt Ymir's heart. You needn't be fearful, sir. I've killed demons and I've killed dragons. We've dealt with the Akira Kor and have come away unscathed. What do you know of the Eighth Ring? The old elf glanced back at the books piled up around him. Then he gulped. Don't. The Sleeper's Ring will kill us all. The White Rose Society. Do you know about the White Rose Society? People fear the Midnight Guild, but no. It's the White Roses. Oh, Ymir, my friend. I thought I'd play games with you tonight. Or we'd chat about my old love. Or I'd joke about my old body, now so decrepit. No, you came here with death in your heart. You're playing with forces you can't control. And it will mean the end of us all. Ziziva buzzed down and sat on the old man's shoulder. She petted his hair. We have come to save you from the past. But if you want us to leave, just ask. It pains you clearly. It pains you dearly. And we are so very sorry. Edrin knocked over a cup of cold calf to grasp his wine. He drank it to calm his nerves. I should have known. Fionn said that the Therans needed the help of the clans, that our magic would be our undoing. Oh, Fionn hated magic. We thought he was quaint. But when he faced Aegil Acridor, and the demon Vemper couldn't touch Fionn's soul, that was when we knew the truth. You were there, Ymir said with wonder. You were there on the rooftops of Skyreach, on that night of fire. Hiding in the shadows, a poor ninth ghost, watching, Edrin whispered. Lenola told me to flee, to tell the story, and I did. I did tell the story, but I couldn't tell it plain. They would know, they would kill me. And oh, how I wanted life, more life than anyone had ever had. I was greedy, sure. I was to live a thousand years, but truly, I wanted more. I got more, and now I regret so much. Tears streamed down the old elf's cheeks. His fear had unlocked his mouth. His smugness was gone. Ziziva glanced at Ymir, 
the unasked question on her face. What should they do? Ymir could think of only one thing. Keep the old elf talking. From your book, it's clear what drove Lanala Hana. The Vemper slew her family, and she wanted vengeance. You didn't get the dragon right, but how could you? Unger had powerful magic to hide himself. But Fion, why did Fion come south? It wasn't to save Thera. The clans didn't give a pile of elk shit about the southern lands. But he knew, Ymir. Fion knew that the Vemper would turn his gaze to the north. It was only a matter of time. He came south, soulless, friendless, led by visions from the shield maiden herself. The Axeman had cut him a path that should have made him a hero. Of course, you know the wolf didn't care. But the shield maiden is forever in love with the children of men. Edrin was breathing hard. He looked faint. Lily let out a gasp of terror. Ymir could smell the demon dog hunting her. It would be close, so very close to her. Lily, that's enough. But the elf girl wasn't taking off the ring. Jenny Bell went to pull the veiled tear ring off Lily's finger. But then the night exploded around them. Fire erupted over the pond, a spinning circle of fire, and Ymir recognized it. That was a dragon spell, portal magic. And from out of the spinning circle flew a huge, leathery-winged creature. At first, Ymir thought it might be a dragon. But no, the face was as hairy as its body. It had matted fur and long black legs tipped with obsidian claws. Its arms were attached to its leathery wings. It had the long, pointed face of a demon rat with crimson eyes. The creature stank, and when it opened its fanged mouth to screech, the smell worsened until Ymir thought it might stifle them. Bright red flames exploded from its open maw. Ratwing. The thing was a rat wing. Three of the creatures flew out of the portal. They dove toward Lily. Ziziva flew up to meet them, flinging out her hands and shrieking, Kalem Fashionara! She threw up a wall of wind that scattered the flying rats. Her wind attack was filled with golden sparkles. That was a new spell for Ziziva. She had to use her magic because she couldn't change into her Verum self to use the combat skills that Gatha had taught her. The wind attack was enough to force the trio of giant bats to flutter up above them on the deck, though the things were already regrouping. Then something else, a man-sized something encased in black metal armor, appeared in the portal. He was armored, but he moved with such speed and ease a creature clung to his back, a spider as hairy as the flying rats. The armored man leapt from the portal and landed on the deck. A shield of fire burst from his left arm, and a sword of fire extended from his right. He strode forward to strike Lily down with his sword of flame. Ymir had never seen a hell knight before, but the name fit this thing. Ymir made a fist and used the winter flame ring to feel the amwabs of the armored man. He extinguished the Hell Knight's sword and shield. Jelu Armatus! Ymir covered himself in ice armor and flung himself in front of Lily, just in time to take the claws of one of the demon bats. Then Ymir spun and shouted, Jelu Prolium! An axe of ice extended from his hand. He turned and tried to hack one of the rat wings out of the air. He missed. That was surprising. The things were very fast. Meanwhile, the armored man was still there, reconjuring his sword of flame. The hairy creature on his back, a giant spider, leapt from him and landed on Edrin, who had slipped out of his chair and was trying to crawl into his house. He wouldn't make it. The spider sank its fangs into Edrin Hyendel's throat. Lily had also tumbled to the floor and was in the process of taking off the veiled tear ring when the knight raised his sword of fire. Jenny Bell struck from behind. 
she grabbed the back of his helmet and slammed the sapphire fang into the armored man's back. Ymir smacked his axe into the knight's chest, only to have his magical weapon shatter. The armored man drove a mailed fist into Ymir's face, but the clansman lowered his head, so the gauntlet struck his ice helmet. It saved Ymir from a crushed skull, but it also sent him staggering back. The three bats were returning. Calum Prolium, Ziziva shouted, and peppered an incoming bat's body with golden missiles. However, at the same time, the other bat exhaled fire. Ziziva dodged it, but the flame struck the side of Edrin's house, igniting the wood. No, Edrin sputtered weakly. His face was gray. The spider skittered back from the flames. Ymir froze the spider's legs to the floor. He covered its furry black body with ice. Gracie, Missy May, and several of Edrin's other wives had grabbed buckets and were throwing water onto the flames burning their home. The back deck was choked with smoke, and for a second, Ymir couldn't see. The fire-breathing bats vomited flames onto them. Ymir froze the air over them, creating a shield of ice that caught the flames, though the upper floors of the house were hit. More smoke, more flames. For a moment, Ymir couldn't see. Then he saw the knight's flaming sword arc toward him. Ymir caught the man's wrist and froze the knight's armor at the shoulder and elbow joints. Using the winter flame ring repeatedly had drained his douja, but he still had power left. But then he felt the hell knight reach into his core and siphon power from him. Ymir had felt something similar before, when Golnash had used the crystal null ring. Ymir hurled the knight to the floor and reached into his frost-covered pouch. Ymir retrieved the crystal null and slipped it onto his finger. All three of the rat wings dodged another one of Ziziva's wind attacks and came soaring around. They were going to fly underneath Ymir's dripping ice shield. The portal of spinning flames behind him sizzled away, but not before a winged woman flew out. She was the winkin from his vision. Red armor covered her arms and legs. In her hands were two short swords with thick blades. The Winkin warrior flew into the middle of the bats, slicing one up the middle of its furry body and hacking the head off another. They were fast, but the winged woman was faster. Lily had her water bow out and shot ice arrows into the last of the beasts. Jenny Bell threw her blood cross mist into the face of the thing, and Ziziva joined in the attack, flinging golden energy spears into the final rat wing. Ymir found the knight's douche. He took all of it, which sent the knight to his knees. This time, when Ymir used the winter flame ring, he was able to freeze the knight solid. The winkin landed and drove her sword through the knight's helmet. The spider had wiggled free from the ice. It went to leap on Lily. The winged woman threw one of her swords and pinned the giant spider's body to the wood. Black blood poured out onto the wood as the spider curled its legs around itself. Then the winkin dropped her remaining blade and ran into Ymir's arms. At first, Ymir thought it was an attack. But no, she grabbed him and clung to him. He held her smelling her body and the sweet musk of her feathers. He liked how she felt in his arms. He eased her off him and looked into her beautiful face. Tears filled her blue eyes. Then she fell to her knees next to the hell knight she'd killed. The winkin started to weep. Why was she crying? Had she created the portal? Why had she embraced him? Jenny Bell and Lily, both flow scholars, pulled water from the pond and soaked the back of the house. Ziziva flew to Ymir and landed on his icy shoulder. Old Edrin was bitten by the spider bad. He's dying, 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 so sad. Ymir left the weeping Winkin woman and knelt next to the elf. Flickering flames lit his face. His back patio was a mess of water, charred wood, destroyed books, 
and shattered china. Half of his house had been destroyed. How many books had been lost? Edrin's skin had turned gray. The bite on his neck was black. The light in his eyes was fading. He touched Ymir's face. I spent my life frightened of this moment. If only I had embraced it. If only I could have conquered my fear. Follow your path, Ymir, without fear. Let yourself awaken fully. Ymir felt a shiver down his spine. It was like what the lonely man had said to him. Let the sleeper wake from the dream. My books, the old elf whispered. Take all my books. Do what you must. But be careful. Beware the reveler's moon. Beware the sleeper's ring. Edrin then coughed and breathed his last. Ymir stepped back. His wives came rushing out the back door. They fell around their husband and started wailing. A strong hand slammed down onto his shoulder and whirled him around. Tears marked the Winkin's dirty face. Her chest gleamed with sweat. She was breathing hard. She'd retrieved both of her swords, but she plucked them from their sheaths and flung them into the wood of the deck in front of him. Their tips dug deep, even as their hilts quivered. Her piercing blue eyes, sad, angry, lost, looked into his. But she didn't say a word, not a single word. Chapter 8 The honored princept, Della Pinez, woke from the dream. She'd only been asleep an hour, yet she was wide awake now, her heart pounding and the dream so fresh in her mind. She'd taken Charybda Delfino into the catacombs deep under the librarium citadel, down into a dungeon where she strapped the mermaid to a table. And then, with Serena Sia whispering encouragement from the shadows, Della had done all sorts of naughty things to the ocean princess. It would seem that Ribby liked a little pain in her pleasure. Della had seen it before. Powerful people who dominated those around them during the day, but wanted to be controlled and humiliated at night. Della had experienced some of that herself. She liked the feeling of giving power over to someone else. If someone tied her up and forced her to have sex, then she couldn't be held responsible for her actions. She wouldn't be responsible for jeopardizing her future at Old Ironbound. But then the Princept had as many fantasies as there were stars in the sky. Dominating, being dominated, all sorts of taboo stories that strained both her mind and her morality. And when it came to morals, Della was exceedingly flexible. She'd killed people for money. That required the ability to compartmentalize different aspects of her life. Della couldn't believe how detailed the dream was. The ecstatic screams of the mermaid girl, the smell of her wet little ohisi, her taste. The princept got out of bed and felt her own slick sex. She had soaked her panty through. She thought about masturbating, but that felt useless. She'd done so much of it recently, plagued by these vivid dreams that didn't feel like dreams. They felt like a future she couldn't avoid. She understood more why the Aquaterab looked on Chitubbing with such dubiousness. Why eat a snack when you'd only be hungry again in a few minutes? Della poured herself a tall glass of strong wine. She gulped down half the goblet. She was jittery. Her mind was spinning, and the news from the south hadn't gotten any better. Four roads had been flooded with refugees, and there had been some kind of attack at Edrin Hyendel's house. The eccentric old elf had finally died. Of course, Della knew him. He'd been rich and strange, a powerful combination. 
He'd done some consulting for the university, which had made him richer. He had an extensive library, and he'd written some easily forgettable books. However, even back then, there had been talk that he had some texts that probably should be in the Illuminate Spire because they might be dangerous. Rumor had it, he had a book on portal magic, which had to be controlled for any number of reasons. One was security. If someone could use portal magic well, no stronghold in the world would be safe. Another, portals to other realms just might bring invaders. There had been any number of prophecies and warnings about the shadows of teeth and terror. Had Edrin opened a portal? Had something nasty come through? Della wasn't sure, but he was dead. His wives were widows, and much of his library had been destroyed. Ymir had been there, along with Lily, Jenny, and Zizva. More news from the Four Roads town crier would be coming in eventually, but Della was worried. She did feel smug that trouble had followed Ymir down to Four Roads and more buildings had been destroyed. And for once, the world wasn't looking at Old Ironbound and its Princept. Della had received a letter from Ojan Tej, the Princept of the Kifuyun Liram University saying she was going to go to the ruins of Edrin's house to see about the books and the barbarian with Aduja. Ymir and his women were alive, thank the tree. But what had happened? Della sent a message back to Ojan, asking that she share Edrin's books with Old Ironbound. It was a bold move, but if there were forbidden texts, they needed to be in the Illuminate Spire. Della had tried flow magic to learn more about Edrin's murder, but she'd only seen images of her time with Ymir and Gatha during the glow rain. And then there was Serena Sia, whispering filth to her. But nothing from Four Roads. Even in her best days, her flow magic had been elusive. She wasn't alone there. The gift of true prophecy was rare. If only she had the veiled tear ring. The princept knew that she wasn't going to fall back to sleep anytime soon. Damn that ribby, coming to her, asking for a kiss and more. It wasn't right, it wasn't natural, and it showed how much Della's life was spinning out of control. The princept had been tempted, first the mother and then the daughter. Wasn't that a taboo that Della would find in Gatha's erotica? Right then, Della decided she would go and smoke a caro stick. If she wasn't fucking scholars, at least she could smoke. Della threw on her robes and a thick cloak before slipping on her black boots. She left her room on the seventh floor and used Moon's magic to float down to her mezzanine office. She found a little hidden stash of caro sticks she kept for emergencies. She took two. When embracing evil, embrace it fully, or don't waste your time. She went out into the cold and fog with her hood over her head, It was nearing midnight on a summer night that didn't feel like summer. The flow courtyard was deserted, and Della was glad. She looked up to appreciate the new dragon arch above her. Brodor had done a very good job sculpting it using form magic. It was a good reminder of that night when they slew an actual dragon. Unger was dead, and Della should be glad. But the world still seemed ill at ease for any number of reasons. Della used sunfire to light her smoke. She inhaled deeply and felt herself relax. It was a weakness, her caro habit, but then she had many weaknesses. A voice whispered through the night, barely discernible. She's coming. Serena Sia's ghost was about. Her perfume was in the air. Caribda Delfino walked up from the sea stair market. She was barefoot, wearing one of her nearly see-through gowns. The dress both accentuated and distracted from the glitter of the scales that covered parts of her skin. She had such firm little breasts, such round hips on such a tall body, with such a pretty face. Della thought about tossing her smoke away and rushing back into the librarium citadel, It would be the safer bet. Ribby came close, close enough that Della could smell the sweetness of the Zoccolati shop, her perfume, and her own musk. Ribby smiled. Smoking caro is stupid. 
You know that as the honored princept. And yet, here you are. Here I am, Della whispered. She hated that knowing little smile on this fishy bitch's face. Ribby had little idea of who Della was, what she had done, and the full extent of her perversions. Della lost control and said the words that invited her ruin. Sometimes I like to do stupid things. That widened the mermaid's smile even more. Oh, really, Prince Apt? That's not what it sounded like when we talked in your office. I'm having these dreams, and the dreams are daring me to do stupid things. Della looked the mermaid in the eye. What was she doing? This was reckless. Della didn't care. I dreamed about you tonight. Ribby had such pretty, muddy green eyes, so expressive, so full of life. I hope it was a good dream. Was I a good girl in your dream? Lust filled Della's belly like a hot stone. She smiled. No, you were very bad. I had to punish you. Finally, that fucking smile faltered. Ribby raised an eyebrow and looked a tad frightened. Lily didn't tell you about us, did she? Della felt her mouth go dry. She didn't tell me a thing. It was just a dream. But now I think I know. It seems you might like a little punishment. Ribby's little nipples stiffened. Della felt lightheaded. The wine and the smoke had gone straight to her head. Out of all the people she could have met on the float courtyard, why had she run into Ribby? It wasn't fair. The mermaid seemed to steal herself. What about me being your scholar, Princept? What about you fucking my mother? Della found herself laughing. Those weren't issues for you before. Have the dreams changed you too? I never had a problem, Ribby said brazenly. Della suddenly had second thoughts. She tried to change the subject. By the holy tree, what are you doing out here? Inventory at the fucking store. Ziziva will be pissed if I don't do things exactly like she wants me to. Ribby came even closer. But now I'm going home. And after our little conversation, I'm going to chitub myself silly. You have a key. I'm wondering if you have the courage to use it. It wouldn't be courage, Della kissed Ribby's chilly cheek. It would be to punish you for even tempting me. You've been bad, little girl. You've been very bad. Ribby went to put a hand on Della's ass, but the princept caught it. See, I might not let you touch me at all. The mermaid withdrew. I think you'd let me touch you. I think you'd force me to do all sorts of things, as punishment for tempting you. Ribby laughed. You're fucking with me. You aren't going to break all those dirt worm oaths you've sworn to yourself. But I have to say, I'd like it if you did. The mermaid turned and walked away. But as she did, she drew her gown up over her hips so her sexy little ass was exposed. Her bare feet slapped the worn stones of the courtyard until she disappeared into the darkness. The image of her ass remained. Della imagined spreading those round little cheeks and burying her face in that girl's cunt. That night's dream was haunting her, prodding her, tempting her beyond reason. Serena Sia's perfume drifted out of the wind. Della inhaled it, smelling it over the caro. She knew what the former princept would do. She'd march right to the zoo, unlock the door, and tie that girl up. Then she'd spank that insolent little ass. Della lit her second caro stick off the one she'd been smoking. She stood there her pussy wet, her nipples tingling, 
and she could feel Serena with her. Dirt worm oaths indeed, Della whispered. Hadn't she betrayed all her oaths when she'd helped Ymir and his Shareb forge the seventh ring? Something told her to cast flow magic. Jelu Jalaram. Della could smell her smoke, could taste the caro in her mouth, and she could feel the cold air on her exposed skin. And then she was seeing Serena Sia in her bed, covered in a sheet. Candles glowed all around, but the light wasn't bright enough to really show the elven woman's face. That dark hair seemed to drink up the little light there was. Serena pulled the sheet down to expose her big nipples on her full breasts. How much longer are you going to torture yourself, Delapinez? How much longer are you going to deny yourself? Your night is ending. You could own the dawn. You could rule the new day. If you would only seize it. The timeless elf pulled the sheet down farther until her pussy was exposed. When she spread her legs, Della could smell her. And then the vision faded. Della was left shaking. She smoked more, but suddenly, the caro felt as silly as masturbating. The princept felt an old fury rise up in her. She'd hated that, as the princept and a half-elf, she was expected to be chaste, she had no use for traditional O'Liran chastity. And with a world on the edge of war, Della felt the chaos in the wind. She was going to ride that chaos to the end of things, to the end of the world. If Ymir had been there, she would have fucked him silly. But he was gone, and she was left with only one option. Della Pinez walked with purposeful steps toward the zoo. Chapter 9 Della made sure no one saw her walking through the night. She crept by the chapel of the tree. There were some reverent scholars inside, praying and meditating. She saw that one of her professors, Linny Lynn Albatross, held a candle, her eyes closed. That was surprising. Della didn't think Linny was religious at all. In fact, she was obsessed with demons. And she had her religion, the White Rose Society, and their desire to reforge all eight of the Akiric rings. Della wasn't about to stop and ask Linny questions. No, Della had her task for the night. It was easy to sneak past the chapel of the tree without being seen. Della had been an assassin of the silent scream. Moving silently and unseen was second nature to her. She had her key ready when she reached the door of the zoo. Unlocking the door, she sneaked inside, quietly, so very quietly, so the mermaid would never hear her. It was hard to breathe. Both the run to the zoo and her lust had her gasping. Della was sweating. The thrill of the night was better than the wine, the caro, better than anything she'd felt in a long time, since the night of the glow rain. It reminded her of the times she'd infiltrated houses with murder on her mind, breaking the conventions of society, invading another person's home, doing evil in the world, and embracing that evil. For most of her time in the silent scream, she tried not to see it as evil. She would tell herself that someone would be paid for the assassination, and it might as well be her. It wasn't like Della invented killing. She just got good at it and made a nice, tidy sum in the process. This night felt like that. She wasn't under the influence of some elven assassin's love spell, nor was she being seduced by fey magic. This was her making a choice to break her promise to herself. It felt freeing. At the same time, it felt wrong. Della found a bottle of wine in the flow cupboard. It was chilled. She removed the cork and cast it aside. She drank straight from the bottle to get the stale taste of the caro out of her mouth. Then she crept silently down the steps. Ribby lived at the very bottom of the zoo, down in a room that dangled off the cliffside. 
she could hear the mermaid in her room, talking to herself, laughing a little and rattling around. The mermaid didn't think her princept would call her bluff. The bitch didn't know who she was dealing with. An errant thought went through Della's mind. If she fucked the mermaid on this wild night, what would happen when Ymir returned? Would Della rush to join his harem? Della couldn't think about that. If she thought too much about the future, she'd take the wine and leave, probably use the bottle to masturbate with. And Della was tired of chitubbing. At the bottom of the stairs, Della snuck a glance into the room. Ribby had changed into a sheer nightgown and was adjusting the pillows and blankets in her sleeping net, which hung from the ceiling. Della didn't know if the net was new or not. She thought that Ribby slept on a mattress when she was out of the water. In her underwater palace, the Aquaterab did sleep in comfortable nets so the current wouldn't take them off in their sleep. The window showed the lights of Stormcry. The town was on the left, while the Stormlight Islands were on the right. The lighthouse gleamed out in the mouth of Angel Bay. Della noticed several scarves lying around, all ocean colors, pastel green, pastel blue, and various shades of pink. She put her bottle down, waited until Ribby came near, and then she struck. Della pressed a knee into the back of Ribby's leg, while at the same time grabbing her shoulders. Della forced the mermaid down onto the floor. The mermaid was so very tall, but on her knees, Della could easily hook an arm around her neck. The mermaid was a fierce warrior. She could have fought back, but Ribby must have smelled Della because she let herself be taken so easily. Della hissed into the girl's ear. Hello, Ribby. I've come to punish you. One word will stop me. Just say the word scarlet and I'll stop. Do you want me to stop? No. I understand, Princept. I understand that if I say the word scarlet, that this will end. The Princept then remembered something. Ymir would want us to ask his three questions. No one is going to get pregnant, but what about disrespecting ourselves and our family? I want this, Ribby wailed. Ymir will be thrilled for us. He wants you, Princept. All of us want you. It was clear that Ribby wasn't disrespecting anyone. But Della? She was betraying herself and the alumni consortium. Ribby must have felt her doubts. Please, Princept, please don't think too much about this. Della thought that was for the best. She smacked Ribby's little ass. Please, Princept, don't hurt me. Della laughed. But you want to be punished. That will entail some pain, girl. Didn't your mother spank you growing up? Oh, fuck, the mermaid murmured. You have to stop. You fucked my mother. You shouldn't fuck me. Too late for that. Calum Calarum. Moon's magic lifted the mermaid onto her nets, and Della used scarves to tie her wrists and ankles to the net. Della was careful with the bone barbs sprouting out of the back of the mermaid's legs, so the barbs didn't saw through the scarves or cut through the net. Della had to push the nightgown up so the girl could spread her legs. Della wanted those legs spread. Ribby's little pussy was so swollen and wet. Della easily slid two fingers into the pink twat. I think you like being tied up. Why is your pussy so wet, slut? Tell me why your pussy is wet. Because of you, Ribby whimpered. Because of how you flirted with me. Please, Princept, don't do this. What will Ymir think? The mermaid already said what the barbarian would think of them together. But that was when they were talking about reality. This was exploring their fantasy. I think Ymir would thank me for stretching out your little cunt so he can fuck you better with his big cock. 
Della pushed in a third finger. Not so tight, are we? Because of Ymir's cock? Or because you let other mermaid sluts fuck you with their tentacles? Della used her other hand to grab Ribby by her blue hair. It was a reach. The mermaid was so long. This was perfect. Della could stand and diddle the mermaid as much as she wanted, and Ribby couldn't escape. The princept had three fingers in her pussy and a fistful of her blue hair. Tell me, Ribby, why is your cunt so loose? I don't know. I don't know why. But you do, Ribby. It's because you like to fuck. Della rammed her two fingers in and out of the wet pussy, in and out, creating a froth. You're getting so creamy, Ribby. It's because you mermaids do most of your fucking underwater. Would you like to taste it? Before the mermaid could answer, Della shoved her two creamy fingers into the mermaid's mouth, forcing her to taste her sex. Ribby whimpered, her eyes closed. Della slapped her cheek. Look at me, Ribby. Look at me and tell me you like the taste of pussy. The mermaid blinked her muddy green eyes. I like the taste of pussy. Della nearly died from lust. Why had she denied herself such fun for so long? It wasn't a surprise to smell Serena Sia's perfume over the musk of the excited mermaid. The ghostly elven princept was watching. Good, let her. Della stripped off her robes and dropped her panty to the floor. She was naked. Della couldn't help but pull on her nipples with the mermaid girl watching. Della was glad she hadn't shaved her pubic hair. She wanted Ribby to see her hairy cunt. Ribby's eyes traveled up and down Della's body in obvious appreciation. Della laughed. Oh, you are slutty, little girl. I think I want to see more of you, though. Untying you would be a fucking pain, so let's just cut that nightgown off you. You're rich enough to buy a new one. Della found a dagger in a sheath hanging next to Ribby's trident. Naked, tits out, hips shaking, Della sliced the gown up the belly, getting closer and closer to the mermaid's little titties. When she'd cut the dress off completely, Della peeled back the soft fabric. Della threw the knife across the floor and grabbed hold of those nipples. You have such nice pink nipples, Ribby, and so firm. Tell me you want me to play with your horny titties. Say it just like that. Beg me. Please, Princept, Ribby whimpered. Play with my horny titties. Della pulled on those nipples, pinched them, and she thought about sucking on them. But not yet. Not yet. Della stepped back and spun the net until she was between Ribby's legs. That pink pussy beckoned to her. You got a taste of yourself, you greedy slut. Now it's my turn. The princept fucked Ribby's pussy with two fingers before pulling them out. Della sniffed them and then sucked on them. The taste was musky and salty, just like all the other mermaids that Della had fucked before. She laughed. You are delicious, slut. I'm going to fuck you like I fucked your mother. Della then spun the mermaid back around until she was standing over Ribby's face, the mermaid's eyes were on Della's tits. Then she was staring at Della's pink clit, nearly lost in a tangle of damp white pubic hair. Della fucked the girl's mouth with two fingers and then smeared the spit and pussy juice across the mermaid's face. I like that you like pussy, Ribby. Only bad girls like to eat pussy. Della bent and picked up her underwear and sniffed it. After her dream, it was rank with her juices. She gave it to Ribby to smell. If you like pussy, you'll like sniffing my panty. You'll smell how excited I got, 
dreaming of you. Ribby breathed in Della's scent, even as she struggled to get free. But Della knew how to tie a knot well. Della dropped her underwear and bent down. Her face was over Ribby's. You wanted to kiss me, didn't you, Ribby? Didn't you come up to my office to kiss me? Yes, the mermaid whined. I'm sorry. It was wrong. I was bad. But I want you to kiss me. Della grabbed the girl's hair and pulled hard, making her yelp. Della then licked the side of the girl's face. She was feeling so wild. She was feeling so free. The princept nipped the bound girl's ear and whispered, You're going to kiss me, bitch. Della rose and straddled the girl's face. You're going to kiss my cunt. The girl didn't kiss her or lick her, but struggled to move her head away from Della's fragrant sex. Della grabbed her hair and rubbed her cunt up and down Ribby's face, from her chin to her forehead, until Ribby relented. And then the mermaid kissed her pussy lips, licked her pussy lips, and sucked on her clit. Fuck my pussy with your tongue, you little slut. Tongue kiss my cunt. The filth flowed from Della's lips. It had been so long since she'd given herself to her lust. It had been such a fight. She was surrendering now, and it wasn't because of this ribby. She was just a little toy to play with. No, the real issue was Ymir. Years of wanting him had broken her resolve. Della felt herself on the edge of an orgasm from just rubbing her clit against the mermaid's rather big nose. Della stopped herself. She was going to edge, so when she did come, it would be the world's most powerful. It felt so good, so nasty, riding the scholar's face. It was clear, Ribby did like pussy. She liked it a lot. Right before she orgasmed, Della got off the mermaid's face. She walked back and looked at the bound girl. Her dress lay in tatters. Her pink nipples were sore from what Della had done to them. Her stomach was stretched flat, and her pussy was even more swollen and creamy. Her little pink clitty was so stiff. Best of all was the mermaid's face. It was covered in Della's juices. Ribby blinked innocently. Please, please untie me, Princept. I'll be good now, I promise. Della went to her and grabbed her hair again. Oh no, we have a lot more kissing to do. The Princept then kissed the scholar, softly at first, from the top, so it was both awkward and hot. While Della kissed her, she cupped those little titties and felt her soft skin and pliant flesh. Ribby was soft, but still Della could feel the muscles. She was a warrior, after all, just like Della. Della drank in the girl's kiss, though she mostly smelled her own sex on the girl's face. Della yanked on the girl's head. Suck on my tongue, slut. Suck on my tongue like you suck on Ymir's big cock. Della fucked the girl with her tongue, and she couldn't help but rub her clit while they kissed. Again, Della almost came, which would have been a shame. She'd committed to waiting, waiting until the very last possible moment. Della broke the kiss and leaned down to suck on the girl's nipples. First one, then the other. But she didn't want the mermaid to relax. She bit one while toying with the other. Ribby let out a cry of pain, but then she sucked on Della's tits, gently and lovingly. Della loved that she could hurt her sex slave, but the slave didn't dare hurt her back. The electricity of having this scholar suck on her tits was wonderful, and Della wanted to come so bad However, with the girl bound, there was so much she could do with the mermaid. There was one thing at the very top of her dirty to-do list that she wasn't about to skip. Della turned around. 
You kissed my oheezy, you dirty girl, and you kissed my titties, and you kissed my mouth. I have something else for you to kiss, Ribby. I think you know what it is. You fucked a fairy. You know what I want. Please, no. Not that, Princept. Not that. But the words were just words. The girl was eager when Della bent over, and this time gave the mermaid her butterhole to lick. Ribby teased Della's pucker, licked around and around the wrinkled skin, before piercing it with her tongue. It felt so good, so nasty, so fucking sexy. Della then couldn't help herself. It was time to come. Della climbed up onto the net and then sank her twat down onto Ribby's face. At the same time, Della lowered her face to take in the wonderful salty stink of the mermaid's overheating pussy. The net creaked, but the anchor held. They were in the Congress of the Crow now, with Della on top. The princept captured Ribby's little clit in her mouth. Her nose was over the girl's bubbling hole, and Ribby was sucking on her ohi, licking, sucking, licking, sucking. The harder Ribby sucked on her clit, the harder Della sucked on the girl's clit, and it was like they'd been reduced to animals. They were just flesh. They were just skin. The thought made Della want to come more than ever. She looked up to see Serena Sia in the darkness, her face lost. She was rubbing herself and playing with a big nipple on her pale tit. Della was pushed over the edge. She had her pussy planted squarely on the mermaid's face. It was perfect. It felt perfect. The ecstasy took her breath away. Della was lost to herself. She was her body, and that body didn't care about the consequences of its lust. It only wanted to feel good. When the princept came down from her orgasm, she looked at the corner where Serena had been. It was empty. Della got off and caressed Ribby's wet face. Maybe you're not such a bad girl after all. I am, Princept. I still need to be punished. I still need to come. It was interesting that she put those two things together. Della chuckled. I can help with that. Della untied the mermaid to let the feeling come back into her hands and feet. But then Della took control again, this time tying the mermaid up so her shapely ass was in the air. Della spanked that ass until it was red, and the mermaid's juices were dripping down the ocean princess's slender thighs. Ribby was beside herself. I've been punished, Princept. Can I come now? Will you let me come? Della smacked her red ass again. I think I know how to make you come, but don't you have special magic for orgasming? Can't you use your magic, little girl? I could have, but I didn't. I want you to make me come. Please, Princept, my pussy is so horny. Della took her thumb and shoved it into the pink pussy in front of her. She got it all creamy and then forced it into the mermaid's pink asshole. It's not just your pussy that's horny, I think. I think you have other horny holes. And she was right. Ribby fucked herself back into Della's thumb. Such a bad girl, Della laughed, but such a good girl as well. Ribby was so keyed up that when Della did touch her clit, the girl orgasmed. It was so sudden that Della was rather surprised. Her butterhole squeezed Della's thumb rhythmically, and her pink pussy spasmed forcing more juices to run down the inside of her leg. Even more surprising, Della felt the orgasm go through her. It was like her douja and the mermaid's core were connected. It made Della crazy with lust. The princept found herself bent over, her tongue up Ribby's pussy, 
while Della rubbed her own clit. Then she was coming again, which made the mermaid orgasm as well. Their cores were connected. Della fell to the ground, sweat dripping from her tits, her legs weak. She looked up to see Ribby smiling at her. She'd come circling around in her net. Della smiled as well. Well now, girl, I have a bottle of wine around here somewhere. Let me get it so we can have a drink, and then you and I can talk about you punishing me. I think I need to atone for my sins. What's going to happen when Ymir gets home? Ribby asked. The princep didn't know. Now that her orgasm had cleared her head, she understood that fucking Ribby was one thing, but joining Ymir's harem was quite another. First, though, she wanted to see what she and this horny little mermaid could do with her tentacles. Hours later, with the dawn throwing crimson light across the ocean, Della and Ribby lay in the bed. Della knew that after playing games of power in the bedroom, the submissive needed to be soothed. The princept whispered love and support into the mermaid's ear until Ribby fell asleep. She snored softly, but from all accounts, the snores would soon become thunderous. Della wanted to slip away before that happened. It was still early enough that she might not run into anyone outside. Besides, she wanted to get to the sand chamber to check on news from Four Roads. She also wanted to see if the princept over at Kifu Yun Liram University would let Old Ironbound have access to Edrin Hyendel's extensive library. Della eased herself off the net, but there was no way she could get away without rousing the ocean princess. Ribby's eyelids fluttered open. Thank you, Princept. I needed what we did last night. All of it. You were kind. Della kissed her cheek. I wasn't kind, but I understand. Sleep well, Charybda. And I think after what we did together, you should call me Della. The Princept left the zoo without being seen. She wanted to shower and sleep through the morning, and yes, she understood what the mermaid had said. She too felt relaxed by their lovemaking. For now, there was no guilt or fear. Perhaps she could walk the line that Serena Sia had walked centuries before. In the sand chamber, Della saw there was a pile of paper from the various town criers. But the latest message appeared out of the falling sand on a piece of parchment. When Della read it, her heart plummeted. It was a simple message for her and for her alone. I know what you did with the mermaid princess. I know you want Ymir. You will stop, or I will ruin you. Chapter 10 Ymir drank kaif, hot and bitter while he perused the titles of books that had managed to survive the fire and water. The battle still made him wonder. The portal had appeared out of nowhere. Had Edrin been the target? It seemed so. But who was the strange winged woman? Why had she embraced Ymir? And why could she not stop crying? The winged warrior didn't speak any of the languages of Thera. Not Om, Olirin, Gruul, or Morbiscor. Not even Pigeon, which was the universal tongue of the continent. There were translation spells, and Lily knew some, but even the quiet elven girl was having trouble communicating with the winged woman. For now, Lily and Jenny Bell were with the strange wingkin. The three were out front, away from the wet, scorched stink of the house. Ymir hadn't had a chance to talk with Lily about what she'd seen when she'd put on the veil tear ring. The elf girl seemed troubled by it. Ziziva had flown back to their suite in the Undergem Guild to get Gatha, because Ymir wanted the Shiork librarian with him. There were any number of books to go through. From his little time in the house, he saw a few titles that were definitely interesting, as well as some unpublished papers that Edrin had hidden away. Edrin's wives had been very helpful. They'd heard of Ymir, and they were impressed by his intelligence and knowledge, especially when it came to Aegil Acredor and the Night of Fire. 
The wives were in shock. Losing their husband was one thing. Losing him to a hellish spider was another. Missy May brewed cave, and Gracie provided wine for everyone. The other six were currently packing. They did not want to spend the night in the half-destroyed house. Ymir had found rooms for them at a very nice inn down the way. It was as much of a palace as it was a tavern. News of the attack had spread through the town quickly. Soldiers from the watch congregated outside Edrin Hyendel's home, but they weren't alone. A tall, stately woman from the Kifuyun Liram University had shown up as well, bearing news from Della Panez. The university woman had a face chiseled from stone. Her golden hair was flecked with gray, though it was cut close to her scalp. She had a severity about her that Ymir liked. She would tell you to your face if you were full of elk shit. She wore the gray and black robes of a flow sorceress. I'm the princept of the Kifuyun Liram. The severe woman's voice was deeper than Ymir had expected. There was a certain rasp to it. She made direct eye contact. My name is Ojan Tej. Your princept, Delapinez, sent me a letter. She has requested that you and Gatha of Sunash go through the books to see if there are any titles that belong in the Illuminate Spire at the Magestrial. I find that request arrogant and off-putting. Ymir sipped his cave. Then you and I should come to an agreement before Gatha of the Magestrial gets here, because you will find her arrogant and off-putting as well. A little smile slipped across her face, but she extinguished it readily. What are your credentials? What are Gatha's? You both are still scholars, dominist scholars, but scholars all the same. And yes, I misspoke. She is no longer of Sunash. She has embraced your school. As have I. Ymir found her questions amusing. What were his credentials? He'd perused the Illuminate Spire, and he'd used forbidden magic to craft artifacts of unimaginable power. He needed to find a way to wear the Akiric rings without people noticing them. If he'd had all of his magical rings on, the fight would have ended far faster, and Edred might still be alive. Ymir set his cup on a scorched table. Before he died, it was Edrin's wish that I take his books. Ojan Tedge laughed in his face. I'm sure. Do you have anything in writing? Ymir grinned. If only. It would make this conversation go much faster. Why do you want the books? I've been studying the Night of Fire at the Lyrum Archive, and Edrin wrote the book that captures the essence of what happened there. You must have known how important the Plentus Spiritex was. I had my suspicions, she agreed. Edrin, though, gave up on his writing career when his sales couldn't afford him the lifestyle he wanted. When his investments paid off, he gave up any thoughts of authorship or scholarship. I know what you and Gatha were reading in the archive. I was trying to find the time to come and meet you both in person. Because of our credentials? Ymir asked with a smile. You know our names. You know of Gatha's expertise. As for mine, I will be publishing my own story next year, once I graduate. I wrote an epic. But my real interest is the death of Aegil Acredor, the true story, because it was a clansman from the north that killed him. And not the dragon? Ojan asked. Again, she had that ghostly half-smile on her face. It made Ymir wonder if he could make her smile like that in bed. The dragon Unger helped. This was before he ran the silent scream. I can say his name because he is dead, and the Midnight Guild is no more. Ymir paused. And yet, the White Rose Society remains. Ojan stared into his eyes. This woman had no fear. We know of the White Rose Society, just as we knew about the Midnight Guild, Della Panez and me. 
You also have an interest in the Akiric rings, do you not? Ymir knew that if he said he didn't know what she was talking about, she would know he was a liar. Worse, she wouldn't let him leave with a single book. I do have an interest in the rings. It was why Unger went there that night, not to kill Inalahana and her heroes, and not to kill Egil Acrador. He went there to get the flesh steel ring. He wanted to use it to make himself fertile, because the dragons of old had trouble spawning, even before the age of withering. Fion Yamal defied him. Fion tossed the severed hands of the Vemper into the dragon's shadow flame. Ojan didn't say anything for a long while. So you really do think Edrin was there? That his adventure story was historically accurate? I do, Ymir said. It's why I want Edrin's books. You have my word. I will return them to you, the ones deemed safe. For the forbidden texts, my princept would want them in the Illuminate Spire. You, too, should want them there. Ymir stopped talking. He'd proven himself, and everyone knew that very few librarians had Gatha's knowledge of the continent's texts. Gatha could easily have taken over as lead archivist at the Lyrum Archive. I should want them there, Ojan repeated. Should I? Over the past years, it has been a dangerous place. The murders, the scandals, the problems. You know, you were there. Why do you think I know about you and Gatha Dragonslayer? Yumi retrieved his cave and sipped it. Cooled, it wasn't as good, but he would need the extra bit of energy. It would be a long night. Ojan Tedge wasn't a foolish woman, and it would be foolish for her not to let him take the books. Even with its issues, Old Ironbound was still the safest place on Thera. An argument could be made for Greenholm, but giving the elves the books would mean they would be lost forever. Your eyes were blue, Ojan said softly. Now they are brown, so it is true. I thought that part was legend at best. There were shouts from out front. Ymir heard Gatha snarl. Ymir, the barbarian with a douche is in there. You'll let me pass. I want to see these fucking books, at least the ones that weren't fucked. You'll show me. Now. Ojan grinned at him, an actual smile. Arrogant and off-putting, Ymir nodded. Gatha stormed in. She wore a leather dress with her red and yellow sunfire robes over the top. She stormed up with a hand on the pommel of her sword. Ojan Tedge, you are here. Good. Ziziva said there were books. Her eyes took in the fire damage and dripping wood. Her tusks snapped out. Why didn't you save the books, Ymir? The attack was sudden, portal magic. Ymir held his cup of kaif to his chest. It looks like we have more to learn about that. Unger had portal magic. Gatha glanced at Ojan and then back at Ymir. The dragon did. Portal magic has been forbidden. Speaking of forbidden, what books did Edrin have? Anything important? That remains to be seen, Ymir said. The Princept and I were just discussing the fate of Edrin's library. And what have we decided, Ojan Tedge? She held up a finger. Let me see what I can see. Jelu Devocho. Her eyes glowed, and when she opened her mouth, that glowed as well. She was using the most powerful flow magic possible. The light dimmed in her mouth and then her eyes. She gazed at him with a smile on her face. Edrin did ask you to take the books. You weren't lying. I wasn't. Ojan sighed. She went to a destroyed chair and moved it to the side. She pulled up a bit of drenched carpet to reveal a trap door. She whispered form magic, lutum lutarum, and her focus ring flashed. 
a gold handle appeared in the wood, and she used it to pull open the trap door. A ladder dropped into the darkness. Wine is down there, and books that Edrin thought were dangerous. He cast spells to protect them. Ojan turned to them. If anyone else had come here, I wouldn't be so agreeable. But I feel that I can trust you two, just as I can trust Della Panez. I understand her passion for our world, her caution, and her capabilities. Yes, her reputation might have suffered recently, but she is fierce. I respect that ferocity. Gatha retracted her tusks. Della Panez has the mind of a scholar and the heart of a warrior. You can trust her just as you can trust us. I hope so, Ojan said. For if the armies of this King Shapta have access to portal magic, no one is safe. We must wonder, however, why did he attack an old elf? I always thought that Edrin was merely paranoid. He was so frightened of his shadows and visions. Perhaps his fears were justified. Ymir had a question. If you knew about Edrin's secret library, why did you let him keep it? Why didn't you insist that the books be taken to the Lyrum Archive? You do have a forbidden book section there. Not as auspicious as the illuminate spire at Old Ironbound, Ojan said agreeably. Her whole demeanor had changed now that she'd made the choice to let them take the books. There are dangers to having every single evil book in one place. It draws thieves and armies, as we've seen. It was why Marib Delfino took his army of merfolk to Old Ironbound in the first place. It's why all of the major universities have their own version of the Illuminate Spire. With Edrin, I would have had to come and take them by force. A little of her severity left her. I couldn't do that to the old elf. Now that he is dead, I will honor him. There will be an Edrin Hyendel section of the Lyrum Archive. Once you catalog the titles, restore what books you can, and we can discuss where certain titles should be shelved. Gatha looked surprised, if not downright shocked. We can take them all? Ojan nodded. Because of who you are, because of who Della Panez is, because of the times. I would rather have these books up north, away from the demon conqueror's armies that might make their way to four roads, or who might appear out of thin air. Ojan gave Ymir a long look, and because of Ymir's interest in the Akiric rings. I hope you remember this kindness, clansman, I hope you remember how reasonable the Kifuyun Lyrum University has been to you and to Gatha the Dragon Slayer. Ymir sipped his cave. You know, I did have something to do with slaying the dragon. But I won the title, Gatha said with a little laugh. Ojan returned them to the business at hand. I will give you a wagon, horses, and some mercenaries from the Bloody Dawn Guild to protect the books. It could be that the dark forces who slew Edrin tonight were after his books all along, and not the man himself. Ymir didn't think that was the case. If the books had been the target, they could have come at any time. But no, the Ratwings, the Hell Knight, and his demon spider had attacked when Ymir had been there, discussing the Night of Fire. Ymir didn't think it was a coincidence. Gatha immediately got to work, dividing the books into piles, those she could restore, those that were lost completely, and those too popular and common to take. Ymir helped her, because after his three years in the Southlands, he had a very good understanding of Thera's literature. While they worked, Ymir thought about what Ojan Tej had said to him, that he should remember how reasonable she'd been. It was a vote of confidence in him, she thought he would ascend to power. She was doing him a favor so she could ask for a favor in return. Oh, the games these Southerners played. 
He was just grateful to be taking the full library of books from a very interesting O'Learan who had witnessed history in the making. Even better, they found a series of journals that Edrin had written, not to be published, but to aid in his own memory. Ymir opened a journal that had been burned as well as soaked to see how much of the ink had run. What he read made him shiver, and he felt the familiar tingle of his own flow magic trace icy fingers up his spine. Lily wandered in, looking dazed. She walked to a section of the wall that had been burned and tossed aside some of the scorched books. Then she summoned an ice dagger and cut into the plaster. It took some digging, but she soon unearthed a book, a burned book. Ogent Hedge frowned. How did you know that was there? Lily didn't answer, but tears filled her eyes. From magic, Princept, from a vision that I won't be able to share with the world for a long, long time. Another shiver traced its fingers up Ymir's spine. It wasn't mere coincidence that had brought him to Four Roads and to Edrin Hyendel's house. It seemed like fate itself. Chapter 11 Le Curie Cocha Chamba, Curry to her friends, couldn't believe the past week of her life. The Kopak's pretty pointy eared wife tried to talk with Curry, but the magic wasn't working. Curry was grateful. She didn't know how much she should tell the point ear, so Curry hardly said a word. She thanked the Kopak and his wives for their kindness. That was it. While the Kopak and his family went back to their suite, Curry was allowed to sleep in the ruins of the old point ear's house. She found a nice little attic that hadn't been too damaged. The days had passed quickly. Now, Curry floated above the carriage and the two wagons, slowly traveling the smooth stone of the roads of this strange continent. The Kopak and his wives were going back to their school. It was a clear day, the sun bright, and it was easy for Curry to ride the warm air coming from the world below. In her language, they were called the Achachaks. Not that her language mattered anymore. Nothing mattered. Only her destiny. Only her slow, aching walk through the last days of life. Curry wanted to dive into the memories, to feel the hate, the joy, the terror, the wonder. Her life had been filled with such emotion, such tragedy. But she didn't want to give in to those memories. She'd been so foolish after the battle on the old point ear's deck. Remembering that filled Curry with shame. Her tears, latching on to the kopak, and then throwing her kurachia into the floor, which was a vow to serve him forever. Curry didn't want to show the kopak or his elu, his harem, her tears again. So she cried as she flew above their caravan, because the winds removed them from her face. There were many stories of the Jataksha where heroes wept and let the winds wash their faces clean. However, most Jataksha saw crying as a sign of weakness. Most Jataksha only cared about strength of character, strength of mind, strength of wing. It was old Paya, Curry's Sky War teacher, that had a different point of view on tears. Then again, old Paya had any number of strange ideas. She'd embraced Curry, who had always been so very different. From the very start of her life, she'd not fit in, and she found it hard to make friends. She was pretty, which helped with finding lovers when she needed to take care of her huke. But real friendship? It had eluded her. She knew it was because of what happened to her sisters, to her father, to her mothers. She knew that was the reason why she never let anyone near her heart. And it was why she had never let herself find a home in the heart of another. To find such a home felt like such a dream, such an impossible fantasy. And yet, that didn't matter anymore either because Curry had met the man who would guide her to her fate. It would all soon be over, 
And part of Curry was glad. Her loneliness would end. So would her perversions, the lusts she had fought all of her life. Old Paya had known about her perversion, but old Paya had told her it was nothing to be upset about. That, in the end, Curry's strange desires just might make her and someone else very happy. Curry thought that old Paya was just trying to make her feel better. Curry drifted lower and noted the kopak on his horse, a big black stallion. These monkey bones people were so odd, riding other animals, moving slowly across the land in their wagons. But then they had so many things. They reveled in their things. It was a strange concept for the Jataksha, who didn't collect things, but valued battle, family, flying. The land was also very odd. The grasses were yellow and parched. At least the mountains on her right were green with rain. Those mountains reminded Curry of her homeland, now so far away, now so far gone. She'd never go back. She missed the greenery, the jungle smells, the jungle chatter of the monkeys and the meows of the michi-michi. To not feel the hot air around her or feel the wet, ceaseless rain dripping off her feathers, it was a shame. Her homesickness, like her memories, was dangerous. She had to be strong. Strength of character, strength of mind, strength of wing. There were two greenskins riding horses, both so savage, both so rough. Curry had heard that greenskins had terrible teeth like daggers, but she hadn't really believed such stories. In fact, she didn't believe much of what she'd heard about the peoples of Chinchaland or the lands to the north. Curry came from Orinland, the southern continent. Then there was Quentiland, and that was the western continent, where supposedly one of her kind, a hero of the highest order, had gone. Lulindrix Nagina Pajolin of the Pajolin Wasi, of what once had been Almaquataka. But now that city, both on the ground and floating in the sky, was a graveyard and training ground for King Shapta's armies. At least Lalindrix Nagina Pajolin was still alive, though she lived in that far-off land. There was a good chance her wasi had been destroyed. She'd be an orphan. Curry thought that was sad. That anyone should have her same fate was very sad indeed. Even sadder? Lalindrix Pajolin was rich, powerful, beloved. All of the things that Curry wasn't. Curry could fight, sure, but she wasn't a legendary hero and never would be, not now. She would be despised for what she had done, hated forever, cursed and cast out. Curry landed on the stone road in front of the Kopak's caravan. It had been powerful magic to craft so many miles of such firm rock. It seemed miraculous but the Chinchalanders needed such roads so they could move their things. Did they not know the value of what they couldn't touch nor hoard? Curry stood with her hands on the pommels of her Kurachia. There is no trouble ahead. There is only these dry lands. I hope you have water. The Kopak rode up to her and spoke in his monkey bones language. He had such a nice smile. He was very handsome. If only he had wings. Then Curry might ask him to help her with her huke. As it was, she had nuna seeds in her pouch. It was very possible that Curry would never know the joy of her lust again. Perhaps that was just fine, given the darkness inside her, the perversions. The carriage stopped, as did the two wagons behind them. Both of those wagons were loaded with books. It had taken the Kopak and his women days to sort through all the texts and stack them carefully into the wagon. They used their strange chinchalander magic to make the tarp waterproof. It was sad. The ancient point ear had died, and Curry didn't understand exactly what had happened. She did know that when anyone, young or old, died, 
it was a time for weeping and sadness. You didn't just mourn the recently dead, but all the dead who had ever died. In Corey's case, that sometimes felt unbearable. The graceful blonde pointier, who was so soft and gentle, stepped out of the carriage. She approached Curry carefully. The pointier smelled so very good, and she was so very pretty, even without wings. It was strange for Curry to be so honest with herself, because the Jataksha were only attracted to others of their race, to those that had wings. The black-haired woman, the whom, had pretty blue eyes, granted, but she smirked and scowled and smiled a bit too much. She also tried to hide her real emotions behind her twinkling eyes and smile. Curry didn't trust her. The blonde pointier, the green skin, and the whom all spoke in their strange language. They seemed to be planning something, and it was pretty clear it was something that had to do with her. Curry flew off, wondering how she would learn to communicate with these people. And even if she learned their language, would she tell them about her fate? Would that change her destiny? Curry didn't know. Maybe it was good that they wouldn't talk much. She was very glad that the Kopak had allowed her to journey with them back to their home, the stone and glass citadel to the far north. That would be where Curry would live out the rest of her days. The Kopak and his Elu didn't need to know her secret story. She didn't want them to know, because they seemed so happy and in love. Curry didn't want to bring anyone sadness. She didn't want anyone to feel bad, because she'd spent her life feeling bad. Curry returned to the sky until the carriage and wagon stopped for the night. Curry would sleep on top of the carriage. She watched as the greenskins took care of the horses, while the pointier worked with others to make dinner, including a strange little woman and her baby, and a wide little woman who smiled all the time. Curry thought she might be a dwarf, but it was said dwarven women had beards. This woman didn't, just freckles. Curry did like her hair, though, which seemed to be a happier color of red. The Kopak started a fire. He had killed a deer and had skillfully skinned the animal and removed the entrails. He fashioned his own spit, and soon the smell of the meat cooking reached Curry. The point deer had come to talk with Curry, and she'd talked in a very kind and soothing voice, and Curry had responded in her own language. Again, they couldn't communicate and Curry didn't leave her perch. If she had only grown up rich with a powerful wasi, then she could have talked to the pointier. She might know all sorts of languages, but her schooling had been sporadic. The Kopak pointed at her. It was clear he was summoning her. Curry flew down and took a slice of meat off his dagger. She ate it, and it was delicious. So delicious. That was when she felt the pointier come close and touch her. The pointier spoke two powerful words. Then Curry felt the change go through her, and she gulped. The pointier smiled. Hello, I'm Lily Nahenna. I think my flow spell worked, though I'm not sure. I'm sorry it took me so long to find the magic. You can, you can understand me? Curry realized she might have grease from the meat on her face. She wiped at her mouth with the back of her hand. Thank the Kopak for the meat. I am so very happy to be traveling with you. I feel sad for the ancient pointier who was killed by the spider. The Hell Knights like to use the spiders, but so do the Apotexa. We are lucky none of the Apotexa flew through the portal during the fight. They are awful. Corey realized, in horror, she had talked too much. Lily took her hand. We have so many questions for you. You embraced Ymir when you first met him. I think Ymir is the Kopak? Perhaps, Curry whispered. If Ymir is the name of the one who will one day rule all of Chinchaland, I am Lakuri Kochachamba. I have no wasi. I have no suyuk. All I have is your hospitality, 
and kindness. What do your friends call you? Lily asked gently. Guri. She glanced around at all the women and Ymir, all watching her. Two of the three moons were full in the sky, and so the night would have been warm even without the fire. Why did you want to come with us, Curry? Lily asked. All of the eyes on her were too much. The truth of Curry's life was too much. She had to fly away. She wasn't ready to talk with him just yet. She might not ever be. She knew she should be brave and stay, but she couldn't stand it. She'd been foolish to be lured down from the carriage by the meat. She had her Nuna seeds. They would be enough for a while. Still, that seasoned meat had tasted so good, and it sat nicely in her belly. If only she had some wine or beer, she would have felt even better, though Curry knew the dangers of liquor. She couldn't let herself embrace that despair again. Never again. Now that the blonde point ear, Lily, her name was Lily, had magic so they could talk, Curry knew she might have to tell Ymir about what she had seen, why she had flown through the portal, and the grave danger he faced. She'd survived any number of battles against King Shapta, but the very thought of telling Ymir the truth made Curry want to weep. And she did cry, but she was flying so fast through the night sky that the tears dried before they could fall from her face. Chapter 12 Once Ymir saw the red bricks of the Vemper's Road that led up to Old Ironbound, he left the carriage and wagons behind. He urged his black stallion into a gallop as he made his way around the switchbacks that would take him to the Sun Gate. It had been a long five weeks, but he was so glad to be back home. The She-Orc guards recognized him immediately and threw open the gates. He rode through and was surprised to see Della Pinez there, in her robes that bore the symbol of all four houses of magic, the red and yellow starburst for sunfire, the white moons on blue for moons, a brown fist on a green background for form, and the gray open palm against black for flow. Ymir wasn't surprised to see Curry land on top of the sun gate, watching them. It was a clear day, the sky blue and the sun warm, he inhaled to smell the sea on the other side of campus. To Ymir's right was the Sunfire Field. Straight ahead was the Throne Auditorium and the Librarium Citadel. Della nodded at him, then at the Winkin on the gate above. So, you brought a new friend. What is she doing on my wall? Ymir got off his horse and let one of the she-orcs take the stallion away. He approached the princept who seemed small and slight, though she was anything but. She could draw a sword of fire from the very air at any moment. Honored Princept, we should talk at length. There is a great deal of interesting things happening in these cursed lands. Blessed lands, clansmen, Della grinned, because of your return. She bowed, then turned and hurried through the big front doors of the throne auditorium. Ymir waved to the Winkin on the wall. She waved back and then launched herself up and flew eastward. They had that much of an understanding, at least. Would the wild-winged woman live with them in the zoo? Ymir wasn't sure. When they'd found inns instead of sleeping under the stars, Curry hadn't wanted to stay under a roof. She'd slept on top of their carriage while they'd been in Kingwater. He still couldn't believe she'd spent her nights in four roads sleeping in the ruins of Edrin's Manor. Ymir walked into the throne auditorium, which was full of seats, all facing the central dais where the Vemper Eagle Aquador once sat. For now, the place was empty. It was clear, however, that the auditorium was being prepped for the coming school year. Soon, all of the scholars would gather there for the first day of class. Della grabbed his hand and pulled him close. She held him for a long time, and he held her back. One of his arms drew her close, and he felt the bones under her strong muscles. His right hand fell to her hip, 
to feel the roundness there. She smelled good, her perfume and her own scent. Both were familiar to him after their many sparring sessions over the years. Ymir also smelled the lingering scent of Caro. So she'd been smoking. She was a woman of many passions. Still, the embrace was surprising. Even after their wild time during the glow rain, Della had wanted to keep their relationship as professional as possible. She'd asked him to call her Princept, and not Della, even when she'd come to visit them in the zoo to see how little Gertie was progressing. It took some time, but finally the Princept stepped back. A blush glowed on her cheeks. Her eyes were on the floor. I'm sorry, I forgot myself. No one was here, and I've missed you. I can't tell you how much I've missed you and your Sharab. This entire school seemed so empty. It's the summer, Princept, Ymir said with a little smile. Many of the scholars have returned home. Her gray eyes flashed with anger, but that anger was gone when they found his. I'm being vulnerable, clansmen. Don't make me regret it more than I already do. Ymir was taken aback by this show of honesty. Delapinez knew the power of truth like few did. Don't regret your words, Princept. I missed you and old Ironbound as well. She sighed. It's all changed. The whole world, it seems. It seems ridiculous for you to call me Princept. We are venturing into a new eon. In this new age, I doubt you will be my student, and it seems unlikely I'll be your princept. Let's talk in my office. She walked away, and Ymir followed. They had much to talk about. Lily still wasn't ready to share her vision yet, and Ymir thought it might have something to do with the burned book they'd found. He wasn't sure, though. Lily said that they simply had to wait. Ymir and Della ambled through the back doors of the auditorium, over the moat, and into the western entrance of the Librarium Citadel. It felt so good to be back in his blessed library. The smells, the sights, the few scholars. For Ymir, it truly was like coming home. Della sat in her chair in her mezzanine office, and Ymir sat in the chair in front of the desk. She had Kaif for them both. They sat in silence, and while Ymir found it comfortable, he could see Della struggling. With what, he didn't know. Grandfather Bear always warned against asking a woman a question if you didn't have the time for the answer. Truth be told, Ymir wanted to see Ribby again. After five weeks away, he missed her skin and strength, and he was curious to see how much she would curse the paradise tree after working there full time for five weeks with very little help. Yet, with the current events of the world, talking with Della might be worth a question or two. So Ymir struck at the heart of the matter. King Shopta's army can use portal magic. I was there with an old elf called Edrin Hyendel. But then, you've read all the sand letters on the subject, correct? I have. You didn't have any mishaps with the books, did you? Della asked. Ojan Tej would not be happy if that were the case. I like her, Ymir said. She isn't as fierce as you are, but she's close. The books are fine. But this portal magic. Of course, we need to defend ourselves from it, and from a winged army. They have giant fire-breathing bats and armored warriors with giant spiders on their backs. Della frowned. Yes, the rat wings, the hell knights, and the demon spiders. They also have the Apotexa. The Josen Town Sand Crier reported that King Shopta can alter the shape of living winkin and turn them into his slaves. Something about the way their douches work. For the winkin do have souls, despite what some say. We did not fight any of these altered winkin. Ymir gripped his cave, but didn't drink it. Della, when we first sat down here, you were quiet. Why? I don't think it's because of the invasion. For one, in Kingwater, we heard that Josentown held, 
thanks in part to the winged mercenaries that Aribel hired. Others say it was Queen Ari's swamp magic and Daris Bokujin's flow spells. Either way, King Shopta's armies have been forced back across the Blue Sea. During their retreat, they tried to take Wilhelminaville, but failed. It seemed like a half-hearted attempt at best. Which begs the question, what was their intent all along? He looked into the princept's eyes. Tell me about that silence. Her smile was sad. You know your princept too well, clansman. No, I was relieved to find that King Shopta's portal magic has limits, and that the swamp magic of those Blackwater witches was so effective. I'm going to encourage Jenny Bell to delve deeper into Jelu Devocho, the fifth category, for her Dominus Studier. Portal enchantments work best with flow magic, though they have been a forbidden art for ages now. Dominus Studier, our fourth year project. I have my work already, as you know, but we'll talk about my final year here in a moment. I want to know more about that silence. It wasn't like you. Della opened her desk drawer and removed a bottle of orc liquor, the Ipa, and tipped the bottle into her cave. And you know me so well. After a mere three years, it's the blink of an eye. Long enough for you to threaten to kill me, Ymir said with a grin. His amusement belied his worry. It wasn't like the princept to be so transparent when it came to concealing her true thoughts. She was far too good of a liar for that. Talk true to me, Della, for we are far beyond the games we played when I first came to this school. Fine. Della drank down a good portion of her spiked cave. You want some? Ymir moved his cup so she could tip some of the Ipa into his cave. Then she spoke in a quiet voice. Ribby and I had sex. It was unexpected. It was a mistake. And someone knows. They sent me a sand letter, warning me that they would ruin me if I didn't stop. They mentioned you by name. How did my name come up? he asked. They said I wanted you, but I had to stop. Della smiled and tried to laugh. The sound died in her throat. As if that is a surprise to you. After our kiss, and then what happened last year, with Lily and Tori, with Gatha, and now with Ribby. Ymir wanted to make the joke that Jenny Bell and Ziziva might feel left out. However, he saw that the normally indestructible Della Panez was in true torment. He kept that jest to himself. I suppose you didn't ask yourself the three questions. Oh, but I tried. Ribby didn't want us to think too much, but I did ask the three questions. Two were very easy. The third one? I disrespected myself, but I've been having these dreams of late, sex dreams. They have driven me to my wit's end, and you know that Ribby is not particularly interested in chitubbing. She came to me, wanting a kiss. I gave her that and more. Ymir could understand the princept's moral misgivings. She was in a position of power, with any number of colleagues and enemies waiting for her to make a mistake. It was why kings of the clans had to be careful about who they fucked. Sex was powerful, dangerous, distracting, and she'd fought her own desires for years. Yet, this also showed the importance of the three questions. The misery was apparent on Della's face. Ymir smiled. I have a bit of wisdom from Grandmother Rabbit if you want to hear it. Of course you do, Della said sarcastically, but she motioned for him to continue. My grandmother said that some thoughts can be a poison. To get rid of them, you either talk them out or act them out, but they need to get out. You've been here for decades, over 50 years, and you've behaved. Or am I wrong? You're not wrong, 
You've been tempted before, but you've stayed strong. Until I came and collected my harem, and you came under the influence of the wolf. And the wolf doesn't care about the three questions or respect or anything. The wolf howls because he is full of life and lust. The wolf fucks when it's time to fuck. The axe man might have hewn the path for us, but he won't tell us why. He doesn't care. The shield maiden does care, but she is powerless. And here we are, the children of our paths. Enslaved to our fate, Della said bitterly. Never. The axe man laid a path for us. You would be wise to walk it, but you don't have to. You are free to choose, just as I was free to choose. When I forged the black ice ring, I could have destroyed my douja. I chose not to. At that point, it was the wolf watching over me, not the axe man or the shield maiden. It was me choosing chaos. He smiled, feeling like a wolf. Some would say I chose evil, for the Akiric rings were forged by Aegil Acrador, and they allowed him to rule for a thousand years. He murdered countless people in his lust for power. Let's hope I do not follow in his path, for I am going to finish this, Della. I am going to forge the eighth ring, the sleeper's ring. What did the demon say to you again? Della asked. I curse you. I curse you forever. Let the sleeper wake from the dream. Ymir felt icy fingers on his spine saying those words. He steadied himself. And here I am, making the sleepers ring. Now that we have a name, we can redouble our efforts at finding the enchantment we'll need to forge it. Ymir shrugged. But all that aside... I find your situation troubling in two ways. Three, if you press me. Della finished her cave and poured more of the Ipa into her cup. Let's hear the first two. You and I can negotiate the third. Edrin spoke of dreams that kept him up and that kept his wives busy. If you are having similar dreams, then that might be something to consider. Secondly, I hate that someone is spying on you and I hate that they are threatening you. We will find out who they are, and we will deal with them. Ymir wondered at the secrets of these Southerners. They made their own lives so fucking complicated. Up north, things were far simpler. And what is the third? Della asked. I am pressing you to tell me. You and I, Ymir said. You've let me sip from your cup of lust, Della Panez, but I want to drink from it fully. I am troubled that this spy might prevent me from doing that. Are we being that direct? Della looked down at her cup. It seems we are. You aren't jealous that I had sex with one of your wives? Only disappointed I wasn't there. Ymir laughed. I have six women to keep satisfied. If you joined us, you could help me. Finally, Della smiled, and her smile wasn't sad. And now I am tempted. You know, the holy Theranus Vemper has been sending me sand letters. He wants me to become the Vempress should he die. He worries his mother might kill him to stop him. Ymir thought Irwin should probably be careful. Arlinda Appleford wasn't about to let her family lose that lineage, though the Holy Theranus Empire was small and weak. Irwin, though, had some strange ideas. Knowing a dragon murdered his brother had changed him. If you were the Vampress, we could be together, Ymir said. Della chuckled. It's strange to say, but I have more power as the Princept at Old Ironbound. No, Ymir. Once you graduate, once you are no longer a scholar at my school, you and I will be able to do all sorts of things together. Ymir smelled a sudden musky perfume. Then a voice whispered to him, If you can control your lust, Ymir, 
and if the dreams don't drive her insane. Ymir laughed. Serena Sia is still around, isn't she? Oh, yes, Della agreed. Our ghost, my would-be mentor. Do you know what Serena would have me do? Fuck me, stupid. Ymir drank his cafe and liked the bittersweet bite. It would take a bit, but I'd be willing to try. When you graduate, Della said, in less than a year, we'll get to drink each other dry. Ymir didn't think they would wait until then, because the wolf moon was coming, and when the three moons filled the sky, all sorts of things happened. The wolf moon brought chaos, and Ymir had learned to enjoy chaos. Chapter 13 That very day, after a big dinner, Ymir found himself in the scrollery. The tables were filled with Edrin Hyendel's library, and Gatha was already sorting through the books. She had a very good idea of which texts were important for Ymir's research, both into the Night of Fire and the Sleeper's Ring. Ziziva had taken little Gertie to relieve the mermaid from her duties at the Paradise Tree. Ribby had attacked Ymir and dragged him back to the zoo, along with Lily and Tori. It wasn't an accident that the little dwab had her inconvenience right then, because the mermaid could reach into Tori's soul to ignite her passion. Ymir found himself on his back, with Ribby riding him, while Lily kissed him and Tori rubbed herself, waiting for her turn. Then it was any number of combinations, until the mermaid couldn't wait and made all three of them orgasm. After the sex, Ribby wanted to sleep. Lily wanted to unpack and work on her art, while Tori was dying to get back into the big kitchen of the feasting hall. Gatha would have joined them for the sex, but she was too busy with unloading the wagons. As for Jenny Bell, she wanted to talk with her contacts at the school, who might be able to tell them more about current events in Josentown. King Shapta had been repulsed, but how? The town crier had been rather vague, which made sense. Such information might be used by the invading army. Della walked down the steps into the scrollery, but she wasn't the only princept there. Serena Sia was there as well, watching from the shadows. Ymir caught sight of her out of the corner of his eye. When he'd been on the tundra, such a specter would have unnerved him. Now she was part of the school and a part of his life. He'd taken a bone from her corpse, and so he was responsible for her restless spirit. At the same time, he knew she somehow fit into his work forging the rings. Ymir opened Edrin's journal and showed it to Della. Here, read this. I looked on with anxious eyes. The clansman has come south. And I hear the world's weary sigh. The clansman has come south. Then all of us should prepare to die and hold our tears that we might not cry. For the man whose soul is so very dry, the clansman has come south. The princept read it through. Ymir couldn't help but enjoy her warmth and scent. He almost hoped they would wait the ten months until he graduated. The sexual tension would be unbearable, and when they finally gave in to their instincts, the sex would be very good indeed. She turned to him, a little smile playing on her face. The man whose soul is dry can't be you. You are very moist. I hate that word, Gatha growled from the pile of books she was working on. Give me a wet cunt, not a moist cunt. And you two might not want to talk about the fucking we did here together, but I can think of nothing else. I know the Princept must stay chaste, but I don't have to. Once our initial work here is done, I will need you, Ymir. I will need you keenly. And I'll take care of that need, Ymir said to the she-orc. He then returned his attention to less carnal matters. 
Edrin used his personal journals to write down his lesser poetry and story ideas. They have his thoughts, yes, and they chronicle his very long life, but they also have random bits here and there. In that passage, he's not talking about me. He's talking about Fionn Yamal, the clansman who killed Aegil Acrador. It's interesting to note that most of the histories of the Night of Fire don't mention him at all. But look at this page. Ymir retrieved another one of the large leather-bound sheaves of paper and opened to a page he'd marked. So the original poem was early in his life. This is from three years ago. He is talking about a dream he had, and for once, it wasn't full of sex. Gatha laughed. I like his sex dreams. He was twisted, even for me. Ymir could attest to that. In this dream, he thinks he saw another barbarian coming south, as you can read. Della read the text below Ymir's finger. I looked on with much surprise. The clansman has come south. The world sees that dawn is nigh. The clansman has come south. Some will cling to their midnight goodbye, but they will surely falter and die. When all eight of the rings do rise, the clansman has come south. All eight of the rings, Della whispered. What did Edrin know of the rings? Gatha came over and set a book down. It was a copy of Circulum. He has the basic texts we've used. He knew more about ringology than most. Ymir turned the page of Edrin's later journal to show them the illustrations of the eight rings. Not only did he know of my coming, but he also guessed my interest in the rings. We think he might have been studying the sleeper's ring, but the idea frightened him. Out of all the rings, it was the most powerful. Some will cling to their midnight goodbyes, Della quoted. That points to the Midnight Guild. He knew. Edrin knew a great deal, Ymir agreed. And it seems his knowledge was the reason he was killed. Out of all the places the portal could have appeared, it was there, in his backyard. Gatha came over with more books on forging the Akiric rings. She set them down. One of the books had been burned black. These texts are forbidden, especially this one. She motioned to the burned book, but didn't touch it. Ymir wouldn't have found it but for Lily. She'd been wearing the veil tear ring when the demons attacked. Della went to open the burned book, but she stopped. It doesn't want to be opened. It should have burned, but it was too powerful. It is a nasty thing, is it not? Can you not feel it? Ymir laughed. It's a fucking book. He took it and opened it. But yes, the burned leather felt icy to the touch. Opening it, he heard hisses, whispers, disembodied voices that didn't come from Serena. Though the ghost did have a warning for him. Don't be foolish, Ymir. Some books will kill you or make you wish for death. Words have power. You attend a magic school. You should know better. Ymir had opened the burned book before, but the contents of the tome had a way of dropping from his mind. There was a symbol on the first page, a series of octagons, meeting at angles that hurt his mind. Octavado would have liked the book, since it seemed to have so many eights. Turning a page, he saw the swirl of text, though it wasn't in any language he'd ever seen before. Gatha had her back turned to them. Please, could you close that thing? I don't want to see that writing. Della stood with Ymir. It's not ancient Theranus, and it's not an ancient language like Sanskrit or Zidian or Karanji, which are the major languages found in Ethra. Could it be something from Rata? Could it be the language of the Wingkin? No! It's not Jatakshian, Gatha snarled. Or not like any Jatakshian I've ever seen. Ymir was relieved. The script hurt his head. It also made his heart feel cold. 
Everything about that book was cold. He closed it. Della frowned. I will be taking it to the Illuminate Spire, and I will not have any discussion on the matter. We all know it's a terrible, terrible book. Do we know its title? We call it simply the Burned Book, Gatha said. And I don't think it's from any language of this world. If anything, it's the language of demons. But perhaps we should have Curry take a look. Have you two spoken of Curry? Della seemed to get dizzy. She found a seat. And who is Curry? Ymir pulled up his own chair. He felt lightheaded, and that coldness in his heart wasn't going away. He felt like he'd been standing outside in a winter's midnight wind. Gatha put on the extra cloak she kept in the scrollery for when she got cold. She spent a great deal of time down there, reading. Curry is the Jatakshian warrior who followed the monsters out of the portal. She then followed us. She is a mystery. Another girl for your harem, Ymir? Della asked. Doubtful, but she did embrace me during the battle. She has been a mystery, all right. Tears, weeping, but flying as well. Lily cast a flow magic incantation so she can talk to her. We are hoping to get better magic this year to get more information from her. We thought she would stay in Four Roads to talk with the Grand Vimper Irwin or Ojan Tej or the Bloody Dawn Guild. That wasn't meant to be. She wanted to come with us. Della smiled. The Vimper Irwin has been sending me sand letters. It seems he is very impressed that we killed a dragon. He is seeing it as some kind of sign that we might rule the world someday, Ymir. I'd rather kill more dragons, Ymir muttered. Della's face darkened. So, back to the wingkin. Will she be sleeping at the zoo? Perhaps, Ymir said, though I'm not sure such a creature would like being indoors. Those wings are impressive. Other wingkin have attended our school. Della's eyes went back to the burned book, then dropped to the floor. At any other time, I would see if she wanted to be a scholar here. Is she educated? We can hardly fucking talk to her, Gatha spat. We don't know. You think she might be a spy for King Shapta? The thought did occur to me, Della sighed. We haven't had very many good experiences with strangers at this school, not since Ymir arrived. But if you want us to interview her, and if we think she might do well, we could think about bringing her on as an imprudent student. Did Lily see anything about her when she peered through the veil? She didn't, not that she had time to look. But the vision has disturbed her. She can't talk about it yet. It did help her find the burned book, however. Ymir was thirsty, and he was cold. He thought Della putting the burned book up in the illuminate spire was for the best after all. He'd want to look at it again, once they read through more of the Hyendel collection. Maybe there would be something in Edrin's journal. Or they might be able to use the veil tearing again. Not Lily. She'd said she would never put it on again. But Ymir hadn't worn it for a while. And Tori was always game. She wanted to make more snacks for the hellhound. In fact, she thought she wanted to do her dominist studier on demonology, Fluffy in particular, and she had hopes that their dominist potions class would help her. She was also going to be taking advanced alchemy, as well as perfecting her form combat magic. Ymir had used the black ice ring to slow time to use the veil tear, but that might have been a fluke. It hadn't worked again. Dealing with the black ice ring was as hard as trying to use the flesh steel. Ymir still had a lot to learn about using the artifacts. So, Della, Ymir said, we might have a new scholar for you, but what were your plans for me and the rest of my harem? Call us your patur, Gatha insisted. I prefer that word, and I don't need the princept's counseling. I have my work for the year going through Edrin's books. Mazelith Bielheim has promised to mentor me in advanced conservation, though I showed those librarians in the Lyrum archive a thing or two. As for the Hyendel collection, 
I will fix the books I can, and possibly rewrite the ones that were only partially damaged. I have also considered compiling Edrin's journals into a collection, taking special note of his erotic visions. I also want to work more with the Akiric rings. Also, Garum and Korga asked me to tutor the Imprudens in their classical warfare class. I'm also curious about some of this demonology. I was going to attend a class here and there. With my permission, Della asked. Normally, scholars can't simply flit around classes they find interesting. I'm not a normal scholar, Gatha growled. Della laughed. <laughs> no, you are not. And you have my permission. The advanced conservation work and cataloging the Hyendel collection will be your dominus studie. And Ymir is working on his history of the Night of Fire as well as the Sleeper's Ring. That is clear. But, Ymir, I would ask that you take a world history class, which will include both Ethra and Reta. You've studied enough about Thera. Professor Albatross also wants to teach an advanced demonology class, which will be of some use to you and Tori, I think. She still wants to tame Fluffy, doesn't she? She does. Ymir wasn't shocked that Della knew so much about them, but he was surprised that he rather liked the idea of the Princept keeping tabs on them. The Princept continued, You'll be joining Tori in the potions class, where you'll touch on the more complex flow magic, the rest of the schedule you'll figure out. However, you are not incorrect in saying that we need to defend ourselves against portal magic. I am hoping Jenny Bell will focus on that as her dominus studie. Last I heard, she wanted to do something more ambiguous, like diplomacy. Now is not the time for such niceties, Della smiled. Ymir thought everything the princept said made sense. They didn't need to discuss Ziziva, since she was no longer a student, but there were two others to consider. And what of Ribby and Lily? Ymir asked. Della thought for a minute. Lily has her epic work to finish and publish, and I would want her to also edit and publish your epic tale, Ymir. I very much enjoyed Eric's sorrow. However, for her, we need something more combat-oriented. She has her flow archery, we could have her focus more on that. I'll have to think about it. As for Ribby, I would have said our mermaid could do her dominus studie on diplomacy, but she's come a long way. I'll have to think more about our Charybda. Ymir could have made an ill-timed joke, but he didn't. Gatha, though, solved both problems. Lily should work on her flow spear skills. As for Ribby, she should perfect her ability to transfer energy to us during battle, not unlike the Gather Breath Ring. To share resources on the battlefield is a tremendous advantage, magical rings or not. Ymir's eyes went from the she-orc to the half-elven princept. It felt so natural for them to be together, planning their year and pondering the mysteries of their age. It would be quite the year, he knew, and though it might be his last, he thought it very well might be his best. Chapter 14 The next six weeks passed quickly, and Ymir realized a great deal had changed because of King Shopta's siege of the Swamp Coast Queendom. For one, there were suspiciously fewer boys for the open exam, Della and Garum ran the lads through their paces, but for the first time in a long time, no one passed. It was the Viscount, Roger Nelnap, who knew why. Ymir overheard him talking to some other boys. Most of the countryside, from Kingwater and the Farmington Collective to Crean on the Sorrow Coast, wanted their young men close to their families in case one of the portals of the Demon Conqueror appeared in their territory. Gossip about the portals had spread quickly. The people who worried about portals were the same people who worried that the withering, the sickness that prevented boys from being born, was getting worse. These fearful people thought fewer women were getting pregnant. 
from reports gathered by the major universities across the continent, that wasn't the case. Another change, Darius Bokujin hadn't returned for his dominist year. He'd stayed in Josentown with his wife, Queen Ari Bell. It drove Nellie Bell Tucker crazy with worry, and Ymir was there to witness some of her discomfort since they had a class together. Perhaps the biggest change was to Ymir himself. Many of his fellow scholars, and some faculty, treated him like he had already graduated and was only at the school for his post dominus studies. Some treated Ymir like he was faculty already. He'd considered teaching, but then the reality of the tedium made him rethink that madness. He was many things, but he wasn't a teacher. It was early on a Saturday morning, and Ymir wanted to do some reading before he rode his wives to Stormlight Island. He sipped his cafe and read. He'd liked working in the Lyrum archive, but he enjoyed his normal table on the second floor better. Ymir thought he'd spent most of his dominist year there, working on the Night of Fire and researching the Sleeper's Ring. That wasn't going to be the case. All of his classes were challenging and completely engaging. There was no repeat of the courtly manners and arts he'd taken his imprudence year. That professor, Denalia Fisher King, would be joining the frizzy-haired Nile Preet to teach his World of Raxid history class. Professor Fisher King didn't like him, but Professor Preet did. He and Preet had spent countless hours together discussing the ages of Thera. Ymir was glad that Ribby was in that class with him, because everyone else in the small class either didn't know him or hated him. The Viscount Roger Nelnap sat with the smirking Duke, Odd Corey. Darisbo was also in that class, if he ever returned from Josentown. Nellie Bell Tucker didn't sit next to the boys. She sat near Ymir and Ribby and tried to be friendly. Ymir didn't return Nellie's friendliness. He knew the kind of poison she had in her heart. Nellie had sabotaged Ymir's initial first exam. She would have killed Jenny Bell and not thought twice about it. She was a conniving witch, and Ymir had no time for such drama. Nellie, along with Darisbo and Ari Bell, made a devil's triangle. Ymir did have to admit that it seemed the Josens and Kujans coming together had helped save all of Thera. They'd stopped King Shapta and sent him back to Reta. What was the demon lord's next plan? All of Thera was wondering. Ymir was happy to have two classes with Tori, his advanced demonology class, as well as Dominus Potions class. Tori had taken other potions classes, but this would be a first for Ymir. He was of the understanding that the class would be similar to his alchemy class, which he'd enjoyed his second year at the school. He might not trust Professor Linny Lynn Albatross, but she taught well. He'd taken her Religions of Thera class his third year. This time, she would be talking about her favorite subject, demons. Of course, she insisted that she was talking about demons as a metaphor. It was theories on demonology, not demonology itself. So much of the class was bound to be mere stories. But the rest... Ymir had practical experiences with demons. Linny knew that. She was involved in the White Rose Society. They wanted the Akiric rings to be forged. She was helpful. At the same time, Ymir couldn't trust her. He did want to show her the burned book, however, just to get her opinion on the strange writing. However, he remembered Edrin's warning. The Midnight Guild was nothing compared to the evil of the White Rose Society. Well, Ymir would use them until their evil showed itself. Even then, if they were useful, he'd take advantage of their resources. As for their potions class, it was also taught by two professors. Issa Leal, the Flow Studio Dukes, would handle the advanced flow concepts, Professor Leal had come to see Ymir as more than just an upstart barbarian with delusions of grandeur. The old elven woman respected him. Professor Phoebe Amalbiab, the other teacher, would be doing most of the teaching. She also liked Ymir. The mermaid couldn't help but admire him, since the daughter of an ocean mother divine was part of his shareb. Tori said that Ymir's drinking pal, 
Rodor boot black, might help on some of the potions because of their reliance on certain alchemical compounds. Just those three classes would have kept Ymir busy, but then he was also reading through Edrin's many books. Not the published ones, but the ones that Edrin wrote that were never even edited. He had written biographies of the Fellowship of Adventurers who went to kill the Vemper. Edrin had a name for them, the Enraged, or the Fellowship of the Enraged. They were angry, all right, and in the end, they did what others had failed to do. Ymir had memorized their names, their races, their skills. Their elven leader, the dwarf, the human princeling, the gruel married couple, the fairy, the winken. And last but not least, Fionnya Maul, who had come south, following a strange path that the axeman had hewn for him. Better to kill the demon king in the Southlands than fight him on the axe tundra. Edrin Hyendel had also been there, in the shadows, too afraid to fight. His cowardice might have been a good thing. It had kept him alive so he could write the history. Ymir enjoyed his work on the Night of Fire, but he liked working on the Eighth Ring more. In his private journals, Edrin had talked about another history of the Akiric Rings, one that predated Aegil Acredor, who had reforged them. It was interesting, but Edrin didn't go into much detail about the first set of rings. Though the old elf warned about a third forging, Ymir wasn't put off. Growing up, he'd always been able to take care of every evil with a swing of his axe. But since fighting the lonely man, Ymir realized there were some things in the world that needed to be removed by using sorcery. Why limit himself to only his axe and the magic he'd learned at Old Ironbound? He wanted all eight rings so he could protect his wives and his home. Besides, he recalled the vision he'd had at Four Roads. He would eventually wear all of the Akiric rings when he returned to the axe tundra. Ymir knew his world was in trouble. King Shapta had been defeated, but he wasn't dead. And from his history classes, Ymir knew that conquerors rarely gave up. They persevered until kingdoms fell or they were slain. The demon conqueror would try again, surely. And this time, he might succeed. As for Curry, even when Lily cast her flow magic to talk with the Winken, she didn't want to tell them much. The Jataksha warrior only said that it was important for her to be near Ymir, that a time would come when the sky would be watching her and the fate of the world would hang in the balance. It was another prophecy, not unlike the visions they'd had of Ziziva fighting the dragon. Unlike the fairy princess, Curry wasn't staying with them at the zoo. The winged woman said she wasn't worthy. Curry had built herself a thatched hut on top of their Amora Annex, the same rooftop where they'd forged the Yellow Scorch and Winter Flame Rings. They still used the Amora Annex for the Zocolati business, and it was where Gatha kept her erotica collection. She'd added several books from the Hyendel collection. Curry's nest was something. She'd gathered sticks and branches from the forests around them to make her roost. Tori insisted on going down there and making it a bit more waterproof with her form magic, but the place had been made with such skill, her enchantments didn't do much. Tori did provide the wink in a pillow and blankets. Curry had already collected a mattress of sweet-smelling grasses stuffed into a handwoven casing. Her little hut had rocks and a chimney, but Tori drew the line there and bought the wink in a metal stove for heat and for cooking. Tori showed Curry how to use it, and the winged woman was very grateful, though embarrassed. Ymir liked this winkin. Anyone who could expertly build their own shelter deserved his respect. Curry also fashioned a barbed spear, which she used to fish. He caught her eating little nuts out of a bag. She called them her Nuna seeds. They were important somehow. Curry was as secretive about them as she was about everything else. Thinking of Curry must have summoned her. The Jataksha woman flew in through the Librarium Citadel. He smelled her wings before he glanced up. She floated down over the railing and landed on the floor next to the table. Jelujalorum. Ymir cast the spell that would allow him to talk with the Winkin. 
The princept said you can't fly inside the citadel. You have to fly near and then walk inside. Curry dropped her head, her red hair covering her face. I'm sorry, I forget. Your Elu is waiting for you, Kopak. They are at the Amora Annex. Getha suggested I fetch you. Her words came out stilted. Lily didn't think that was from the spell, but from the winged woman's lack of confidence. Kopak. It meant king in her language. Ymir wasn't sure how he felt about the title. Ruling a kingdom seemed about as tedious as ruling a classroom. Ymir closed his book. I have been fetched. On their way out, he gave Drippy the books he'd brought from the Hyendel collection. Drippy's real name was Steny Chimervik. She was a mousy woman from Winterholm to the north, part of the Sorrow Coast Kingdom. At one point, Ymir had thought she was from the Farmington Collective. That wasn't the case. Poor Drippy was continually sick. But despite her sickly constitution and runny nose, Ymir trusted her like he trusted Della. Say what you will about the Winterhome girl, she took very good care of him and his books. Ymir tried to talk with Curry on their way back, though it wasn't easy. The girl was not a good conversationalist. Once outside the citadel, Ymir felt the mist of the morning wet his skin. The ocean smelled good, and though the day would be chilly, Ymir knew he'd eventually be sweating from the day's activities. Gatha and his other wives would make sure of it. As they walked under the new dragon archway and across the flow courtyard, Ymir noticed her wings were less white. They had a dingy appearance, and the girl's skin was sallow. She seemed withered. Are you eating enough, Curry? Yes, Kopak. The woman's sandals slapped on the stone. The girl was in her armor, which she cleaned obsessively, and she had her two short swords. I get fish. I have nuna seeds. Tori brings me sweets. I tell her not to. She doesn't listen. She doesn't, Ymir agreed. Are you sick, Curry? You don't look well. I will be fine. Her voice was stern, and Ymir liked that she could be stern. Most of the time, she was so unsure of herself. Lily had been the same when Ymir first met her. Quiet, fragile, sensitive. But unlike Lily, Curry was a warrior. He'd seen her fight, and it had taken unimaginable bravery to go through a portal in pursuit of her enemies. She would have had no way of knowing where she'd end up. Again, Ymir had to wonder who this winged woman was, and why did she call him king? At the top of the sea stair, Curry launched herself out and flew through the morning fog. Though her wings weren't as white as they had been, they still gleamed in the gloom, as did her alabaster skin and fiery red hair. She was beautiful, so beautiful in flight. She moved with a grace he simply didn't have in the air when he used Moon's magic to walk the winds. He'd meant to ask her to join them, but she'd flown off before he could. Curry would still be around. She liked to keep an eye on her kopak. Ymir stopped in at the paradise tree to say hello to Ziziva and their little baby. He pushed open the door, but instead of hearing the nice little bells tinkle, suddenly he had a face full of fairy dust. Ziziva put her finger to her lips. She spoke in Verum tongue, which meant she was extra serious. Shush now, Gertie is sleeping. We do not want to wake her up. When she's not sleeping, she's a living nightmare. Ymir knew that firsthand. Everyone thought that Gertie would be turning into her verum self any day now. She was late, certainly, and Ziziva was going crazy about what that might mean. Queen Didi tried to reassure her daughter that Gertie was special, and she was taking her time growing up because of that. Ymir knew that was the truth, right down to his very soul. He slipped inside the Zocolati shop. Ziziva buzzed around his head. What do you think you're doing? Nan Honeysweet's voice came from the back room, a whispered croak. Shop as much as you'd like, my friend, but don't wake the itty-bitty little baby. 
Ziziva had obviously taught the automaton something new to say. Ymir crept up to Ziziva's pedestal, which sat on the front counter. There was his little angel, asleep in a tiny crib near Ziziva's desk and chair. Gertie was wrapped up in a little bit of silk. She was adorable. She was dreaming. Her little face was pinched. The sight hurt Ymir's heart. He couldn't take away her pain, but he hated that she was having a nightmare. Of what, he couldn't say. What were the dreams of babies? Especially pocket-sized fairy babies, who had started out as nothing but a woggle spark. Ziziva buzzed up to Ymir and grabbed his ear. She found a little bit of her silliness. Big Ymir is going out to sea to sea, is going out to sea, while I sell our Amora Zocalati. And why do we have the Zocaboca? Because of Gertie's grandmommy do we have it do. Slag's Reef storerooms are our storerooms now. But what happens when we run out of the bean? What can it mean? With war at our window and trouble unseen. Ymir was grateful for Queen Didi using her contacts to make sure they had the Zoka beans. He retreated to the door and reached out to pet Ziziva's little body. He felt her soft dress and softer wings. He kept his voice to a whisper. If we can master this portal magic, we could find sources on any island and on any continent. King Shapta hasn't broken our supply lines just yet. And Professor Albatross has her family farm in Wilhelminaville growing the Zoka beans. We'll be fine when Slag's Reef fails us. Though if we keep paying silly hickey silk muddle, she'll make sure we have beans which Salt Love and Sandball will deliver to us without a problem. They had a good setup. Ziziva, though, was always looking for the strategic advantage, and she'd been particularly paranoid of late because of Gertie's fussy temper tantrums. Normally, sex would make the fairy girl feel better, but all lust had left her, and her desires wouldn't return until Gertie shifted into her verum self. Ymir scooped Ziziva up kissed her little head, and then let her buzz back to her pedestal, where she worried over Gertie. Ymir felt his heart soften in his chest. His belly felt full of love. Whether teacher or king, he knew his true calling was father. He wondered about his other wives having his children, but he wouldn't want that to happen yet, not until he could make sure the world was safe for them. That might take a bit of time, Ymir walked down the familiar alley of the sea stair market and through the front doors of the Amora Annex. Books lined the walls, and bookcases created nooks that contained comfortable reading chairs. A big table sat next to a window with chairs around it. Tori had wanted a little flow cabinet to keep drinks cool. They did some entertaining there in the Annex, but not much, since Gatha liked it as her own space. Above were the storerooms and kitchen where they made the very profitable Amorazoka. At the table sat most of his harem, Lily, Jenny Bell, Gatha, and Tori. They had cups of caif and several plates that only held crumbs. Ymir walked past the shelves and stood at the end of the table. He licked a finger, pressed it on the crumbs, and then sampled them. Tori makes her almond pastries, and I only get crumbs? Or did Ribby eat them all? Is that why she's not here? Tori tisked him. Bless my stone bits, Mr. Man. But do you really think I would let these greedy women eat every single one of my special nutty bears? Never. I'd rather milk a mine shaft. She pulled a napkin-covered pastry from a pocket. Ymir retrieved it. Yours is the only pocket I'll eat from, Toriah Willdeep. Jenny Bell let out a grumpy sigh. Well, now I don't know if I'm going to be jealous or disgusted, or both. I'll choose both. Lily giggled with a hand over her mouth. She was still troubled by her vision, one that she still felt she couldn't share. But more and more, she had her quiet joy. Gatha stood up and finished off her cave. We finally have time for this. Let's not waste another second. 
It seems the weird winged bitch delivered my message. As for Ribby, she will meet us at the Stormlight Island. She's not as patient as I am. There was a moment of quiet, and then Tori laughed. Jenny Bell smiled, and Lily tried not to giggle. Gatha pointed a finger at the dwab. Only you, Tori, can laugh at me. Lily finally giggled, which made Gatha smile. Jenny Bell stood. It's Saturday. I should be studying up on portals and wards. But let's play with the ancient evil artifacts instead. Anyone up for a little ring work? Ymir loved his wives like he loved Tori's baking. That almond pastry was also divine. Chapter 15 Ymir oared their boat across the gentle waves of the Saturday morning ocean. He wasn't surprised to see Ribby's pale form racing under the water. She turned on her belly to smile at him, though it was a monstrous sight. Both her eyes and lips were black. Her smile showed long fangs. Every inch of her skin was covered in scales, from her forehead down to the end of her long tail. Then she swam deeper and disappeared into the darkness. Jenny Bell leaned over the side. Hot damn, but I love watching Ribby swim. Tori, who was no fan of boats, clutched the side. Please, Jenny, don't tip us. Ribby might be a good swimmer, but I'm certainly not. Gatha was a bit uneasy as well, though she would never show it. Lily smiled at Ymir, and it was gentle, so kind, that Ymir felt himself fall in love with her all over again. He could see Lily as a mother, easily, but then each of his wives would be a good mother in their own way, even Gatha. He considered Jenny Bell. He could imagine the swamp woman complaining constantly about the rigors of motherhood, and he could see her fighting with her daughters, especially as they were maturing. At the same time, Jenny Bell loved deeply. Such love would help her like nothing else. She might have a tempestuous relationship with her daughter, and most likely it would be a daughter thanks to the withering, but at the end of the day, she would do right by her child. Ymir rowed them to the dock down from the lighthouse. Waves crashed on the other side. The place smelled like sea spray and kelp. Jenny Bell leapt out and tied them off as Ribby climbed up onto the boat using her tentacles. She settled naked on Ymir's lap and caressed his cheek with one of her coils. She kissed him, and he felt her fangs through her lips. Then she whispered into his ear, the princept certainly is taking her vow seriously. I've stopped by her office several times to discuss Aquaterab's strategy should King Shapta attack Old Ironbound. I have not asked for a kiss, but I have bent over to let her see me, to tempt her. Ymir eased the mermaid back. We'll have to wait until we graduate. Now you behave. Oh, I'll never fucking do that. The mermaid changed her face to human. He liked her rather big nose and those muddy green eyes as much as he liked her smirk. I've been having such dreams of late. Of me, you, the princept, and the new winged girl. Where is she? Movement caught Ymir's eye. He pointed to the top of the lighthouse. There was Curry, at the top, resting with her wings tucked behind her back. Both her hair and her armor were as red as blood. Ymir managed to free himself from some of Ribby's tentacles, enough for him to get out of the boat. He helped Tori onto the dock. The dwab couldn't stop complaining. I'll never like all this water, and I'm not built for flight, despite what my moons class teaches me. I don't even belong on top of the ground. Nope, I'm best under a mile of rock though that rarely happens anymore. Tori rarely complained about anything. She was a happy little woman, but when she didn't like something, she really didn't like it and wasn't afraid of voicing her displeasure. Ymir collected up his wives, who were chattering nonstop. They walked to the cliffs facing the west. 
It was a wide space of ocean-spattered rock. They would have plenty of room to practice with the rings, and they would have privacy. No one could know that they'd forged the artifacts. Jenny Bell undid her cloak and handed it to the mermaid. Ribby, put something on. I ain't never gonna understand how you can fight naked all the time. I'm never going to understand why you dirt worms insist on clothes even when it's not cold. Ribby slung the cloak over her shoulders. Oh, it's cold all right. But thanks, Rib Rib, Tori said. I don't have my inconvenience, but I must admit I was admiring you, and that can start it sometimes. Ribby smiled at the little woman. Gatha sighed. Enough talk. I want to see if Ymir can unlock the dragon this time. You say you come close, do you not? Ymir nodded. It's like the memory of a dream. I can almost recall what it was like to access the dragon's power and form, but taking it to the next step feels beyond me. Then again, the flesh steel ring isn't as easy to use as the others. It takes concentration and power, raw power. Ymir removed all seven rings from his pouch. The black ice, the veiled tear, the winter flame and yellow scorch rings, the gather breath, the crystal null, and the flesh steel. Ymir held up that last one. It was sometimes green and scaly, like the chameleon corpse they'd used to create it. Sometimes it looked like the beeswax, skull dust, and funeral ash of its components. Sometimes it was like a ring made from seeds. And sometimes it was wet and pulpy, like the fruit from which they'd pulled it. Of all the rings, save for the veiled tear, Ymir liked the feel of the flesh steel the least. He put it on regardless. Ribby walked up on human feet. Let me try the crystal null again. I promise I won't rob your Sharab of all their dujas. I'll be careful. That had happened the last time they'd practiced. Lily had fainted. Jenny Bell had vomited. It hadn't been pretty. The mermaid had the natural ability to link their dujas, a magical gift of the merfolk. Combining that with the crystal null reversed the power. Instead of drawing their magical cores together and using that, Ribby was able to drain multiple targets. Her Dominus Studier was perfecting that power. However, she wasn't going to be able to use the Akiric rings for her fourth year project. Ymir motioned for Lily to come close. Take the winter flame. I want to see what you can do with your ice spear and your water bow. The elf girl took the ring and slipped it on her right ring finger. Her normal focus ring was on her left. Her focus ring flashed, and ice armor covered her. A frozen spear extended from her hand. The magic didn't end there. Kalum Kalaram. She floated off the ground and spun the spear around. Gatha reached out a hand and cast a form cantrip. Lutum Lutarum. The yellow scorch was whisked out of Ymir's hand. Gatha caught it. Tori clapped her hands. Yes, Gatha, you did that form grab really well. The she-orc threw the dwab a grin. Thank you, I had a good teacher. Flaming armor erupted around Gatha. She created a long-bladed spear of fire and charged Lily, who blocked Gatha's strike. Ice sizzled off the flames. Lily and Gatha had both mastered their schools of magic, but the magical rings augmented their skills, giving them a sense of the hidden amwabs around them. Tori waddled up and put out a hand. The veil tear ring, please. Ymir frowned at her. Are you sure? It hasn't been that long since you wore it. I fear that the hellhound will be too close. Tori opened and closed her fingers. Come on, we don't need to be afraid of that dumb old dog. Actually, I think Fluffy has taken a liking to me. I'm going to win his heart yet. Or is it a she? Hard to tell, and I don't want to be checking. Lutum Lutarum. The dwab stole the ring, but didn't put it on. I wanted to try a little something. Hey, Ribby, how about you give me a little magic from everyone? Jenny Bell winced. Am I gonna be throwing up again?
I said I would be careful, Ribby protested. She wore the borrowed cloak thrown back from her shoulders to expose her little breasts and bare sex. So much for trying to clothe you. Jenny Bell turned away from the half-naked mermaid. Hey, Ymir, let me try the gather breath ring, just in case Ribby gets any ideas. And I want to feel the power exchange. If I do learn how to work portals, I'm thinking they'll use a buttload of magic. Ymir gave her the ring, and she put it on. He felt her reach for his douja immediately, and he allowed her to take some of his power. At the same time, he felt Ribby draw from him. Lily and Gatha had stopped sparring because they too felt the shifting energies. Tori held the ring to her ring finger. Okay, I'm just going to put it on a minute. Don't worry, I just want to see how close Fluffy is. An instant later, she pulled it off. She stood blinking. He's close, real close. But it wasn't that. It was, it was something else. Her cheeks were flushed. Gatha saw it. Are you having your inconvenience? The she-orc sounded hopeful. No, Tori said fiercely. I just saw some nose rubbing. It's fine. It just was shocking. And sudden... And I might need to drop that demonology class. Ymir wasn't sure why, because it was pretty clear that Professor Linny Lynn Albatross wasn't interested in sex, not with anything of this world. She'd had a true love once, the husband of a swamp coast queen, and they'd explored each other. But that love could never be. Even then, Linny Lynn had fantasized of the thing in her garden, her garden of the white roses, which would haunt her for the rest of her life. Tori had looked into Linny Lynn's past before to try to gather information on her and the White Rose Society. She hadn't gotten much. Ymir wanted to hear more of what Tori had seen, and they still needed to explore more of Lily's visions. Ymir needed to try something first. He reached out with his douja and found Ribby. He felt her douja spinning with power, because when she used the crystal null ring, she could draw the power of others inside her. When Ymir used the ring, he could drain the douja in others, but he couldn't bring that power into his own core. Ribby could. Ymir felt the power of her body, of her soul, and then tried to mimic her, to steal her flesh. He tried, and nothing happened. It sometimes took several tries, but once he mastered a form, it was easier. The first steps were difficult. He stripped off his shirt and dropped his pants. He kicked off his boots. Naked, he tried again. Yes, he felt the Aquaterab woman, her body, her heart, the amwabs of her skin. He concentrated, not letting anything break his focus. Closer he came closer and closer, until he felt his own amwabs. They changed to match the mermaids. He was over the most difficult part. He glanced down to see the scales on his thigh. From his heels emerged the bone spur. The gloomy light around him suddenly felt bright as his eyes changed. His mouth was full of fangs. His tongue felt the sharp edges of his new teeth. The water called to him. He waited for a wave to rise up the rocks, and then he dove into the water. It was like he'd been a merman his entire life. He shifted his legs into a long tail. The water wasn't cold, not a bit. It felt like home. He inhaled, and it was like breathing the freshest of air. He worked his tail and dove deeper, deeper, deeper into the cold, which felt good on his scales. His eyes now drew up every bit of light so he could see in the darkness. The pressure increased, but he adjusted his ears with a snort. A long, slender fish to his right tried to swim away, but he caught it easily and bit the head off. His fangs were perfect for shredding the fish flesh. He took another bite, working his mouth. 
and then he was swallowing the cold, wet flesh. It was strangely delicious. Ymir ate the whole thing, dropping deeper and deeper, until he rested on the muddy bottom. Around him were other schools of fish, squid, and the long bodies of sharks, true hunters. They didn't want to trifle with him, though, because they instinctively knew he was the real apex predator down in the deep. Ymir shifted his tail into tentacles and used them to explode from the bottom of the sea. He raced up through the cold current and broke from the surface. His lungs shifted from breathing water to air. He came splashing down in the surf, rode another wave up to the rocks, and then reached out with his tentacles to cling to the surface. He scurried to the top. Ribby laughed uproariously. Yes, you got it. You are a natural. Isn't the water better than the land? Don't you feel free? Ymir found it difficult to talk with his fangs, so he shifted his face. Yes, and I had a little snack in the blue dark. Ribby shook her head. No, that's not the true blue dark. Someday I'll take you to the undersea, and I'll show you our palaces. I'll gather up a dozen mermaids, and we'll fuck you until you beg us to stop. Please, Tori burst out. Could we not talk about sex for once? Lily nodded. The language is shocking. Ribby opened her mouth to tell both of those women what she really thought. Ymir could see it wasn't going to be very nice. The mermaid stopped herself. You're right. I'm sorry. I will try not to offend. Words are just words. Fuck talk or battle talk. It's all just words. Gatha extinguished her armor of flame. Her fire spear turned to smoke. I want to see Ymir as an orc. Try. He reached out, found Gatha's form, and then shifted from merfolk to gruel warrior. It felt easier. He rose in height, his body thickened, and if he'd been wearing any clothes, they would have been torn to ribbons. Ymir felt fighting tusks split his lips. He made a slurping sound, exactly like a certain gruel professor. Now I know why Gera makes so much noise when he talks. Between the tusks and my spit, I'm struggling to breathe. Gatha came up to him and grabbed his big green oot. Why haven't we played like this before, Ymir? I want you to fuck me as an orc. I'd like you to fuck me hard with your huge gruel cock. Tori covered her face. Lily let her ice armor fall to the ground as water, and she used the winter flame ring to dry herself in seconds. She approached Ymir, her eyes on his cock. It's about his same size, but green. So very green. The elf girl's eyes smoldered with lust. Ymir felt himself get hard in Gatha's grip. The Winkin landed on the tip of some rocks to the south. Her eyes were wide with wonder. She touched her throat and said a variety of words in Jatakshian. She then fluttered her wings. The air was full of the perfume of her feathers. It smelled so good, so very sexy. It was clear what she wanted. Ymir reached out and found her body. But not just that, he found her duja, which was so very strong and powerful. And yet... She had a sadness to her. He could nearly taste it. Then he focused on the amwabs that made her wings. He returned to his human form and then concentrated on growing the wings on his back. Golden feathers burst from his back. But something was missing. Something was wrong. He couldn't quite manage to keep them, and the feathers dropped to the rock. An unexpected exhaustion struck him, he fell to his knees. The wings were gone, and his douja was empty. He wasn't going to try becoming a dragon again. He was spent. Curry's eyes filled with tears. She took off when another wave crashed. Her white feathers seemed even more dingy and worn. She wasn't doing well, 
but she didn't want to talk about it. Lily approached him. What happened with her? She seemed upset. I don't know, Ymir said. But he thought there might be a connection between what was ailing Curry and why he couldn't grow his wings. He would continue to practice with the flesh steel ring, and he would unravel the mystery of the Sky Warrior. And one day, he'd find the secret to becoming a dragon again. Chapter 16 That Monday afternoon, Tori was nervous when they entered the Moon's classroom for their advanced demonology class. Gatha had made good on her promise to sit in on different classes and hear different lectures. The professors were very accommodating because of Gatha's work in the library. Gatha snapped out her tusks. You must tell me why you are fearful, Tori. Has it something to do with your vision from the Stormlight Island? Tori gulped in a breath. Now, the Veil Tear Ring isn't exactly fortune-telling, but yeah. I am a bit nervous because of what I saw. Promise me we'll leave once this class is over. Promise me. I promise, Ymir said. But he was uneasy as well. The dream last night had woken him up with a cock so hard it hurt. He'd spread Lily's legs, ate her oheezy until it was swollen and wet, and then he'd fucked her hard. She'd still be sore. Jenny Bell had helped him hold the girl down while he hammered her, playing with Lily's sensitive nipples and sucking on her neck. Jenny had then ridden Lily's face until the swamp woman came. And then Jenny Bell had her turn on Ymir's oot. Ymir thought the benefits of sleeping in the same bed with two women couldn't be stressed enough. And yet, his erotic dream had a dark edge to it. There had been ghostly women about, some with horns, some hooves, who clung to him as he changed his form from Aquaterab to Gruul to Jataksha, until finally he was a dragon man, with thick scales and a massive scaly prick. Then he'd fucked Curry from behind while he held her wings. Specters whispered and wailed when he finally came. He wasn't sure what it meant. Perhaps it was in anticipation of that day's class. Professor Linny Lynn Albatross had taught moons at the Veranasa University in Wilhelminaville before coming to Old Ironbound. Linny hadn't been Della's first choice for Studia Dukes of the Moons College, but the professor had shown she was very accomplished in her craft. Linny had a round face, a round nose, and full lips. Her skin was very dark, and her curls were even darker. She had inquisitive brown eyes. While she was odd, she was undoubtedly beautiful. There were fewer than ten scholars in the class, most people saw it as a waste of time, since demons weren't real. Or hadn't seemed real until recently. Then again, dragons were considered the stuff of stories, but Ymir and his pateur had killed one. Professor Linney stepped from the lectern and pulled up a seat. It seems silly for me to talk like I'm addressing a hundred scholars when there are only eight of you. That doesn't include Darius Bokujan, who signed up for this class but couldn't make it. Yes, because he was still in Josentown with Queen Aribel. Linny smiled at the orc. But I'm so very glad Gatha is joining us today. We're going to talk about demons and dreams. There is a long history of stories that say the demons that live on the other side of the veil visit us in dreams especially erotic dreams. From what I understand, many people are having such dreams. Could it be the lingering effects of the glow rain? Not that we should talk about what happened during the glow rain. It seems most of us lost our inhibitions completely. People shifted in their seats, or whispered, or chuckled. Was it the talk of that mad night when Ziziva gave birth to the Woggle Sparks? Or were they feeling uncomfortable about their dreams from their previous sleep? Either way, Professor Linney continued. One of the most common demons people believe in is the succubus, or the incubus, as the case may be. Succubi are female, 
incubi are male, and they are demons that feed on the sexual energy of their victims. My own experience with the occult has been limited, and again, in this class, we are talking about demons as ideas, not as actual entities. However, on that night, in my garden, I saw an entity. My mother grew white roses, and the air was full of their perfume. It was night, and I felt such a restlessness in the air. Erotic energy filled the air. I smelled the wet dirt. I smelled the sweet pollen, so sweet it was sickly. And the heat, it was unbearable. And dare I say, preternatural. She paused. She was sweating. Ymir thought it was ironic. She was firm about the class being about demons as metaphors. And yet, she was talking about her direct experience. And she wasn't hiding much. She continued, It saw me. It didn't speak to me, but it saw me. And I remember it had a face made of green fire. Then, as suddenly as it was there, it was gone. I dreamed of it, though. It came back to me as a beautiful woman, and I would dream of watching her have sex with men, women. It didn't matter. It was thrilling, no matter what she did. In one dream, I saw her having sex with shadowy figures who were made of darkness itself. Except, I remember seeing flashes of their white teeth and their very white claws. A Judician elf girl raised her hand. Are you talking about the shadows of teeth and talon? I've read about them as the natural enemies of dragons. The girl had her esses in place. She didn't seem to be very upset about the talk of sex, so the thing must be working. Who can say? Linny said with a shrug. It was just a dream. However, I never felt like my douja was being stolen away by these dreams, just like I doubt that any of you have felt weakened by your own nightmares. It does strike me, though, that our fear of the other has an erotic aspect to it. Fear, death, and sex are often commingled. What is more terrifying than a powerful creature that we can't understand? Especially a powerful creature that doesn't have our best interests at heart. Gatha's face was pinched in thought. Professor Linney saw it. Would you like to share your thoughts, Gatha? The she-orc nodded. Yes, I was thinking of a story in a Chalarzim anthology called Erotica Phantasma. It tells of a succubus. She was a real person who died, but her lust drove her mad, so she refused to die. She was given a body, horns, wings, and a thirst for the souls of men. Zim chronicles her many exploits, literally fucking men and women to death. It begs the question, are demons like ghosts? The elven scholar frowned at the she-orc's rough language. I think we'd like to think that, the professor said. At least then the demon might have started off as something mortal, with an intellect we can understand. How much more frightening would it be to deal with the true other? What if demons were never like us and never wanted to be? I'm glad you mentioned Chilarzim. Many discount her as a mere pornographer, but she lived in Almaquataka for several years. She wrote a few histories under other names, but she also wrote about the Zolith, which she called the Shadows of Teeth and Talon. You see, the Jataksha, the proper name of the Winkin, knew about the demons. They should, since those sky warriors battled the dragons. The Zolith had a queen, a vast spidery presence, completely alien to us. The Zolith Queen had a hunger we couldn't possibly begin to understand. We should hope such things stay far away. The professor paused. However, what if these things beyond our knowledge and experience aren't malevolent? What if they want to usher in an age of peace and prosperity? It does beg the question of the nature of gods. What we think of as evil might not be evil at all. 
If you look at the Vember Eagle Aquador, his rule was marked by cruelty, certainly, but he also unified the continent for the first time since the Age of Union. Ymir knew the argument. Eagle Aquador wasn't the despotic ruler many thought. He'd unified the continent, yes, but he'd also killed countless to do it. Once in power, he crushed any that would oppose him. From Ymir's studies, it was very apparent that the world had thrived because of the Undergem Guild and the work of the Fei, rather than anything that Egil Acrador had done. Thera was better in spite of the Vemper, not because of him. Ymir wasn't all that surprised that Linny Lin had such ideas. She was a rebellious thinker who didn't care much about what other people thought of her or her ideas. The professor grinned shyly. Perhaps we've gotten off track. Are there any questions? Tori raised her hand. What about animals? If people can become demons, given the right circumstances, could animals also turn evil? Well, gosh me underground, I think I can answer my own question. The Morbiscore have stories of the Underhargans, which were once regular Hargans, but ran into something bad down deep. If you want stories of demons, my people have a bunch. The dwarf kind, the animal kind, and rocks come to life. We also have stories about shadow spiders, which sounds like this Zolith queen. Some say that's what happened to Ordun Thunder Rock, the greatest dwarf to ever swing a pick. He dug too deep and found a shadow demon too tough to fight. It ate him. The end. Ymir knew where Tori's animal question came from. She was wondering if she could tame Fluffy. If it had been an animal before, Tori might be able to help it remember a bit of its old life. Ymir had seen the hellhound, and he doubted that thing had ever walked the world. Not with the stench of it. It was a mixture of dog, tentacles, eyes, and mouths. It was truly terrible. Ymir sat back in his desk. Others were taking notes, but so far, he'd known the demons and references they'd been discussing. Of course, Professor, this begs the question, is King Shapta a demon? They call him a demon conqueror. In Four Roads, I fought some of his soldiers, and they seemed demonic. But what of the leader? Professor Linney smiled. We'll be talking more of King Shapta, I assure you. And I'm so glad you are taking your history of Raxid course with Professors Preet and Fisher King. You'll learn that on Ethra, there are five named demons that have plagued the world for a thousand years. Ethra also believes in seven angelic forces that fight those demons, and that in the souls of every person alive is a battlefield for heaven and hell. Not eight demons? Ymir asked idly. The professor frowned. No, just the seven demons, but the eighth would be king of all. The eighth would be the awakened, or so some stories suggest. Awakened, Ymir murmured to himself, like the sleeper. Gatha spoke over him. Teacher, you're speaking of Wilmer Swordwright's play, The Storm. The seven devils pay homage to Regal Zorax, but there was the poem by Ertbor Bingmorn, Zorax upon Zibitaz. Zorax, the king of hell, bows before the gamesman Zibitaz, the true evil in the world. Not even Ephra's seven angels could stop him. No, the gamesman created the angels in the first place. Professor Linney's smile was radiant. Oh, yes, we can't talk about demons without mentioning sword right. It is interesting to note that some see Zebitaz as the gardener in Jataksha religion. Others think it is the seat master who planted the world, and so it must be evil because the seat master was evil. It was clear that the professor loved to talk about this subject. Her face was shining with both joy and sweat. She wiped some of that perspiration away. But we've gotten off topic. I wanted to talk about demons and dreams. 
Some believe erotic dreams come from events in the past, which reverberate through time. Others think erotic dreams come from a succubus, giving you the dream and eating up the lust. But perhaps succubi don't drain us of our dujas. Perhaps a succubus is merely in our heads for their own pleasure. A voyeur, if you will. The professor then spoke of examples throughout history and literature, where she argued that perhaps there was so little known about demons because demons didn't want to be known. They wanted to watch the world and take part in its pains and pleasures from a distance. Ymir finally found something to write down on his sand parchment, which he would later transpose into his grimoire. His memory was good enough that he rarely had to write anything down. Of course, he could hear his grandparents warning him that he might lose that with age. Grandfather Bear had often complained about not being able to remember anything. Ymir made notes to read Zorak's upon Zebitaz and to look into the less erotic writings of Chalar Zim. Gatha knew all the references, and Professor Linney was so pleased to have the she-orc in her class, at least for that session. A hard rain started to fall as class ended, and the classroom emptied. Professor Linney threw Ymir a long look. The storms have come, like in the sword right play, to drench our hero and to deliver him to his destiny. Getha had gone to the window to look out at the storm. Then she noticed something. The blood moon has come early. The reveler's moon is here. Ymir felt the icy fingers trace up his back. The wolf moon had come. The chaos would start. Things would never be the same. Tori wasn't moving. She sat at her desk, writing something and making sketches. It's gonna happen. I know it all has to happen in just this way. Ymir remembered his promise to leave immediately after the end of the class. But then Linny drew close. Her voice was barely above a whisper. It's important that the princept keep up appearances. I trust that she knows how important forging the rings is, and that she can't let anything distract her, or us, or you. For you are the most important person in this game. You know that, right? It would seem so, whether I like the idea or not. Ymir growled. I'll walk the path the Axeman has cut for me, and fuck the world if it thinks it can get in my way. Ymir could feel Linny's heat, could smell her perfume, but he knew she wouldn't be interested in him. He was neither her lost love nor the thing in the White Rose Garden. However, something had changed in the professor. He could smell a bit of her excited musk under her perfume. Linny smiled. I cast flow magic at that desk at the front of the classroom. I know what you did with Satif Kins. I watched you, just as I watched our princept with Halicia Heen at various places on campus. They all had such lust. It's a shame that both Kins and Heen are dead. I have to say, I can understand the succubus's desire to feed off our erotic dreams. I understand voyeuristic delights, and after the glow rain, I sometimes indulge myself. Gatha stormed over to Tori. We are leaving now, are we not? Linny reached out and touched Ymir's arm. She smiled and then left through the door. It closed behind her. They still had to let Linny look at the burned book. The beginning of the year was so busy, but more than that, the burned book didn't want to be read. They could all feel it. Ymir, Gatha, and Tori were left alone in the room. Gatha put a finger down on the sand parchment in front of Tori. And what are those calculations? A formula, Tori muttered. A recipe, maybe. Ymir knelt down so he and the dwab were eye to eye. He saw the heat in her green eyes. We need to go. I can't, Tori whispered. It's too late. I need you, Ymir. I need you here, now. 
It's like what I saw. We have to fuck. Oh, please, Ymir, please, you have to fuck me. The dwab's inconvenience had hit her hard. Ymir smiled. Then perhaps Gatha should cast form magic to lock the door. It won't help, Tori said, trying to unbutton her dress with trembling hands. It has to happen this way, she sighed. At least she's pretty. Who's pretty? Ymir asked. The dwab gulped down a breath. You'll see, you'll see. Chapter 17 Lutum Lutarum, Gatha locked the door of the moon's classroom. Tori was beside herself. I know we shouldn't do this, but I can't help it. I want you, Ymir. I want your cock. She got on her knees and attacked his pants, but her hands were trembling too much. She was nearly sobbing with frustration. Ymir had never seen the dwab so out of control. To have sex in the classroom was wrong, but he'd done it a lot, and so it wasn't that big of a deal. For Tori, though, it was shocking. Gatha turned and dropped her robes. She tore off her leather tunic. She was naked. She padded over like a tundra muskcat. Her thigh muscles flexed. Her green nipples were hard, and Ymir's eyes went to her bare sex. Her dark green lips were starting to swell. Tori managed to get Ymir's pants down, and his cock sprang out. Tori grabbed it, squeezed it, then put her nose to his ball sack and inhaled. You smell so good. Professor Linney liked the way her lovers smelled. It wasn't as good as that night in the garden, though. That thing stank like fucking... That demon with the green fire face was a girl. I know it was a girl. Then Tori was licking Ymir's balls while she jerked his staff. Gatha pulled Ymir's robes off him and removed his shirt. She came up behind him, grabbing his nipples and licking his neck. She nipped his ear. I like it when Tori gets her inconvenience like this. It reminds me of that first time with her, when she couldn't help herself, she becomes an animal that just wants to fuck. Tori couldn't respond to that because she was currently sucking on the head of his oot while she stroked him. She was so cum hungry and rough that Ymir nearly lost control. He eased her off him. If you need to fuck, I will fuck you. I do, the wide little woman wept. All that talk of succubuses, or whatever they're called, got to me. It got to me, but I knew. I saw this. Gatha grabbed a chair and drew it up. She spread her legs. Before Ymir fucks you, you should pleasure me. I will, Gatha, I will. The dwab scooted over and knelt down. She sucked and licked on Gatha's big, sensitive clit. Ymir liked being naked in the classroom. He went over and lifted Tori's dress. She was wearing tights, so he had to get them off her. He pulled them over her big, pale ass and down to her knees. He saw her pink pucker and the line of her wet pussy lips, framed with red hair. Tori shook her ass at him. Fuck me, Ymir, please. Fuck me quick before the pretty girl comes. There was another reference to whatever mysterious guest would join them. He glanced at the door. It was shut for the moment. The truth was, he didn't want to hurry. He liked the illicit nature of the encounter. He liked the mystery. I want you naked first, Tori. Ymir helped her get her boots off. Then it was easy to get her tights off. Then her dress. Their clothes were spread around the desks. It was pretty clear that if someone did come, they would get caught. It made Ymir even more horny. Tori pinched her nipples. She knelt between Gatha's legs. Okay, I'm naked now, Ymir. Please. She fell back to suck on Gatha's leaking sex. 
The she-orc's green skin gleamed from her own juices and Tori spit. Ymir brushed a thumb across Tori's pink rosebud, and she wiggled it at him. Fuck me there. Fuck me anywhere. Just fuck me. Ymir saw there was a bit of an issue with their height. He had to get low, but his oot soon found the entrance to her horny little oheezy. He had to brace himself on his hands and knees, but he was able to work his length in and out of her warm, wet body. He couldn't fuck her as hard as he wanted, though. And Tori knew it. We have to change it up. We have to, to get to the desk. You can put me on the desk. It's like what I saw. They abandoned the chair and moved over to the front of the room, leaving their clothes behind in a pile. Gatha pushed Ymir down onto the chair behind the desk. I know you need a fucking Tory, but I want to taste you on him first. The she-orc wouldn't be denied. She got down on her knees and sucked Ymir's cock into the back of her throat. Tori got a look of pure fury on her face. She grabbed Gatha's hair with her right hand, but with her left, she finger-fucked the green woman savagely. You are such a slut, Gatha, sucking my pussy juice off his cock. It makes your own quim so wet. The she-orc wasn't a stranger to being dominated. The harder Tori fingered her, the harder she sucked on Ymir. Ymir watched Tori's big, freckled tits shake with the exertion. Then, despite how good it felt to be sucked by the she-orc, he stood and put Tori on the desk. Tori's legs fell open, and he was given a view of her sex. Their fucking had greased her up. Girl cum dripped down her butterhole. She was the perfect height for fucking. He grabbed her chubby thighs and drew her to the edge of the desk. Then he watched as his shiny cock pushed into her. She clung to him so sweetly. Gatha came around to stand in front of the desk. She grabbed Tori's titties. I love this slut's big tits. I love how big they are. I love how soft they are. And her nipples are so hard. She wants a fucking. She needs a fucking. That's what I've been saying, Tori sobbed. Gatha sucked hard on one of Tori's nipples and pinched the other. That left one hand for Gatha to toy with her own clit. It would take a bit for the she-orc to come. Unless they were with Ribby, she could trigger Gatha's orgasm with a thought. Ymir hammered into Tori, and then he heard a gasp. He turned. There, standing by the door, was Professor Lenny Lynn Albatross, with her robes pulled up. She was touching herself, her eyes going from Ymir's sweaty, muscled body to Gatha, who was bent over with her hand between her legs. Ymir could imagine the view Professor Linney had of Gatha's intimate parts. Ymir took his cock out of the horny, mewling dwab and turned slightly to show the professor his length. Looks like we have a little voyeur succubus of our own. Come closer, Professor. Tori turned her head. Oh, gosh. Oh, I thought I could avoid this. I thought we could all come quickly and escape before we were caught. Her hand went down between her legs. Come closer, Professor. It's not fair that you get to see us if we can't see you. The teacher looked clearly torn. No, I can't. Normally, people don't see. I see them, but they don't see me. Gatha laughed a little. So you've done this before, have you? Have you watched horny scholars finger themselves? Gatha reached back. She didn't just pull open her ass cheek. She licked her finger and touched her butterhole. Yes, the professor hissed. I've seen you in the scrollery. I've watched you. Gatha rubbed her clit while she fucked her ass. The she-orc was showing the professor how horny she could be. If you're going to watch us, bitch, then strip or get the fuck out. 
Ymir wondered what she would do. He stroked himself, waiting for her to make up her mind. Tori was also masturbating, rubbing her clit and pulling on a nipple now that Gatha wasn't sucking on her tits. The she-orc was too busy putting on a show for the horny professor. Ymir didn't think he could trust Linny or her White Rose Society, but he'd fucked the enemy before and lived to tell the tale. From what Tori had seen of Linny's sex life, he didn't think they'd actually have sex, but he wanted to see her naked. Linny hurried forward. You three are naughty. I should report you. But I can't. I can't help it. The visions, the dreams, the Akirakura are rising and growing ever closer. I need the chaos of the moment. I need to watch. The professor came forward and grabbed the same chair that Gatha had sat on. Linny undid her robes and let them drop. She was wearing a tight camisole and panty. Ymir stuck his cock back into Tori. She was rubbing her clit, head turned to the side, watching the professor. Linny was beautiful, with her round face and black curls. Gatha had her head turned to the side, watching as well. The professor gulped in a breath. There is a fine line between the voyeur and exhibitionist. I want to get closer. I want to see you. But you have to forget I'm here. You have to fuck like I'm not here. Show us your tits and I'll think about it, Ymir said, and slammed into Tori a few times. The freckled little woman yelped in ecstasy. The professor was torn, but she soon stripped off the camisole. She dropped it to the floor. She stood with breasts exposed. They were dark and firm. Wide, puffy nipples capped the cones. Horny fucking titties, Gatha snarled. Oh, fuck, I could come. Linny pushed her panty down and then sat, spreading her legs. She had a wildly hairy pussy, her lips almost lost and all the hair that went from her belly down to her butthole. And yet, when she spread herself, her pink hole was clearly visible. It made Ymir want to fuck it. Tori arched her back. Oh, gosh, I'm coming. I'm looking at the professor's hairy pussy and coming. Ymir pushed himself completely inside the dwab. Then he felt her cunt squeeze him as her pleasure took her. He felt her get even more wet, dribbling onto the desk and marking his thighs. The room smelled like the dwab's overheating sex. Linny didn't play with her titties, but her nipples hardened anyway. The puffiness stiffened into nubs. She reached under her ass and pushed two fingers into her pink hole. With the other hand, she rubbed her clit in circles, around and around. It was clear she'd come any second. Gatha scrambled up onto the desk. This is what we do all the time, Linny Lynn. We fuck all the time. The she-orc then sank her pussy down on Tori's face, who immediately began to tongue Gatha's horny girl hole. With how short Tori was, Gatha could easily reach Ymir. She grabbed the back of his head and kissed him. She sucked on his tongue, grunting. She fucked the dwab's face, even as Ymir fucked her cunt. Then Gatha gave Ymir her tits to suck. Ymir sucked on the nipple, hard, before biting it. Gatha hissed. Oh, the professor is fucking herself. She's fingering her horny pussy and watching us. But she's watched me before. I think she's watched all these horny student sluts fingering themselves all over this fucking school. Fuck, fuck, fuck. Gatha then let out a howl as the orgasm hit. While it took a long time for Gatha to come, when she did orgasm, it was violent and lasted a long time. Her initial shriek of ecstasy turned into gasps and whimpers. Ymir eased back to watch her face. 
It was glowing from the intensity of the experience. It was Tori sucking on her clit, but it was also the professor watching them be so nasty. Gatha turned, her eyes half opened, and looked at the masturbating professor in her chair. I'm still coming, Lenny. My cunt is still coming. Linny was spread naked in the chair. Her nipples had pulled into hard knots. She had four fingers stretching out her pink hole, and her clit was so big now. The professor gasped, and her mouth fell open. She didn't breathe for several seconds, and then she started sucking in air. It was clear she was coming. Watching this beautiful woman come made Ymir nearly come. He wanted to give their voyeur a treat. He took himself out of Tory. His cock was rigid. And then he was coming, covering the strawberry fur of Tory's soaked quim. From the sound of it, Linny came again, watching his oot spew his seed all over Tory's belly and sex. Gatha then growled, bent, and lapped up his cum before sucking on Tori's clitty. The dwab let out a shriek. Oh, Gatha, you're so dirty. You're so nasty. Coming again. I'm coming again. Gatha wasn't satisfied with cleaning Tori's oheezy, but she took Ymir's cock in her mouth, getting him hard again, much to the delight of the professor. She sniffed her fingers, sucked her juices off them, and then went back to fucking herself and rubbing her ohi. Ymir threw her a smile. I hope you locked the door, Professor. The second time always takes a bit longer. Chapter 18 The honored princept, Della Pinez, glanced out from under the dragon arch and saw the reveler's moon in the sky. It had come early, only a few nights early, but still it was an ominous sign. An early reveler's moon was not something to be taken lightly. Scholars would be trying to decipher the meaning for years to come. There hadn't been an early moon in anyone's lifetime, not even the very oldest Olira, like Edrin Hyendel. Della found it oddly comforting. It told her that their year would not be like other years. What should she expect from Ymir's and his harem's last year? Of course the wolf moon would be there, running across the sky. She turned and walked across the school seal, making her way to the locked gates of the scrollery. She opened them with a form cantrip and then walked down the spiral staircase from the main floor of the librarium citadel and into the scrollery. Brodor Bootblack had crafted special shelves, which Gatha was using to organize the Hyendel collection. The normally open space of the scrollery was more cramped now, with the additional floor-to-ceiling shelving. It was warmer, with the sunfire lanterns burning, and Gatha had added some incense, which she burned to keep the musty smell of the crypts below at bay. The passageways under the scrollery extended through a series of catacombs, and then met up with natural caves. They'd never been fully explored. Some thought they couldn't be. There were just too many. Other princeps claimed that the passageways changed as you explored, and several expeditions had been lost. Supposedly, if you went deep enough, you'd find the entrance to the stair, which would lead you to any number of worlds. Della was torn about the mysterious nature of those tombs beneath her feet, on the one hand, it was her duty to protect her school. To have unexplored passageways unnerved her. On the other hand, the mystery fired her imagination. Shouldn't a magic academy have such wonders? Della had worked with Gatha every step of the way, going through the many books they'd brought from Four Roads. There was one book on the swamp magic of Cujan Town that grabbed her attention, she put that aside for Jenny Bell and her Dominus Studier. Other treasures were dry, dusty tomes from the Age of Union, which, by their sheer age, were impressive. Books from 6,000 years ago, by the very fact that they'd survived, 
were priceless. The form magic was a perfect example of the conservation spells that Gatha was mastering. Dilla knew ancient Theranus, and so she could puzzle out the first few paragraphs. The books were a very dry history of year one, the same year as the signing of the Theranuvial Agreement, which brought the old kingdoms together and founded the Theranus Publicus. There was peace and prosperity for nearly 3,000 years, until the rise of Aino Azraelis, who was later renamed Acrador when he made it clear he wanted an empire. Della thought it would be a gesture of goodwill to send the books back to Ojan Tej, so she could put them in the Lyrum archive. Other books would be staying. Della was shocked that Edrin had a copy of the Yimaganya, written by the mad elf Celestia. Della had placed it next to another copy in the Illuminate Spire, next to other books on ringology. It seemed that Edrin had been interested in the Akiric rings as far as they were related to the Fellowship of the Enraged and the Knight of Fire. Ymir had hoped to find other books on the Sleeper's Ring. So far, those hopes had been in vain. Della worked alone in the scrollery, enjoying the solitude. She thought about finding one of Edrin's erotic writings and going to Gatha's chair in the back of the room. That was where the she-orc liked to read her porn and play with herself. Everyone knew about it. No one talked about it. The princept wondered if Serena Sia might come and watch her. For now, however, she didn't smell the spectral woman's musky perfume. The princept had just shelved the book on Cougentown swamp magic when Jenny Beljosen walked down the steps. She was wearing a very expensive red and black dress with a wide-brimmed hat to match. She wore boots that laced up to her knee. She might have lost her mother early, but that girl could dress herself. Jenny's hair was freshly washed and held back with a silver circlet. She had added a bit of makeup to emphasize her very blue eyes. Jenny Beljosen was heartbreakingly beautiful. And so far, she was one of the only women in Ymir's harem that Della hadn't been intimate with. Della hadn't remembered getting sexual with Ziziva, but after all the sex she'd had with the Fei, she could only assume that she and Miss Honeygood had done something. Those forget-me sparkles were very dangerous. Jenny had a bottle of wine and two glasses. Don't tell Gatha I have wine near the book, Stella. She'd have my head. The princep thought of correcting Jenny on her title, but she surprised herself by wanting to be called by her first name. Jenny kept talking. Or she'd shave it. Gatha has threatened to cut off all of my hair more than once. That would be a shame, Miss Josen, because you have such gorgeous hair. Della kicked herself. That came across as flirting. Jenny didn't seem to take it as such. She twisted a strand of her hair around her finger. Thank you. I feel lucky it's so thick. Jenny then smoothed her hair. I used to play with my hair all the time when I was nervous. I've been less nervous lately. I suppose I should pick up the habit again. I mean, with everything that's happening, I might need some soothing. Jenny laughed a little. Though I have to admit, I get more than my fair share of soothing with Ymir and the girls around. Jenny set a glass on the table and poured wine into it. But you don't want to hear about that. There was a long pause. Then Jenny raised her very blue eyes. Or maybe you do. Those blue eyes with that black hair put the weight of lust on Della's chest. How should she answer? As Della the woman, she wanted to call the girl's bluff. As Della the princept, she had to keep things professional. Della chose not to respond to that thread of conversation. Instead, she tried to remind Jenny of the nature of their relationship, though she didn't request that the swamp woman call her by her official title. What are you doing down here, Miss Josen? I know I wanted to meet, but I thought we'd talk in my office. Jenny shrugged. I like the scrollery. It's where I like to hold all of my clandestine meetings. You said there were two things you wanted to talk about. I reckon my hair was one. You want to talk about my makeup next? Jenny smiled as if she had a secret. What could that secret be? Della took the wine, sipped it, and found it was sweet and spiced. Very nice. 
a very Jenny Bell Josen drink. The princept sat and motioned for Jenny Bell to sit next to her. So you know the secret spells to unlock that upper gate? Oh, yeah. I figured it out from Gatha. Though, don't tell her. Again, don't want to wake up bald. Jenny sat down far too close to her princept for either of them to be comfortable. What was this girl thinking? I trust you, Jenny Bell, and your secret is safe with me, Della said. But as the princept, I can't have scholars getting unauthorized access to every part of the school. The scrollery is for librarians, faculty, and special guests. Jenny smiled as she raised her wine glass. And aren't I a special guest? I mean, after all that we've been through. Della felt weak and uncertain. Jenny Bell was right. She was a special guest, and the girl knew it. The princep decided to give in to the moment and embrace this unique experience. Never had any princep at Old Ironbound been so blessed with such gifted scholars, scholars who had already left a mark on the world. You are something else, Jenny Bell Josen. You are beautiful, smart, and talented, and I trust you. The praise seemed to catch Jenny off guard. Well, thank you, Della. Can I call you that? I know at one point you wanted us to be more formal with you. Seriously, I think you mentioned a book. Della opened the book and showed her the title page. Impossible Doorways by Lucia Bell Coogin. Jenny frowned. Oh, great. Now I have to read a book by my fucking ancestral enemy. Sorry for cussing. Not that sorry, though. Foul language is the least of our worries. I read some of this. It outlines possible flow devocho magic for opening portals, but it also has sections on wards. Your family is mentioned. At one point, it seems the Kujans opened doorways inside the Josen Town Palace, until the Josens found a way to protect themselves. Jenny nodded. The basement feuds. I've heard of them, but I didn't ever think they were real. Coogens would appear in our basements and wine cellars and come up to murder us. But yeah, I'll read it. I've been working with Issa Leal on the Devocho magic. But to be honest, she's not so excited about it. It scares her. The princep knew that was the case. Issa Leal, while being a very good professor and the Studia Dukes of the Flow College, did have her limitations. Professor Leal was fearful by nature. She'd reported having her own erotic dreams to Della. The old elf woman was unnerved. Della had only eaten a small dinner, and so the wine had gone to her head. Professor Leal is worrying about other things than portal magic, though portal magic was forbidden at one point in our history. The professor has a rather rigid mind. Why was it forbidden? Jenny Bell asked. For the safety of people, for stability, so the Fei could continue to charge for roads, and the Aqua Terab could get revenue from tariffs on ships. There have been many reasons, but there were vampers who insisted that portals might bring demons to Raxid. Jenny nodded. The shadows of teeth and talon. I heard all about Professor Albatross's lecture from Ymir, Tori, and Gatha. There was that secret smile again. This time, Jenny Bell had a flush to her cheeks. Was this girl getting aroused? Is there something you want to tell me? Della asked. The swamp woman winced. No, not yet. But you can read me well, Della. I gotta give you that. Ymir should be the one to tell you. Let's get back to the book. I'll read it. I'll try portal magic. But from what Professor Leal said, I don't have the douja for it. I can get Ribby to help, or we have the gather breath ring. Della was curious about this secret Ymir had, but it was clear Jenny Bell didn't want to break any confidences. Della couldn't stop staring at the beautiful woman, and her scent was sweet yet subtle. Of course Jenny Bell would have very expensive perfume. The princept felt a familiar tingle between her legs. You know about Ribby and me, don't you, Jenny? I do. Jenny Bell turned slightly. It was enough that Della got a view of her cleavage. 
She needed quite a bit of lace to keep such plump tits restrained. Della was feeling reckless. It wasn't just the wine. It was also the dreams. The prior night, she'd dreamed of watching a Josentown queen being fucked by her five husbands. Three ravished the slutty woman. Two stroked themselves while waiting their turn. In the dream, Della had been a serving girl, older, wiser, but just as horny as the rich young girls she served. Those beauties found Della watching the orgy below, and each girl took a turn making Della do all sorts of things to them. They returned the favor while Della watched the queen being ravished below. The dreams had such texture to them, such power, that they felt more like a memory than a dream. Della put a hand on Jenny's arm. Her skin was soft, so very soft. Someone saw Ribby and me together. I know you have many talents, Jenny Bell. I know you collect secrets, and that you can play games of strategy and cunning better than anyone. I need to know who saw me, because they didn't just see me and Ribby together. This voyeur mentioned Ymir and threatened to expose me. The voyeur? Jenny Bell smiled and put her hand over Della's. It seems that's the word of the day. I'll do what I can. There's a lot of rumors about you and Ymir at this point. You two are close. People are gonna talk. What have they been saying? Della kept her voice even, but it felt like her heart was going to crawl out of her chest. Oh, the usual, Jenny caressed Della's hand. That you and Ymir are fucking. That you are fucking all of us. Most folks think it's as much shit as it is mud. That's an old Swamp Coast saying. I mean, the truth is, you're not. So gossip is harder to keep going when it's obviously not true. Della felt relief, but she also knew that several professors, including Issa Leal and Denalia Fisher King, had been looking askance at her. Jenny lifted Della's hand off her arm and then kissed it. The swamp woman put it next to her cheek. You know, the other girls got at least a kiss. I'm not saying we're gonna have sex, me and you. Not till I graduate. But I'd like to at least get a little taste of things to come. This was the moment they had been building to, ever since Jenny Bell walked in looking so beautiful, carrying wine, breaking rules. She shouldn't have access to the scrollery, but the Princept wasn't going to make an issue of it. No, because Jenny was so special, like all of Ymir's wives. Della eased her hand out of Jenny's fingers, and she touched the girl's hair. It was soft and lush. The Princept leaned forward. Before Ymir and his harem, you had your lovers, didn't you? In the palace at Josentown, your mother's mansion. You had your girlfriends, didn't you? I did, Jenny Bell whispered. I liked kissing girls right away. It took me a while to kiss boys, though I didn't do too much of that. I like kissing Ymir best of all. But you know what it is to kiss him. We both do. Now I'd like to know what it's like to kiss you. There it was again, an open invitation. Della thought of backing off, of laughing it off, but she knew she wasn't going to. She wanted to kiss this woman, feel her tits, and see how much hair she had between her legs. The princess slipped her hand around to the back of Jenny Bell's neck. She felt a necklace, some hair, the soft velvet of her collar. But she also felt skin, hot skin. Della leaned forward and pressed her lips against the young woman's mouth. Jenny Bell made a little whimpering noise. It was adorable. It was sexy. Jenny opened her mouth more, and Della saw it as an invitation. She eased her tongue into the swamp woman's mouth, and Jenny responded with her own tongue. Soon they were drinking in each other's mouths, and the world became Jenny's perfume and her hot, wet mouth. Della drew her hand down Jenny Bell's chest 
feeling the velvet of her dress, until the back of her fingers reached the swell of that big tit, so young and firm. Della's own nipples were hard and tingling. Those tingles reached down between her legs, and Della knew that she'd soak her panty through. She wanted the tongue in her mouth to be in her pussy instead. Jenny Bell would know just how to please her. She could tease Della into an orgasm that would finally satisfy her, at least for a while. Della knew she had to stop. Jenny said she just wanted a kiss. But the princept wasn't going to leave without cupping one of those big titties. She got her hand under the dress until Jenny Bell's nipple hardened in her palm. Such big tits. Such big nipples. This girl's body was a palace of pleasure. Della withdrew her hand, gave the girl's mouth one last lick, and then sat back. She suddenly felt shy, which was ludicrous. She was past middle-aged for a half-elf. She'd had hundreds of lovers, and it was only just a kiss and a feel. Della reached for the wine. Jenny Bell caught her hand. Della, thank you. I have to say, I was feeling left out. The princept gazed into her eyes. You've been having the dreams, haven't you? We all have, Jenny admitted. Last night, I dreamed you were a serving girl in our palace. Me and Nellie Bell and some others had fun with you. I wanted to know if you tasted as sweet as you did in the dream. Della had to kiss the girl once more, quickly, and then she stood up because she didn't trust herself to stay. I had that same dream, Jenny Bell, and I don't think it's a coincidence. I think it's time we all tried to see what might be happening. Another bit of research for us. Jenny Bell laughed. I won't research it too hard. I love the dreams, and so does Ymir, I think. It gives us all such sexy ideas. I feel like Gatha and her porn, though she wouldn't call it that. She'd call it her erotica, Della laughed. It felt so good to be with these scholars. It felt so freeing. She now saw how lonely and frustrated she'd been for all these decades. Her masturbation had worked for a time, but now she needed lovers, a great many of them. Then let's focus on who our spy is, Della said. Once we know who that person is, perhaps we can all come to an arrangement. I mean, if people are already talking, let's give them something to talk about. Jenny Bell giggled and drained her wine. Della laughed along. However, in her heart of hearts, Della knew they were facing some serious issues. Those damn dreams couldn't be just dreams. Chapter 19 The curry Chamba sat in her wasi, watching the rain pour down in front of her cozy nest. Wasi meant family, but it also meant house. Both brought love, for others, but not for poor curry. The nice little woman, the dwab, had given her such a nice stove. It was easy to cook on, and the metal kept her home warm. The grasses she'd used to weave her home were alien, but they smelled nice. The burning wood also smelled nice. She'd taken it from trees with needles instead of leaves. True trees, not the scrub bushes that peppered the mountains near where curry grew up. She couldn't get the image of the kopak trying to grow wings out of her mind. She would never forget that morning, not even if she lived a thousand years. Those women were so powerful and so beautiful, and though she shouldn't be attracted to them, she was. Her dark perversion, her broken soul. Curry was tired. She was running a fever, and she knew the truth. If she didn't find someone to help her with her hookay, her wings would wither completely, and she would die. She was down to her last three Nuna seeds, She'd spaced them out as best as she could, but the energy wasn't there. Everyone at the school had been so nice, and the pretty princept, the ruler of the school, 
had offered Curry a place there. Curry couldn't accept the gift. Going to school, learning how to read and write. No, it would be too much to ask of the world. The gardener had planted her garden in a certain way, and Curry wasn't brave enough to ask for any more fruit. Besides, Curry's last night alive had to be coming soon. She'd thought it would happen before the demon moon appeared in the sky, but she should have known the truth. The demon moon always brought chaos to the world. It had been during the demon moon when her parents had been killed, oh, so long ago, when their little wassie had been invaded by the darkness, the darkness that smelled like roses. Curry checked on her fish and found it had dried to perfection. However, she was in the mood for a treat. There, too, the Jataksha was happy. The tiny fairy girl had brought her zocolati, a true delicacy that only the royalty ate. Of course, there was zocolati in Urin land. That's where the zoka beans came from. Zoka was a Jataksian word. Curry unwrapped the little package of zocolati, such a merry yellow color. Though it was packaged like a gift to a queen, a koya, Curry didn't feel like royalty. In some other garden, in some other sky, she might have been a princess. But in this life, she was little more than a serving girl. Even when old Paya took her in and trained her, Curry had never been promoted. She'd been overlooked time and again. She knew it was because she had no status among the sky warriors, no grand family lineage, nothing. All she'd had was old Paya, and now old Paya was gone. All the Zocolati in the world couldn't bring her back, just as all the oceans in the world, above and below, couldn't wash Curry clean of her disobedience, her rebellion, her flight. She'd broken ranks. Other sky warriors had died because of her, and her general would never, ever forgive her. Not even if Curry could explain the very special fruit the gardener had grown for her. Curry bit into the candy, and she hardly tasted it. She was so weak. She was so sad. She wept as she chewed. An unexpected scent filled her nest, a musky perfume. Then a voice whispered from the shadows, Come now, Le Curry Cochachamba. Watching a girl weep while eating zocolati just might break my heart. Curry whirled. There, in the shadows of her nest, sat a woman in a black gown. Her dress seemed to be made of the darkness itself. Her pale skin flashed every now and again when she moved, and her midnight gown parted to show a valley of generous cleavage. And wouldn't that be a trick? Because my heart rotted away, oh, so very long ago. Curry drew her swords and backed out of her nest. The rain swept onto her, but she hardly felt the cold. The darkness had come for her, like it had come for her parents. Then Curry saw a break in the clouds, and the red moon was there. The demon moon had come to join the dragon moon and the angel moon up in the oceans above. For there were oceans above, as there were oceans below, and it was only the world that drifted dry between all the water. And that was where the gardener planted all of creation. The shadow woman reached out a pale hand. Come out of the rain, girl. Your health is already so uncertain. I doubt you'd survive a cold. But you'll kill me, Curry said. But then she realized she was hearing the woman's voice in her mind, in her own language. How could that be? This shadow woman wasn't a sky warrior. But then, she wasn't a woman at all. She was a demon. She had to be, though she didn't smell like midnight roses and damp dirt. I won't kill you, child. How can I? I'm not alive, and I cannot touch your world. I can just watch and yearn. My desires would kill me if I weren't already dead. Curry shivered, not from the cold rain, but from the fingers of ice running up and down her spine. 
you're a ghost. The shadow woman laughed. I dislike the word, but it's true enough. Spectre, apparition, even ghoul would be better. But yes, I'm a simple ghost, and I've been watching you, wondering when you will get the courage to ask for Ymir's help. The very idea shocked the winged girl. The Kopak? I could never. He's the Kopak. He is the reason I'm here. He wouldn't want me. None of his girls would want me. And I shouldn't want them. The ghost put a pale hand on her shadowy hip. We can talk, you and I, but come inside. And you need to dry yourself. Her smile gleamed brightly. And I will watch. You are beautiful, muscled, young. She retreated back into her corner. Curry crept inside her nest and started to remove her armor. I'm not that beautiful. Others are far more attractive. So says the beautiful woman. I know beauty, child. I gathered beauty to me when I was alive here. I'm Serena Sia, and I was the princept of this school a long time ago. Seven hundred years ago. Curry took a towel and wiped her arms. She wore her battle kilt still, but she had taken off her gauntlets and greaves. She unsnapped her breastplate as well, but she wore a thick, soft cotton blouse under it. It was wet, too. She would have to strip. The towel was soft. Another gift from the dwab, Tori. Curry was surprised that little woman was so kind. It was well known that dwarves despised the Jataksha the most out of all the world's races. Dwarves hated the sky, and so they hated the warriors who flew there. Why come here, spirit? Curry asked. The shadow woman raised a hand. No, not spirit. Ghost is better, but not ideal. Call me Serena. I came here to help you. You want to be friendless. You want to bemoan your fate, and I find that very sad. As sad as a weeping girl eating zoccolotti. Curry suddenly felt annoyed. I have a right to bemoan my terrible fate, and if I want to eat zoccolotti and cry, that's my choice. You are not wanted here. Serena took her anger in stride. Everyone's fate is terrible. All will die. Today, you can celebrate your flesh, but you choose not to. That isn't sad. It's as fucking tragic as it is stupid. Curry squeezed her eyes shut. Just leave me be. Not until I see you naked. Undo your kilt, girl, and take off your blouse. Dry yourself. Do an old woman a favor if you won't do yourself one. I keep wondering what old Paya would say. Everything that the ghost said shocked Curry. How do you know of old Paya? And how can you speak my language? The dead know every language, for all will learn the language of death eventually. And what is time to the dead? It is all the eternal moment, the past and the future, mere constructs for the living so they aren't driven mad. As for your life, Curry, I took an interest in you, because in the coming months, you will be vital. You know that. It's why you betrayed your people, broke ranks, and flew through the portal. Because that was your fate. You are wise to accept it. Less weeping would be nice, however. You are a cruel thing, Curry dropped her kilt, removed her panty, and threw off her battle blouse. She stood there, now naked, before the lustful eyes of the spectral woman. There, you see me naked. Are you happy? No, my friend, my lovely girl. You are withered. Your muscles fail you, and your feathers are gray. You need help with your quickening. If you can't approach Ymir... You should go to Gatha, or Lily, or the current Princept could use you. 
Oh, yes, she could use you. And you aren't a student at her school, so her fucking morality wouldn't get in the way of her lust. And my delight. Curry squeezed her eyes shut. Never. Impossible. I don't find any of these wingless people in the least bit attractive. The Jataksha only play with other Jataksha. It is the wings we find sexy. Those words came out so easily. She'd played this game her entire life. Except with old Paya. Old Paya knew the truth. But so did the Shadow Woman. We both know that's not the truth. That is your dark perversion, or whatever you call it. You do find the wingless interesting. Didn't you find the muscled back of Gatha so attractive? What of Lily's pale skin there without wings? A long stretch of skin from the nape of her neck to the crack of her ass. You would lick their backs and orgasm in seconds. Every word made Curry tremble. You've come to torture me. I've come to help you, child. Go to Della. Tell her of your condition, and she will aid you. And if not her, then one of the women in Ymir's Elu. Or, if you want to be the sky warrior you were meant to be, you would go to Ymir, and you would grab him by the Ut, and demand he fuck you until he came deep inside your gushing twat. Curry had had enough of this terrible, filthy thing. She snatched up one of her short swords and slashed at the shadowy woman. The sword met air, nothing more. But Serena Sia was gone, vanished, and Curry stood there, gasping in breath. She knew that old Paya would be nodding her head if she were still alive. She would agree with Serena Sia's ghost. Curry had to find the courage. But how? She didn't know. It was easier to finish drying off and stoking the fire in her stove. Then she wrapped herself in the warm blankets and slept deeply. It was peaceful until the dream started. And then, Curry knew the truth. If she didn't do something soon, she'd be too weak to eat the fateful fruit the gardener had grown for her. She would fail to fulfill her duties, and all of her sacrifices would have been for nothing. Chapter 20 Later in the week, Ymir left the feasting hall and made his way to the flow tower for his potions class. Striding across the flow courtyard brought back so many memories of his time at Old Ironbound. It had been a battlefield in more ways than one. He'd fought merfolk, dragons, and thick-headed bullies on those cobblestones. And he'd crossed the courtyard on many occasions to descend the sea stair, to go to the paradise tree, or to the Amora Annex. During the first part of his imprudence year, he'd taken those stairs to the alleyway where he lived. That grate still had the broken lock, and the showers were still as dingy. Then there were their happy days in Jenny Bell's palatial apartment, when he and Lily had known the wonders of the swamp woman's bed. Living in the zoo was fun, but sometimes Ymir missed living on the flow side of campus. Ymir was still trying to decide what to do about Linny Lynn. He had to talk to Della about her professor. It was clear that Linny was working for a demonic secret society that wanted the last ring to be forged, despite what it might mean for the world. Her ideas of a demon king being an enlightened despot were questionable. And the princept probably needed to know about Linny's voyeuristic inclinations. The Studia Dukes of the Moons College was sneaking around, trying to catch scholars either masturbating or having sex. Linny had admitted using her flow magic to try to pierce the veil, to catch people, to watch them. Linny peeked into windows. She frequented the more hidden places on campus, and even she was surprised at how many times she'd been able to indulge her fetish. Ymir had always known that Linny Lin was touched. He just didn't really understand the depth of her twisted mind. Tori, at least, seemed relieved that the encounter was over. She didn't want her inconvenience again. 
Ymir walked into the float tower. There, standing on the staircase, was Nellie Bell Tucker. She had curly blonde hair, twinkling blue eyes, and a dimple on her left cheek when she smiled. And she always smiled. She'd smile even as she was cutting out his entrails and tying them into bows. She was smiling when she'd poisoned Ymir before his first exam way back when. And now she was more smiley than ever. Hey, Ymir, you got potions, don't you? I was going to take potions, but I'm doing my Dominus Studie on current events. History is so interesting, don't you think? Ymir stopped. History is interesting. He was in the mood for a little game of backstab and character assassination. More than that, he was curious as to why Nellie Bell was talking to him in the first place. He could be late to Phoebe Amalbib's class. He was married to an Aquaterab princess, after all, a girl who would probably become the ocean mother divine when her mother stepped aside. And current events are even more so. King Shapta tried to conquer the Swamp Coast queendoms. That's queendom, sweetie, as in the singular. Nellie laughed. Queen Aribel has everything now. Her and Daris have unified all the queens. And you helped with that, Ymir said. The blonde girl rolled her eyes. I helped a little, I guess. But Ari and Daris are smart. Jenny would disagree. Ari was cruel and stupid, a bad combination. Daris, however, was cruel and conniving, and had the mind of a tundra serpent, deadly, sharp, and poisonous. Nellie was his equal. Ymir had to laugh internally. Linny had said she'd caught Nellie and Daris fucking in the Librarium Citadel on more than one occasion. Ymir thought about mentioning that, but instead, he decided to attack her in other ways. Current events seem below your talents, Nellie. Don't you want to grow your magical powers? Or are you afraid you don't have the skill? Nellie's smile waned a bit, but she didn't let it falter completely. Not all of us can be like you, Ymir. I mean, you're powerful in all sorts of ways. I'm just a simple girl. My father was a fisherman, and my house smelled like fish. That's how I grew up, and I'm just glad I don't stink like I did. No, I got my plans, Ymir. Did I tell you that I've been visiting Crean? I've become best friends with King Velus and his wives. I love Queen Polly the most. All the people love Queen Polly. She's the youngest and the prettiest. Blonde, like me. Ymir wondered why Nellie was telling him this. Swamp Coast women used words as weapons. Information was currency. A bit of gossip was as deadly as a sunfire sword. Or was she simply bragging? He wasn't sure. But if Nellie could win her way into Crean royalty they might be considering unifying the Swamp Coast and the Sorrow Coast. That would create a nice bit of empire for the Josens. Or perhaps Nellie wanted a throne of her own, since she couldn't unseat Aribel. Do you like King Velus's mustache? Ymir asked easily. Nellie made a face. Never! It's awful! I know it's awful. Queen Polly is always asking him to shave it, but he refuses... She made a fist and pretended to be angry. You men, you are so awful. Very awful. Ymir decided to change topics. I hear it was the Sky Warriors who saved Josen Town from King Shapta. Many of them are women. Almost all, Nellie agreed. The withering affects them like us all. The word for harem in Jataksha is Elu. Did you know that? I did. Ymir had been studying up, trying to learn some Jataksha so he could talk with Curry. That winged girl was proving to be difficult. She was sickly, hurting, yet she wanted to be left alone. Being alone too much was a disease in and of itself. Grandmother Rabbit always said that people who ate alone would eventually go insane. Nellie wasn't done. But it wasn't Ari Bell's secret winking army. No. It was that powerful Kujan swamp magic. The Kujans did portals, and they know how to break them. 
They could set up wards to stop them from appearing. Bet you didn't know that. Ymir shrugged. I didn't. It's a shame that no one wrote a book about Kujin Devocho magic, or that the magic wasn't shared with the Josens. Then Jenny Bell might know more about it. You and I both know that Jenny Bell has made more than her fair share of mistakes. Nellie nodded. The self-satisfied smile was still on her face. Yet what she said was meant to be a barb. She wanted Ymir to defend his wife. Ymir didn't need to. Jenny Bell was ten times the woman that this Nellie would ever be. And he wasn't going to give Nellie any information about anything. Do you think King Shopta will try to attack the Swamp Coast again? Ymir asked. Nellie shook her head. Nope. I think he'll try for Four Roads, or Crean, or maybe even Greenhome. I can't imagine those elves being able to fight. They don't even like to fuck. Ymir reached out and touched the girl's arm. It's been nice chatting, Nellie Bell, but I have to get to class. She colored a bit at his touch, but he'd made it clear he'd rather chit-tub alone than ever be with such a snake of a woman. He moved her to the side and kept right on climbing the stairs. His conversation with Nellie had been very interesting. Very interesting indeed. He was a bit late to his potions class, but he slid in next to Tori. He kissed her cheek. The room had been specially designed to teach potions. They sat at tables that had a drainage sink at the center. Glass containers, from vials to beakers to big glass bowls, sat on their tables. Tori had brought her own custom seat to raise her up so she could reach. That seat could fold down to the size of something she could fit in her pocket. Ymir couldn't help but think that would have proved useful when they'd had sex in the moon's classroom. Taking Tori from behind had always been enjoyable, except for the issues of her size. They'd have to try that out the next time Tori had her inconvenience. It might be a while. After their time with Linny, Tori wanted to take a break from sex. That meant she'd have to stay away from the Amorazoka. She'd also made Ribby promise not to ignite the Dwab's lust. The class was a mixture of Judicians and Dominists. The Viscount, Roger Nilnap, was in the class along with his bully friend, Odd Corey. Roger wore flowery perfume, but from all accounts, he had far more class and intelligence than Corey, who was stupidly piggish. Ironically, Odd Corey was a duke, while Roger was a mere viscount. Both hailed from the nearby Farmington Collective, which was a state ruled by various royals. It bordered the Soro Coast Kingdom to the west, and the dwarven stoneholds of the Sunset Mountains to the east. Ymir didn't care for either man. However, there were other people in the class he liked. For example, Kaki and Gluck were there. The two she-orcs liked to tell dirty jokes, especially when their dwarven boyfriend, Buck Mindfinder, was around. Buck was the horniest dwarf at the school. He obviously enjoyed his inconvenience, and bought the Amorazoka frequently. And he enjoyed a wide array of women, from the fat, like khaki, to the very thin, like Gluck. Buck and the women had learned to calm themselves down a bit since their alchemy class their sophist year. Besides, Phoebe ran a tighter ship than Brodor did. The mermaid was a tall woman, chesty compared to other mermaids, and she wore more clothes. She had fine pink hair and pale green eyes, Shimmering pink scales covered her skin. She was older and had a quiet strength to her. Professor Amalbiab stood at the front of the classroom in her tentacle form. Her coils held six vials around herself, and she had a central mixing beaker. She had a potioner's table herself with the same vials and drainage. Now, class, potions augment your natural abilities, working with your magic core to give you certain benefits. Since most of you are flow scholars, we'll create a flow elixir that will increase your flow magic. Tori sighed. The one thing I don't need is more flow magic. I can get visions any time I want. I mean, unless Fluffy gets too close. That's my real issue here. But I've been working on improving that. Professor Amalbiab went on. So, I've taken the flow tower ice and created infinity ice. 
I have melted that into a mixture of vermoor powder, dioxide, seawater, aged sanctum vinegar, and siskeo wine. But as with most potions, it involves flow fashionara magic. Of course, you all remember the five categoria magica. Fashionara magic was enchanting magic, crafting magic items, or alchemical powders or potions. There was only one category of magic more powerful, and that was devocho magic, which Jenny was studying so she could master portal magic. Devocho also involved teleportation, conjuring, and truly devastating spells that could wipe out entire castles. Devocho spells rode the line between acceptable and forbidden magic. Kaki snorted. Of course we know the five magics. Like I could forget that shit. I can forget a lot of shit, Gluck coughed. But not that. Did I tell you about the crazy dream I had last night? I fucked centaurs from Ephra, like three of them. Where were their cocks, like front or back? Both. Buck chuckled. All the things I could do with two cocks. But, girls, we need to focus. The dwarf was in the middle of the two she-orcs at his potioneer's table. Phoebe fixed her gaze on the dwarf. Thank you, Mr. Minefinder. I know you listen well. So, what is at the heart of potion magic? Buck answered the question. Casting the fashionara magic, using your focus ring to channel your doja into the liquid and imbuing it with the enchantment you desire. Phoebe nodded. Kiss ass, Kaki hissed. Gluck kept her chuckling quiet. Oh, if he only just wanted to kiss it. The horny little fucker always wants to do so much more to my ass. Quiet now, Buck warned. Phoebe used her tentacles to pour the ingredients into the central beaker. At the same time, she whispered, Jelu Fashionara. Her focus ring glowed a bright blue, and that glow was echoed inside the beaker. Then, when the enchantment subsided, what was left was a pale blue liquid. She looked at the glass. Now, everyone bring your sampling vials up, and we can test it together. Ymir and Tori got in line, and the mermaid deftly used the beaker to pour liquid into their vials. They returned to their potioneer's table. The entire class drank down the flow elixir. Phoebe wasn't finished. Now, everyone try a simple cantrip. Create a simple ice sculpture in your drain. I think you'll be able to feel the difference. Tori sighed. Gosh, me underground, but my flow isn't good. But I'll try. She reached out a pudgy hand. Jalo Jalarum. She created a dog-like creature, though the proportions weren't right. The head was more pinched, like a snake, and the back left haunch was far bigger than everything else. A few tentacles drooped from the dog's belly. At least, Ymir thought they were tentacles. Then he saw what she'd tried to sculpt. Fluffy, I presume. Tori was overjoyed. You noticed? Crafting something ugly is easy when your model is ugly. I love my fluff, but I'm well aware she doesn't have what some would call classic good looks. Ymir was next. He reached out. Jelu Jalarum. Across the basin, he crafted a sculpture of Fionn Yamal, based on Edrin's description of the clansman who'd come south to slay Eagle Acredor. Fionn had a hammered steel helmet of a wolf, and he could cover his face with a snout. That was his main piece of armor, along with gauntlets, pauldrons, and greaves. He wanted to move quickly and dodge attacks while he struck at his enemies with his axe. He had a tundra wolf pelt as a cloak. The pelt was big and black, and it gave him a lupine look. His axe was simple, brutal iron. Ymir felt the potion work to increase his douja, and it was almost like he was using the winter flame ring. There was that same level of control. He could see how useful a potion would be to improve his magic, but he was interested in more advanced potions, as was Tori. She did clap him on the back. That, Mr. Man, is a work of art. Gosh, it's so good. 
Khaki, Gluck, and Buck all came over, which drew the attention of their mermaid professor. They surrounded him. That is very good, Ymir. Roger Nelnap agreed. Very nice. I've seen better, Odd Cory grumbled. Who is that? Professor Amalbia asked. Ymir had to be careful. Della suggested he keep his history of the Night of Fire quiet until he published his book. He didn't want any controversy until then, because once he did publish his book, he'd get a belly full. Scholars would come out of every summer bog to pick a fight. It's a barbarian, Ymir said simply. But Fionn Yamal was so much more than that. After class, Ymir lingered, as did Tori. Professor Amalbiab gave them a smile. I can't say how honored I am to have you both as my students. I hope you are learning something that may prove useful in your future adventures. Of course, I know you will have many. Ymir went to speak, but Tori was quicker. Gosh, yes, Professor. But Ymir and I wanted to get to the more advanced potions. You know Ymir, he's quite the reader. Could you recommend a book? Phoebe had a blush on her cheeks. She let her scholar's robes open a bit so Ymir could see more of her chest. Pink scales disappeared, leaving white skin. Yes, I was going to recommend a book by Fifan Rendlam, the famed dwarven alchemist. You've used a Rendlam funnel before, in your alchemy class. Ymir was very familiar with the dwarven scholar, but he didn't want to reveal too much. Rendlam had a very tarnished reputation, and they'd used some of his ideas in crafting the winter flame and yellow scorch rings. We know a little, Tori said vaguely. Phoebe's blush reddened further. The book I'm thinking of, it's called The Form Within the Flow, but it would be inside the Illuminate Spire. Let me talk to the Princept about checking it out to you. I would trust you both with the knowledge. It was an interesting title, and it reminded Ymir of what that idiot B. Coosley wrote in his Magius Artitium Auditicia. He'd gotten key information about the Akiric rings all wrong. However, Fifan Rendlam had been a mad genius. The pink-haired mermaid looked into Ymir's eyes. I've seen into the flow. I've seen what is to come. You and your Shareb live in critical currents. You swim in the waters of the world's fate. When the time comes, I think both of you will make potions that will change everything. For a moment, Ymir wondered why the mermaid was being kind to them. Then he intuitively knew Phoebe Amalbiab had been having erotic dreams about him and his Shareb. It was almost adorable how nervous, flirty, and serious she was. Tori shook her head and sighed. Gosh, me underground. At some point, I'd like our future fates to be a little less dramatic. Checking out books from the Illuminate Spire? It must be Thursday. That made both Ymir and Phoebe laugh. Ymir ended the day at his normal spot in the Librarium Citadel, back in the swing of the school year. He still had many months of school left, and yet part of him couldn't believe he would ever leave Old Ironbound. It had become his home, although he'd changed homes before. He could almost hear Grandmother Rabbit chiding him. Live in the day you are in, Ymir. Live where your feet are. Don't live where you aren't. Ymir was rereading Edrin's biography of Fionn Yumal when Della Pinez walked up the steps and sat down at his table. The princept looked pale. We need to talk. Chapter 21 Ymir closed the book he was reading. You're upset, Princept. How can I aid you? This wasn't the first time the pair had talked at Ymir's second floor table, but it wasn't a normal occurrence. Already there was a great deal of gossip about them. Della drew a hand down her face to calm herself. Has Lily told you more about what she saw with the veiled tear ring before Edrin was killed? Ymir shook his head. No. Why? We need to know more about the dreams people are having. All of us are on edge, even without the threat of more war. 
I was hoping Lily might have seen something. You said Edrin was having such dreams. He was. Ymir could smell the caro on Della's clothes. It mingled nicely with her perfume, yet she wanted to be free from the habit. She was a woman of contradictions. What could it be? Della asked. I'm not sure, but I noticed a bit of a change in Professor Amalbiab. She flirted with me a bit. Nothing serious, not like Linny Lynn. I think you know about her. Della pinched the bridge of her nose. Yes, Professor Albatross. We need to talk about her for any number of reasons. We can't trust this White Rose Society, but she might help us with the burned book. What else is there? Ymir told her. Della tilted her head and listened attentively. Then she let out a frustrated breath. Well, that conversation is going to be awkward. But I can't have her using flow magic or peeping in windows or sniffing around campus looking for scholars having sex. That has to stop. But things are complicated. Ymir could see her struggle. Complicated by a certain kiss with a certain woman from the swamp coast? Della's gray eyes pierced him. A kiss that shouldn't have happened. I won't lose my career over such a thing. Ymir could respect her struggle. His people had the three questions because sex could be so powerful and problematic. We can't trust the White Rose Society, but I agree. We have to show Linny the burned book. As for her voyeurism, a stern warning should suffice. Your behavior shouldn't play into the warning. You know what you need to do. Doubt crept into Della's eyes. I'm not so sure. My behavior is at the heart of this. I know the right thing to do is to wait. I'm not sure I can do the right thing in this case. Not with the world so on edge. And the dreams. The dreams every night tempting me. Her voice died. She wanted to say more. It was clear. So Ymir waited. Della's gaze dropped to the table. We still don't know who the spy is, but I think even Yonk Winslow would understand. The alumni consortium didn't question the events on the night of the glow rain. They understand that certain anomalies have occurred at Old Ironbound that do not have a historical precedent. Since you've been here. He could see her wrestling with herself. I will respect your decision, whatever decision that might be. You and I know we share a special connection, given our circumstances and the last three years. What we do in the bedroom probably doesn't mean much when compared to the wheel of time grinding minutes into history. Della smiled. And this from the savage barbarian. What if my self-control is what can improve that history? You sound O'Learan. It's something that Professor Leal would say. Ymir shook his head. You are a passionate woman. You are powerful. Together, we have put our shoulder to the wheel of history to push it in the direction we want. Della's smile turned mischievous. Together, we have faced secret societies, a war with the Aqua Terrib, a villainous orc with conquest on his mind, and an actual dragon. Yet, you are still a scholar at my school. There are rules. Unless you become the next Holy Theranus Vempress. Have you heard from Erwin? Yes, but he still wants the throne. It's only when he passes. And even then, I don't have much hope that Arlinda Appleford will let that happen. It truly would be unprecedented. At this stage, I am wishing him good health. She cast her eyes down and sighed. Ymir frowned. He didn't like seeing Della so torn. I ask you again, how can I help? She opened her mouth. She still seemed torn, wounded by her loneliness. Talking it through would help her, because sometimes words were the best medicine to cure our wounds. Curry came flying in. She landed next to his table before crumpling to the ground. Ymir was up in seconds, cradling her head. Her skin was gray, her wings limp, and she shed feathers as she gazed up at him. 
Her normally bright blue eyes were less brilliant, and her hair was less red. Everything about her seemed to be dwindling away. Her wings no longer had that sweet scent to them. Della knelt down next to them. We need to get her to the infirmary. I'll contact Nouville Namer. That was old ironbound, silver-haired elven doctor. Curry spoke Chetakshian, but Ymir couldn't catch a single word. Both he and Della spoke the flow spell at the same time. Curry gulped in a breath. I need you, but you won't believe me. But I had to try. You both are as kind as you are pretty. Della laughed a little. I've rarely been called kind. Ymir stroked the winged woman's red hair. I can be kind, and our princept is definitely pretty. But we need to know more. Curry sighed at his touch. Her skin seemed less gray. Would you believe I talked with a ghost? Did she smell good? Was she beautiful? Ymir asked. She was. Curry shifted so her wings touched some of the skin on Ymir's arm. The winged woman's legs fell open. Her armored skirt had ridden up her hips high enough that Ymir could see the pale skin of her inner thighs. How can we help you? Della whispered the question. Curry grabbed Ymir's hand and brought it to her cheek. If I tell you the secrets of the Jetaksha, you mustn't tell anyone else. Do you promise? Ymir glanced at Della, who nodded. Yes, child. Ymir and I have kept the secrets of other races to ourselves. We know how to handle delicate matters. Tell us. Not here. Curry pressed her lips against his hand. We need a private place. A bedroom, away from others, away from eyes. My office alcove, Della said, on the sixth floor. It's private. But really, shouldn't we have our doctor look at you, Miss Curry? Curry opened her eyes to smile at Della. I like you calling me Miss Curry, Princept. I feel honored. I'm not worthy of such respect. I have a darkness in me. I am weak. And the Jataksha loathe weakness. We value strength of character, strength of mind, and strength of wing. You have all of those things. Ymir addressed Della. Have a librarian, Drippy, come and lock up my books. Drippy? Della asked. Stinny Chimervik, we have a system. He then growled, Calum Calorum. The moon's magic came easily to him. He swept Curry up and out of the second floor, through the open air in the center of the citadel up to the sixth floor. He laid the woman on the long couch on her side, so her wings were tucked behind her. Ignis ignorum. He ignited one of the sunfire lanterns on an end table to give them light. Ymir remembered how he'd used the dragon magic to heal Ziziva. He slipped on three rings, the gather breath, the crystal null, and the flesh steel. Touch me, Curry begged. Please, it felt so good to be touched. I've been so alone. Even when I was with the tenth Suyuk, I could only find Huke with certain quickening girls. She was using terms Ymir didn't recognize. Della flew over the railing and landed on the hardwood floor. She padded over to the carpet of her office alcove. Stinny will take care of your books. Now, we need to know how to help our Miss Curry. Della joined him in kneeling next to the woman. Ymir noticed for the first time that Curry didn't have her swords, not even the sheaths. That worried him more than anything else. What was the matter with the Winkin? Tell us about Huke and quickening girls. Curry closed her eyes. My huke gives me my wings, just as it gives me my life. It makes me a strong warrior. But I need touch. I need sex. Quickening girls serve our armies when soldiers can't find lovers. Like I couldn't. Because of my... Because of how troubled I am. 
Ymir reached out with the gather breath ring. He felt the power of Della's core next to him. It was bright and spinning perfectly. However, Curry's Dusha was weak, turning slowly, sometimes stopping. No wonder she didn't look good. Ymir bent and kissed her cheek. Her Dusha brightened. He could also see how her magical core and her wings were connected. He suddenly had a very good understanding of the magic involved. To keep their wings healthy, the Jataksha needed sex. With that new understanding, Ymir leaned back and stripped off his robes and shirt. Then he was able to grow a pair of golden wings, easily, with layer upon layer of healthy feathers. He felt the new muscles in his back with wonder. He extended his wings, standing over the woman. Curry gazed at him with awe in her eyes. You are beautiful, and you know now. You know what it will take to save me. Ymir did. He glanced at Della. Our Miss Curry needs sex. Sex, her duja, and her wings are all connected. By the seven devils, Della whispered. Our lives certainly are interesting, Ymir, are they not? He couldn't disagree. He bent and kissed the winged woman again, this time on the lips. Curry returned his kiss. Just that little kiss brought the perfume back to her wings. Her skin turned from gray to white. The winged woman sighed. Yes, this, yes. Ymir felt the explosion of energy next to him. Della was getting turned on watching them. There was another bit of energy, though, in the shadows near him. Serena Sia was there, and yes, she had retained a bit of her duja. It was the little bit of life she had that let her drift through the halls and whisper to them. But someone else was coming, hurrying up the steps, not flying because she was following her flow magic. Linny Lynn Albatross was coming to watch them. Ymir could sense a bit of her flow magic. She really did try to catch people in public. He found a strap on Curry's armor and undid it. His cock was hard, but his own comfort could wait. My people have three questions they have to answer before they have sex. The questions are for us both, but they're also for Della. Three questions? Curry found a smile. I'm not a student here, and I didn't expect to be quizzed, but I will try. Ymir kissed her again. She tasted sweet. Her excitement smelled good. Will the sex disrespect our families? Will it disrespect ourselves? And will there be babies? The withering prevents babies, unless we take the tree of life drink. I have no family, Ymir, and I need this. I need you. Ymir thought that was the case. My family will understand, and I want to help you. He turned. Della. The princess's eyes were wide. She was breathing hard. I'll watch. I can't answer your damn questions, clansman. Not the one. Just do what you're going to do. Linny is coming, Ymir said quietly. Della's eyes flashed. Good, we can watch together. If I'm to sin, let me sin with company. For when in hell, befriend any demon you can. The princept was quoting Wilmer Swordwright. Of course she was. She ruled the best school in the world, and she was about to risk everything for a moment of pleasure. Ymir couldn't blame her. Curry wasn't just looking healthy. She was radiant with anticipation. No one in the world could walk away from such heartbreaking beauty. And Della was the type of woman that if she was going to break her own heart, she'd break it completely and damn the consequences. Chapter 22 Ymir unlatched another piece of Curry's armor. He removed it and set it on the floor. Della slid off one of Curry's boots, then the other. Sweat dripped down the side of her face. She gave Ymir a grin. He returned it. Undressing this winged warrior with the princept felt so natural. He thought she might be making much ado about nothing, 
But it was her call, not his. She had to answer all three questions to her own satisfaction. He and Curry had already answered them. Della unsnapped the warrior's grieve. Ymir bent and kissed Curry's lips, lingering there, until she grabbed him by his hair and kissed him back harder. There was the warrior girl he'd seen fight. She'd been so shy, so tentative since coming to Old Ironbound. He'd wondered about the fire in her spirit. Then again, it was clear now what she needed for both her wings and her spirit. She was bold with her tongue. He accepted it and brushed her tongue with his. She grabbed his bare arm, and her fingernails bit into his skin. She was working her hips up and down now. Ymir undid her arm protection and let the armor drop. He sat on the edge of the couch so there was room for his wings. They were obviously very important to Curry. He eased her head onto his lap. She lay partially on her side to accommodate her own wings. Ymir kept one hand in her hair, petting the red strands. With his other, he undid the first button of her thick cotton blouse. He was given a good view of her full cleavage. Her skin was so milky and smooth. Della undid her belt, gently removed the skirt of armor, and let it fall to the carpet. The princep then sat back and let her robes fall open. That wasn't enough for her. She stood up and stripped until all she wore was a camisole and her panty. The princept devoured the winged woman's body with her eyes. Take off your underwear, Curry. Show me your pussy. Della's words hardened Ymir's cock. Curry had her legs spread. White penny hid her sex, but the undergarment had a dark stain from the winged woman's excitement. I shouldn't, Curry complained. You don't have wings. I shouldn't show you my pussy. I know you shouldn't. The princept pushed her own panty down and stepped out of them. But that's what makes this so fucking hot. Ymir forgot about the writhing, half-naked woman under him for a second to take in the forbidden sight of Della's sex. She had clipped her white pubic hair so there was only a bit of stubble around her swollen lips. Her clit was a perfect pearl between her muscular thighs. The princept eased a finger down between her legs, first on one side of her ohi and then the other. Show me, Curry. Show you me here. Curry raised her ass and slipped off her panty. She had a wild patch of untamed red hair. At the center was her pink sex. She had a tiny pussy, just a little bit of lips and just a little bit of clit. She was going to be tight. The Winken went to toss her underwear to the side. Della had other ideas. Give them to Ymir. Let him smell you. He wouldn't want, Curry protested. Ymir grabbed her panties out of her hand. He then inhaled her scent. Yes, she smelled like an excited woman, a musky scent that he would never tire of. He tossed them to Della, who also sampled them. Della sniffed and slid a finger over her button. Yes, we would, Curry. Oh, yes, we adore your scent. I'm sure you've smelled yourself before. I like how I smell. I do too, Curry said in a choked voice. I'll show you. She reached down and fondled her lips and her tight hole. She brought her fingers to her nose, inhaling, before offering them to Ymir. He smelled them and then tasted her. She was sweet. Ymir pressed his cock against Curry's head. She must have felt it, too. But instead of turning her head, she took his hand and sucked on his fingers. First one, then another. Her tits, Ymir. I want to see her tits. Della stood with her nipples poking through her camisole. Her eyes were sparkling. Curry was sucking on two of Ymir's fingers. With her other hand, she undid the buttons on her blouse and then opened it up to expose all of herself to them. Perfect tits, 
Such perfect fucking titties. Della was rubbing herself harder now. Curry did have such wonderful tits. Firm, smooth, creamy, capped with hard little nipples that were pulled tight from her lust. Touch them, Della urged. Play with them. Ymir took a minute to paint Curry's lips with her spit before wiping her spit on one nipple and then the other. Both of her pink nubs gleamed in the light. My Ruru, Curry wept. Play with my Ruru. Ymir reached down and spread more spit across Curry's belly until his fingers found her wild bush of red fur. Reaching down further, he thanked the ax man for his long arms. He found her ohi. It was hard, hot, and ready for him to rub. He swiped his fingers across the sensitive button once, twice, three times. Curry raised her hips. I'm about to come. Put your finger in me. I want to feel you inside me. Ymir hooked a finger into the Winkin's tight hole. Then he felt her spasms as she grunted her way through an orgasm. I can see her coming. I can see her sweet pussy coming. Della fucked herself, then rubbed her clit, then fucked herself some more. I think she should suck on your cock, Ymir. I want to see it again. Curry slid off the couch and knelt before him. Help me, Ymir. Help me get to you. Ymir raised his hips to let her slide his clothes off him. Then he was naked, on the edge of the couch, and he couldn't help but spread his wings. It felt oddly good, as did Curry's hand wrapped around his throbbing oot. Oh, yes, you are big. I've not had a man before, and surely you must be bigger than most. I like how you smell, Ymir. I like how your ulu smells. She bent and licked up his shaft. He is bigger than most, a voice said from the darkness. Ymir turned his head. He saw a shadow there. At first he thought it was Serena Sia. Her perfume was in the air. But no, it was Linny Lynn Albatross, her hand between her legs. Her robes were undone. She was naked underneath. Curry glanced nervously at the professor masturbating in the darkness, but then she focused on Ymir's cock. Her eyelids fluttered as she took him into her mouth. She might not have been with a man before, but she knew what to do. She gripped his shaft and sucked on his hard, leaking head. Della's eyes went from the winkin sucking on Ymir to Linny there by the shelves. The lightning arced off the bookcases across the citadel from them as it traveled around the shelves. Ymir sniffed and smelled the ozone, but he also smelled the three excited women. Della marched over and grabbed Linny. The princep dragged the professor closer. Oh no, Linny. I've heard about you fucking yourself while spying on scholars. Let's get you out of the shadows. Let me help you with your horny clit. The princept pushed Linny into the circle of lantern light. Linny stood there, exposed and unsure of herself. Ymir's eyes went down to the gleam of the professor's juices, painting her inner thighs. Curry kept sucking on him stroking him, and Ymir had to grab her fiery red hair to pull her off him. She gave him a half-lidded stare. Am I not doing well, Kopak? Ymir smiled at her. You are doing well. I nearly came. Are you sure you've not done this before? I haven't, but I thought about it, and I had lady lovers who showed me different things. One thing was how to suck an ulu. Ymir guided her back onto his cock. He turned. Della had thrown her camisole to the floor. Naked, the princept stripped Linny Lynn of her scholar's robes. Della pulled off Linny's blouse to expose her dark tits and those big, puffy nipples. The princept pushed herself up against the other woman, grabbed her breasts, and worked the puffy nipples until they were hard. She pulled on one, then the other. 
I like your tits, Linny. And I think you like watching that winged girl suck our barbarian's dick. What else do you want to see? Linny's face was a mask of sweaty lust. She couldn't talk. She could only whimper. I want to see them fucking. I like watching students fuck. Curry had learned some pigeon after all. She turned and put her arms on the chair. Covering her back with her wings, she lifted her ass to him. You can fuck me, Ymir. Your wings are so beautiful. She bit her lip. Be gentle with me. This is my first time with a man. Ymir fluttered his wings, and again, the motion felt strangely good. He got behind the winged woman and grabbed her round hips. Her hole was even more swollen than when he'd played with it before. That hole was small, but it sure was wet. Girl cum dripped onto the floor. He got his head between her lips. Then he was feeling her heat around him. She was tight. He was going to stretch her. Feeling her was so intense, he almost came. Then he glanced up. Della had removed Linny's panty. The princept was behind the professor, cupping one cone-shaped tit while rubbing the woman's ohi. Della knew how to pleasure another woman, and she was rubbing their voyeur hard. Linny's mouth was a perfect O. She was gasping, nearing an orgasm. Curry gazed at the two beautiful women, one light-skinned, the other dark. Is she tight, Ymir? Della asked. So fucking tight. Curry wailed as he pushed his girthy prick all the way into her clinging hole. So hot, so tight. I won't last long, Della, Ymir growled between his teeth. But you have to, his princept insisted. You have to give her pleasure, Ymir, just like I'm giving our horny voyeur pleasure. Am I doing well, Linny? Is it nice to have someone else rubbing your hot little twat? Yes, the professor hissed. So good, so good to watch her. She's so beautiful, but she's a Jataksha, Ymir. Grab her wings and fuck her hard. She'll like that. Then Ymir did grab the girl's wings. Her feathers were soft, but he felt the hardness of the bones as well. Curry immediately moaned and slammed back into him. It was apparent that she loved her wings handled. He pulled on them harder, which made her shriek. He thrust in and out of her heat, but she wasn't getting any looser. No, she seemed to be getting tighter. Harder, Linny urged. Fuck her harder. Ymir gave up all control. He pounded the whimpering Winkin over and over, pleasuring her depths, until he couldn't help himself. He gave himself to his orgasm. He went from holding her wings to holding her ass steady as he forced himself as far into her sex as he could get. She felt it. Yes, I can feel you. I can feel you giving me what I need. I'll be okay now, my Kopak. I'll be okay. He was spurting his seed deep into her sweaty body. She was glowing with health, her wings a blinding white, her hair a fiery red. Ymir gave himself over to the ecstasy. He rode the waves of bliss, surprised at the intensity of his orgasm. He felt it everywhere, including his douja. It was the kind of cum that begged for another right away. He knew he wasn't going to get soft anytime soon. Linny hadn't come yet, and Della marched her over. The princept pushed Ymir back. Our slutty professor wants to see the mess you made, Ymir. Then I think she'll come. Won't you, Linny? Won't you? Linny was kneeling naked on the floor, 
tits out and shamelessly rubbing her own clit. Her eyes were on Curry's hairy pussy. The Winkin gave Ymir a brave grin as she reached back and pulled her ass cheeks apart. That movement exposed even more of herself to the masturbating woman. Linny choked. Fuck, I'm coming. I'm looking at her used oheezy, and I'm coming. Della flounced down on the couch. She spread her legs and snaked her hand underneath her ass. She slipped two fingers into her butterhole. Her other hand rubbed her clit, watching the show. The winged girl with her ass in the air, and one of her professors giving herself an orgasm. Then Della stared at Ymir's cock, which was still hard. The princept's eyes focused on his oot with such unbridled desire that Ymir couldn't help but stroke himself. He and Della were masturbating together, and she was being so nasty, fingering her ass. Of course she'd like that. She'd been with the Fei many, many times. Her eyes went from his cock to his face. I'm going to come, Ymir. I'm going to make my horny pussy come. Come then, he growled. Then Della orgasmed. She forced her fingers deeper into her back hole as her pussy spasmed and leaked new liquid down onto her fingers. The sight was too much for Ymir. He started to come again. His first eruption hit Linny's shoulder. The professor turned and offered him her chest. You can come on me, Ymir. You can come on my tits. He painted a line of cum across one puffy nipple and then the other. Linny let him finish before rubbing his seed into her skin. Oh, it's so warm. I forgot how warm a young man's seed is. Curry turned and scooped up her armor. This has been very special for me. You have no idea, but I have to go. I'll be with Ymir. I need him, but I can't be with his Elu. They don't have wings. It wouldn't be right. Before they could stop her, the Jataksha warrior had flown off with her armor gathered to her chest. Della slipped down off the couch and grabbed Linny by the hair. This is a stern warning, Linny. This is the last time you spy on scholars. You are done with your voyeurism. Do you understand me? Linny wore a rebellious smile on her face. Well now, we'll have to talk about that, won't we? And there's a certain book I've been dying to read. Ymir couldn't help but laugh. Linny was going to be her own woman. Nothing, not even her own princept, could change that. However, Della Panez was a very dangerous woman to have as an enemy. Linny would be foolish to cross the honored princept of old Ironbound. Chapter 23 With Curry gone, Ymir turned his attention to the two women left. He didn't include Serena Sia, who watched wordlessly from the shadows. There was a very satisfied smile on her face. The ghost watched Ymir, Della, and Linny dress before she faded away completely. The princept repeated her warning. No more of your games, Professor Albatross. Linny Lynn's smile was devilish. And what of your games, Professor? If I can't play, then you can't either. Della's face darkened. Ymir cinched his robes over his shirt. He didn't like Linny drawing up terms to any sort of agreement that hindered Della in any way. She already hindered herself. Besides, the professor didn't have any power in the current situation. Was she the one who'd sent Della the sand letter? It seemed so. However, it was hard to tell. It won't work that way, Ymir said. You want me to finish the rings. I need Della in all kinds of ways. She's asked you to stop prowling the campus, and you will, unless you get permission from those who you're watching. I don't think you want that. Linny's eyes narrowed. 
You won't know if I stop or not. Ymir pulled the veiled tear ring out of his pocket. You are very wrong about that. What the princep does is her business. Your business is our business, as long as we're working together on the last of the rings. You've called it the sleeper's ring, Lenny said. But I've consulted with the Akira Corps. It's the ring of the awakening. It will awaken you in all sorts of ways. The professor's smile was a dark thing. Was the professor talking to the demonic forces beyond the veil? That made Ymir pause, but he wasn't all that surprised. He was playing a game that was equally dangerous. Again, he recalled his vision of wearing all eight of the Akiric rings as he walked the axe tundra. If his vision was correct, he'd live, and he would finish the task that had been given him by the axe man. Della cut in. Before we discuss the forging of this last ring, I need you to fall in line, Professor Albatross. No more. And if you try to ruin the Princept, Ymir said, I'll let this last ring go unforged. It was a good bluff. The professor's brown eyes went back and forth between the two of them. She sighed. Very well. I've had my delights for the time being. And I think if I begged you, Ymir, you would let me watch you pleasure your harem. Perhaps. Would he include Linny? He wasn't sure he wanted the woman that close to his wives. Della stood, appraising the professor. Let's not tempt them, nor me, more than we need to. Agreed? Linny's smile brightened a bit. Agreed. We all need to make sacrifices, and I understand very well how hypocrisy is a part of life. We will not be discussing my hypocrisy, Professor. It seemed the Princept had won. In the end, Della had the moral flexibility to remove the Professor if she became a problem, either by her authority as Princept or with a dagger as a former assassin of the silent scream. Professor Albatross laughed and seemed to return to her old, odd self. Let's talk about the Ring of the Awakened. Very exciting times. Very exciting indeed. Linny didn't ask if Della would also stop. Ymir thought their encounter with Curry might have taken the edge off the Princept's passions for now. Della would regain control, and they would continue on. Yet her grip on her lust was growing more tenuous. Ymir rather liked that fact, but he wouldn't say so. He'd let Della make that decision on her own terms. The Princept led them through the doors and up the stairs to her apartment, which took up the entire seventh floor. The illuminate spire was above them on the eighth. Linny took a seat at a table that Della used for meetings. Ymir poured them both wine, and they sat in the glow of sunfire candles. Linny was beautiful, surely, and alluring. He'd seen her naked twice now, but even better was the knowledge of her lust. Then he thought of Curry. He found it sad that she was going back to her nest on the roof of the Amora Annex, he thought they might have to figure out a way to move her roost to the zoo. They'd fashioned a room for Ziziva, however small. They could make one for Curry. She would need him again to keep her wings healthy. Would Curry fit in well with his other wives? He didn't know. Della came down the steps with the burned book. She laid it on the table. Linny didn't pause. She held it without opening it. Yes, can you feel it? Can you feel this other world? This book has such interesting energy in its pages. I'm assuming this is from the Hyindal collection. It must be. We approached Edrin to see if he wanted to be a part of the White Rose Society. He was far too paranoid. He warned you about us, didn't he? He did. Ymir marveled that she'd brought it up. Just when he thought she was made of demons and secrets... Linny went and surprised him. Of course he did. He was always a coward. Linny scooted the book in front of herself. She slowly opened the cover and perused the front page. That is no language of this world. 
That is the language of the dead, if I'm not mistaken. You would need a dead woman to read it. Must it be a woman? Della asked. A strange draft blew through the room. The sunfire candles flickered. A second later, Serena Sia's musky perfume filled the room. Ymir felt her chill soul. Her voice was a mischievous whisper. I was waiting for you to discover the book's secret. It's why the living recoil from its touch. It was a book meant for the eyes of the dead. Linny Lynn glanced around. Did you both hear that? It's Pigeon, with an O'Learan accent. But strange, so strange. It's Serena Sia, isn't it? She's been in my dreams. I've seen her pleasure chambers down far below in the scrollery. She picked her prey carefully. Not prey. Lovers, friends, allies. But that is not your path, Linilin Albatross. And we both know it. Is it the Princeps? Linny asked. Della waved a hand. Ignis Ignanus. All the candles went out except for one that she placed at the top of the book. Enough about sex. We've had our fun tonight, all of us. Serena, come and read this fucking book. A ghostly laughter filled the room. The shadowy figure drifted over to stand in front of the book. Ymir felt the hairs on the back of his neck stand up. He shivered. Witches, demonologists, assassins, and specters. What had his life come to? More curious, he was actually enjoying this. He figured he was bound for the darkness after all this sorcery, so he might as well enjoy the ride. Or, as Della put it, when in hell, befriend any demon you can. This is not a fucking book, Serena whispered. This was written by Ego Lacrador himself. It is his history of the Akiric rings, how to craft them, different law about them, including the first forger. This is holy text for you three, as sacred as the Tree of Life and the Sanctum Oriat. This book, it is the Accor Oriat. That is the title. He'd read parts of the Sanctum Oriat and found it dry. This burned book, however, was something he hadn't bargained for. A book written by Aegle Acridor himself? And to call it the Demon's Oriot? It was sacrilege. Oriot was an old Theranus word that meant prayer, though there was more nuance to the word. It actually meant last prayer. Ymir had the next logical question. Why write it in the language of the dead? I can't say, but what better way to hide something for yourself? Would it surprise anyone that the Vempa was friends with the dead? He was human enough, and yet he lived a thousand years. Or could it be he knew this moment would come? That someone who wanted all eight rings would arrive here, with this book, despite the odds. In the first pages, he talks about the sleeper's ring and how important it is. But he always calls it the ring of the awakened. Could there be two? I don't know. It might be a mistake, but I doubt it. He says this ring summons the ultimate darkness, the ultimate death. Ymir saw the mire he was in. The rings had powered both the Vemper's life and his empire. And this last ring was critical. No one had mentioned it because no one thought it should be forged. Was it the sleeper's ring? Or was it the ring of the awakened? Did the name matter? Either way, Ymir was going to find out. I'll want sand parchment, Della. And I'll transcribe the Accor Oriot into Pigeon for our own edification and for your luminate spire. Della frowned. We are up to our knees in hellfire and shit in this. Do we want this knowledge in the world, in pigeon, 
For anyone to recreate what we have done? Yes, yes we do, Linny said. We are slaves to knowledge. We shouldn't turn our eyes from what truths there might be in the world. Della ignored the demonologist. She was gazing at Ymir in the flickering light of the candle. What do you say, clansman? Ymir looked into her eyes. When the first man smelted metal, he didn't question his work. He created a tool that would bring sorrow to men, that would turn wives into widows and children into orphans. This is the same. We create tools, for good or for ill. He lifted his hand to show the three rings. These are tools. We will craft a new world with them. Serena Sia's laughter sounded so very bitter. Has there been a despot who hasn't said those words? Be careful of your crafting, Ymir, for you might want to unmake this world before you make another. And then the widows and orphans will weep, while wounded men curse your name. Linny Lin's eyes were bright and alive. The winged woman calls him Kopak. She calls him king, and Ymir will be king once he finishes the rings. Ymir shrugged that off and finished his wine. I'm not a king yet. First, I'm a scribe. Della, sand parchment, pen, and ink. The princept returned with the implements. Ymir got to work. Linny Lin sat and listened while Serena read the words for Ymir to write down. Egalacrador wrote about the first rings ever forged in a lost age before the Age of Union before the signing of the Theranuvial Agreement. It was when a lake covered most of the blood steppes, and the orcs were mariners as wild as the sea elves. The first set of rings were ancient, and they too had been lost. To think, Ymir would be forging a third set. They had worked far into the night, the early morning, actually, when they finally agreed to stop. Dawn was only a few hours away. Della took the Accor Oriot back up to the Illuminate Spire while Linny Lin left, and Serena Sia faded away. Accor Oriot. Ymir loathed the title. It felt blasphemous, although he couldn't give two elk shits about the Tree of Life. He far preferred thinking of it as the burned book. Regardless of the title, he wanted to talk to his Praetor about the discovery. He kissed Della on the cheek before he left. As he walked back to the zoo, the events of the day felt heavy, as did his history. He'd been an outcast, cursed with magic he hadn't wanted, forced to travel to a magic academy. Now he was translating a book only the dead could read. It all felt unfair, but he wouldn't whine. Neither the axe man, nor the shield maiden, nor the wolf could stomach whiners. Speaking of the wolf... The reveler's moon was blood red in the sky, as big as the axeman and shield maiden combined. It was a bloody eye in the sky, and Ymir stopped in the flow courtyard to stare up at it. The stars were lost in the crimson radiance. For a second, he thought about casting aside the rings, leaving the magic school, letting this King Shapta do what he wanted with Thera. Ymir could travel west to Ethra and see about the strange people who lived there. Horsewomen, dwarves who lived in great trees, snakemen who slithered down icy peaks, or the four-armed demon women of the Ashchima Wastes. Fuck the sleeper. Fuck the awakened. Ymir was fooling himself about old Ironbound being his own. The love he had for his wives was real, but in a handful of months, he'd be graduating. He wouldn't be staying on as a teacher. The thoughts were as bitter as Serena's laughter. Grandfather Bear always said the whining man and the bitter man burned in the same fire. To be cynical and hateful was just another way of complaining. To be a strong man was to stand firm in hope and resolve. He could hear Grandmother Rabbit telling him to live where his feet were. His feet were at Old Ironbound, and the axeman had carved him a very specific path. 
and that path included forging all eight of these rings. The wolf could piss on the White Rose Society, on Linny, and on all her demons. Ymir would walk his path. End of story. And his path included the rings, Della and her torn soul, and the mysterious winged warrior woman sleeping in her nest down on the roof of the Amora Annex. He thought of going there, curling up with her, and enjoying her wings one more time before going to bed. But no, he had to get back to the zoo. His wives might be up, wondering where he was. He didn't want them worried or angry, so he hurried forward, walking the edge of the chapel of the tree to the front door of the zoo. At the table sat a very tired Ziziva in a little chair. In her arms was a very angry, very red-faced baby. Ymiri, dearie, take your daughter, please, and thank you, thank you, and please. She has cried all night, and I'm soaked with her tears from my tresses to my toes. Ziziva carried little Gertie to the palm of his hand before the fairy went zooming down to her little room connected to Ribby's room. Ribby! Ziziva's shriek pierced the entire apartment. Wake up and snore no more! Ugh! This night is such a bore and it's killed me to my core! Sleep and snoring and crying babies and such drama and such dreams that have come! That have come to haunt us all! Quiet down there! Gatha roared from her room. Jenny Bell let out a tired yell. Shut up, all you crazy bitches. I need to sleep. Lily's voice was a whisper. Please, Jenny. Tori came out of her room in her nightgown, rubbing her eyes. It's not yet morning, Mr. Man, but I can make you breakfast. Gertie giggled at Ymir, then saw Tori and gave her a very drooly smile. Then her attention was back on Ymir, she let out several high-pitched shrieks. Go back to bed, Tori. I'll take Gertie to the library. I think I can get her to sleep. Will you sleep? Tori asked. Not tonight. Ymir knew that was the truth. His mind was too full of the rings, of history, of Della Panez and her lust-soaked beauty, and of the Winken who thought Ymir would one day be king, if this was kinghood, he didn't want it. Chapter 24 Ymir made himself cafe in the kitchen and found a bit of sweet milk for Gertie, who drank it in little drops off his finger. A single drop was a big gulp for such a little girl. They had tiny diapers for her, but Gertie was dry, so that wasn't the problem. She just seemed restless. But she'd been restless for weeks now. Ymir couldn't blame her. He found himself a treat in the kitchen, some fried dough from the day before. He had to hurry or else face the wrath of the giant woman who ran the kitchen, Francie Balsford, who had a big square jaw and a surprising amount of facial hair. Francie wouldn't like the idea of a barbarian in her kitchen helping himself, Ymir figured that Tori worked so hard for Francie that the Dwab had earned them all kitchen privileges. And it wasn't like he was cooking his Amorazoka there. Not anymore. Memories of that first night, making their Zocalotti in the kitchen, made him smile. His entire life at Old Ironbound had been a bending, if not outright breaking, of the rules. At the same time, he'd rescued the school many times, so it evened out. Never be too lawful when it doesn't benefit the clan. Ymir's father hated that idea. Both Grandfather Bear and Grandmother Rabbit lived by it. Ymir found where Drippy had placed his special books, in a locked shelf at the librarian stand. He opened the lock with form magic, gathered up his tomes, and took his little baby up to the second floor. He also brought along some supplies for her makeshift crib, he hadn't lied when he'd told Tori he had a plan. Ymir had a bowl with some soft napkins for Gertie. He put some leftover potato rolls at the bottom, split open so Gertie would rest on the soft insides and not the crusty shells. 
He then covered the rolls with one napkin before laying another napkin over her. She shifted around, but was soon yawning as he opened a book. He glanced back at her, and she was asleep. If Ziziva had been there, she would have flown into a rage. She was with Gertie all night and didn't get a lick of sleep. Ymir had her for 20 minutes, and she was sleeping soundly in her bowl bed. Maybe it was the perfume of the rolls. More likely, it was the fact that the little fairy had worn herself out over the course of the long night. And Gertie's troubles weren't over. She was fitful, tossing, turning, making little squeaking sounds. Ymir still had most of the Akiric rings on, and he reached out to feel little Gertie's douja. Her magical core burned brightly. The Fei were like suns compared to the pinpricks of starlight of the other races. Gertie, like her mother, had a golden inner light. And yet, every so often, there was a flash of blue there. Ymir's core was light blue. Ymir didn't want to damage his daughter's core, but that gleam of blue didn't look right. Was it getting in the way? He didn't know. He saw that blue flash again. Ymir timed it, and then he touched that blue flash. The result was immediate. The blue mingled with the yellow to make an emerald green. The spinning green orb was a beautiful sight. But at the same time, Ymir felt something shift in his own soul. There was a flash of red inside of him, and he couldn't help but think of Unger somehow. It was the crimson of dragonfire inside. He thought maybe he could do something with it, perhaps regain his ability to turn into a dragon. But no, the red was gone. Ymir had more important things to consider at the moment. Gertie's eyes flew open. She let out a little cry, and then she started to grow. Ymir immediately snatched her out of the bowl. He laid her on the table. The little baby shed the napkins, and there, in her little nightgown, lay on her back for a minute, stretching and making little sighing sounds. Then she rolled over onto her stomach, which Grandmother Rabbit used to call the miracle of the kiss. It was the sign of a healthy baby, one who could move from their back to the front so they could kiss the world. Gertie started crawling, which Grandmother Rabbit had another name for, the miracle of the wolf. As Gertie crawled, she grew bigger, 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 and her nightgown grew with her. When she was the size of a human baby, she fell on her face. She started to cry, and Ymir scooped her up. It was a miracle. She was so big now. Giant tears tumbled down her cheeks. She'd fallen before, but in her little form, it wasn't that great a distance to tumble. Now that she was so big, falling hurt more. Ymir held her in the length of his arm, marveling at the size of the child. His own baby. His own flesh, blood, and soul. And it had been his soul that had kept her from becoming her verum self. Gertie quieted and then pushed against his chest. She wanted to be on her own again. He set her on the table amid a scatter of books. His second floor table had never felt so sacred. Gertie balled up a fat little fist and hit her leg. Then she turned and mashed her hand on the bowl. The napkins and rolls went tumbling out. Ymir caught the bowl and moved it far away. Gertie looked at it with tired eyes, then turned to him and gave him a big smile. He saw she had two teeth now, one in the upper gum and one in the lower. Those were new. Gertie reached out with both hands. Dada! It was his baby girl's first word. Ymir knew if he told Ziziva that Gertie's first word was Dada and not Mama, she would be heartbroken. He'd keep that little jewel to himself. Again, Ymir scooped her up and held her to his chest. This time, Gertie didn't push him away. She yawned and snuggled in close. The clansman sat with the sleeping baby on his chest. A full-size baby, finally. He'd felt like a father before, dealing with this little bug of a daughter. But this felt different. 
This felt like a promise fulfilled. It pointed to a healthy life, a long life. Ymir saw the truth. Whatever he did with the rings, he had to keep his daughter safe and give her every advantage. His wives were capable, strong, fearsome, and yet even they needed his protection. The little soul in his arms felt so much more fragile. Ymir closed his eyes, inhaling the scent of his baby, feeling her warmth and listening to her breath. Her breathing matched his. And even though he'd drank several cups of cave, he fell asleep. It had been a long, long night. It felt like seconds later when Tori awakened him with screams of joy. The little baby has grown! Gertie has her verum self! Mr. Man, you've got to take her right now, right this second, to her mother. Gosh me underground. We have to send Queen Dee Dee a sand letter. That fairy queen has been worried sick. Gertie has grown. Gertie has grown. Ymir shot the little dwab an annoyed look. Tori slapped her hands over her mouth. Then she whispered, Sorry, sorry, sorry. It's just so exciting. I got things started in the kitchen, then came here to see if you were okay. And here we have a miracle on our hands. Gertie woke up, but her long night and her growth spurt had tired her out. She fell back asleep. Ymir checked again, and there was Gertie's soul, burning a bright green, spinning and sparking. That wouldn't change the color of her fairy sparkles. Those would be gold. But she could make green ones, or any color, really. Ymir and Ziziva had spoken often of the Fae scintilla dust and how it worked. Ymir eased himself off the chair. He kept his voice to a whisper. I'll take her to the zoo. Could you put my books back in the locked shelves at the librarian's desk? Sure, sure, sure. And I'll tell Francie that I'm taking the morning off. This is so exciting. Having a little inchworm girl around never sat right with me. But this beautiful little girl, she motioned to the little golden head, is so special now, so big and ready for the world. Had Gertie grown more of her mother's golden hair since becoming her verum self? It seemed so. Ymir went to the dragon arch and saw a morning rain wash down from the clouds, The skies to the west were still dark, but the red of the sunrise was already painting the flow tower. Ymir tucked Gertie into his robes to keep her warm and dry. He then hurried through the rain to the zoo. He opened the door and listened. The tumble of rooms was quiet. Even Ribby wasn't snoring for once. Ymir debated on what to do. Wake the women or let them sleep? He gauged the benefits of both plans, then decided on a course of action. He made his way down the main steps, past the middle bathroom, Gatha's room, and Lily's studio. He paused in his own room to take in the sleeping shapes of his elf girl and Jenny Bell Josen, both wrapped in their blankets, sleeping soundly. Ymir took the staircase to the left down the steps to the lowest apartment, Ribby's room. Her sleeping net was empty, The mermaid was at her desk in her thin nightgown, studying by the light of the sunfire lantern. That explained why she wasn't snoring. She gave him a smile before her eyes found the baby. The mermaid was up in seconds, sprouting tentacles from her torso as she moved over to him. She laid a gentle hand on Gertie's sleeping body. She kept her voice to a hush. So it's happened. Ziziva will be beyond happy. Ymir then went to the little perch off Ribby's room. It was a small golden place with silky curtains and red velvet couches and a little bed perfect for the fairy and her baby. Gertie came awake, blinking. Her eyes took in her normal room, and then she saw the sleeping form of her mother. Mama, Gertie erupted. Ziziva spun out of her thick crimson blankets. What is this? What's that sound? My little girl has come around. She is talking, said my name. Now I'm truly playing this mama game. Ziziva fluttered her wings and rose off the bed. She went zooming out of her little room and buzzed over. Gertie immediately went from big baby to little bug. Ziziva caught her daughter up and flew her around the room in a shower of golden sparkles. 
Gertie, Gertie, Gertrude. Gertie, Gertie, me. She's grown into her verum self and letting it all be. Ziziva flew down to the floor. She shifted into her verum self, and Gertie, without a pause, shifted with her. And now it was a woman-sized fairy woman holding her baby-sized baby. Ziziva burst into tears, which seemed to astound the baby, who then immediately started crying. Ribby rolled over on her tentacles and held both the fairy girl and the baby. Gertie became fascinated with one of Ribby's coils. She stopped crying and started gnawing. Ribby yanked the tentacle away. For only having a couple of teeth, that baby chews like a shark. From the kitchen came the sound of Tori bursting in the door. Everyone wake up! Ymir, where's that baby? Lily and Jenny Bell were already awake. Both came down the steps, blinking sleep out of their eyes. The swamp woman eyed the little baby with a frown. She's a big girl now. By the old gods, I didn't think that was ever going to happen. Lily, though, went over and took Ziziva in her arms. She soothed the fairy girl. It's all going to be good. Your daughter is strong and beautiful. And rules a great deal, Jenny Bell said with a little frown. Gertie frowned, too, until she smiled, and it made Jenny smile. The swamp woman came over and held the baby. So big, and I don't care about the drool. She kissed Gertie's red cheek. Gatha stormed down, wearing her leather tunic. She swept the baby from Jenny Bell and held her up. She eyed Gertie from the tips of her kicking legs to the golden fuzz on her head. Yes, she is a real baby. She will grow up strong. We'll make a warrior out of her. Gertie let out a squeal of joy at all the attention. Tori burst into the room. Now it's my turn. If I don't hold that baby, I'll die where I stand. Gatha put the baby in Tori's arms. The dwab burst into tears, which made Gertie cry. The she-orc laughed and held both Tori and the baby until they were both smiling again. Ymir stood back, watching. Pride swelled his heart. He was glad to be living in that day. He was glad that his feet were in that room with his baby and all his many, many wives. It wasn't half an hour later when Della Pinez herself knocked on their door. However, she hadn't come there to admire Gertie's verum self. It was Ymir who answered the door. The princept gave him a little smile, but it was soon just a ghost on her face, as spectral as Serena Sia. Josentown has fallen. Della's eyes were hard. By his actions, King Shapta has made it very clear that his goal is an empire that would put even Egil Akridor to shame. Ymir took her hand and gently pulled her into the kitchen before closing the door. Damn the news of war, Della. It doesn't matter. I'll show you what does. Chapter 25 Lakuri Kochachamba soared through the cloud-strewn sky. It hadn't rained, but it was cold. If it wasn't for her magic, she might have frozen. But her huke was full of energy. Ymir made sure of that. It had been a month since he'd helped her with her quickening, a month since the fall of Josentown, and only a couple of weeks since Queen Aribel had come with her husband, Daris Bokujin, to the magical academy. Curry knew them both. General Sharkendrix Machu of the 10th Suyuk had made sure that her mercenaries knew who they were fighting to protect. Curry had seen the pretty Ari and her dashing husband, Darius, and she had thought they were both so in love. And yes, it was strange that Ari Bell might marry another man at some point in the future, but the Swamp Coast witches were strange folk. The queen might have her own Elu of men. Curry thought that would be lonely. Queen Aribel wouldn't have any sister wives to keep her company. When she'd been younger, Curry had dreamed of joining an Elu, the Jataksha word for harem, but those old desires were gone. No, having the Kopek help her with her huke should be enough for her. Besides, it was unnatural for Curry to want to be with the wingless women. Or that was what she told herself over and over. 
It was more than that, though. Curry knew her time was short on the world, and she would be giving her life up soon. It was one of the reasons why she wasn't surprised that the demon conqueror, King Shapta, had taken the Swamp Coast. The Sorrow Coast Kingdom would fall next, but that would take some time. The demon conqueror still had work to do in corrupting the humans just as he'd corrupted the Jataksha, changing them into creatures of darkness. For now, while King Shapta ruled the Swamp Coast Queendom, there was an uneasy peace, but future violence was inevitable. Curry knew Ymir would be hurt when she finally gave in to her fate, but he would have the love of his wives to see him through his pain. And he would have Gertie, who had transitioned to solid food. Word had it, Ziziva was getting frisky again. She had wings. Curry could kiss her. But no. When Curry's fate came calling, she didn't want any of Ymir's beautiful women to feel the pain of her loss. They'd all been through enough. A sand letter had come from Greenholm. Lily's mother was coming, making the dangerous journey west while she still could. She'd have to travel through four roads, which was only a couple hundred miles from the border with the Swamp Coast Queendom. Lily was nervous seeing her mother again, and mystified that she'd come all the way to Old Ironbound in the first place. Then again, war was coming. War made people crazy. Curry knew that firsthand. The pointier was also struggling with her combat training with the greenskin, Gatha. No, they weren't pointiers and greenskins. They were elves and orcs. Curry was slowly learning pigeon. Anyway, the elf maiden said the combat training took away from her time working on her story, which she had to publish before she graduated. Curry couldn't read, but she spent one glorious afternoon with Lily, looking at the sketches that the elf had drawn in her book. It was a very sad story. Curry had wept enough in front of Ymir's women, and so she kept her tears to herself. Then, when she was back at her wasi, Curry cried herself to sleep. Lily had captured grief in her book. If Curry had been blessed with a long life, she would have learned to read, if only to read Lily's masterpiece. The elf wasn't the only wife to be having trouble. Tori couldn't master this potion she was working on. Curry didn't understand all of the specifics, only that the Dwab and Ymir had borrowed a very special book from a forbidden shelf of the library. They'd read it, but both were still having trouble. Tori and Ymir were constantly brewing stinky potions in their flow classroom. Curry would fly by the window to check on the Dwab and the Kopak. Curry always liked to know where Ymir was. It was generally easy. Most of the time, he was in the Citadel, at his table, reading book after book and writing, writing, writing. Only she knew Ymir had a special project and that he needed Serena Sia to do it. However, the ghost hadn't been seen in a month. Where she was, they didn't know. Who could track the movements of the dead? Gatha seemed at peace, though you'd never know it. She was such a warrior, and so protective. Gatha made sure Jenny Bell and Lily were safe. Jenny Bell was struggling. She wasn't happy having her sister back at Old Ironbound, living in the Imperial Palace. Jenny had made several breakthroughs in portal magic based on a text that Della had given her. It was one of Edrin's books. The old elf certainly did have an interesting library, all of Ymir's wives worked so very hard. They'd passed their first exam, an important test at the beginning of the year, and all were in the process of studying for their second exam, which would take place before an important winter festival. It was strange to think of December as being a part of winter. For Curry, the twelfth month had been a time for sleeping naked and flying in the dayshine. It was a time of sweat and heat and sipping cool drinks. Seeing Ymir's Elu work so hard, Curry had decided that she shouldn't simply give up and wait for her fate to end her days. And so, she agreed to work with Lily on casting flow spells for the translation magic. That had helped Curry learn pigeon, which was what most of the Therans spoke. She also wanted to unlock her spear speech, a shriek that could do harm to one's enemies. Curry had never had such a lover as her Kopak. He kept her hookay so healthy.
With that power, she thought she might be able to learn Jataksha magic that had been beyond her abilities. To think, she might use the spear speech, the chukirime, or give herself iron skin, the shukekwara. There were no other winkin at the school. There had been, though. Ymir remembered that the orc professor, Garam Sornap, had trained a Jataksha warrior named Unhel a few years back. So Curry had a nice life, waiting for her bitter fate. It was such a blessing. It felt like too much sometimes, but Curry tried to keep a good attitude. That day, Ymir wanted to train with Curry and Gatha on the lighthouse island. He said he had a special gift for Curry, but just being with him and his wives was gift enough. Ymir soared up from the island. He was using one of his magic rings to give himself wings. He had his shirt off so she could see the coiled knots of his muscles under his smooth skin. Armor made of ice covered him, and in his right hand was a long, frozen spear. When the sun managed to wrestle through the clouds, it made him glimmer as if he were covered with diamonds. He called to her, Come at me, Curry. Strike me if you can. Both he and Gatha had cast the flow magic so they could all talk. Curry flew over and brought her swords down on the ice of his arm. She managed to shatter some of it, but she didn't cut him. She was glad. Then she let herself fall. Ymir was very good with his wings, but he still had a lot to learn about flying. It took him a second to realize his opponent was no longer in the skies. However, her kopak was wearing all his magic rings, except the one that allowed him to see into the past, present, and future. Curry felt icy fingers clutch at her soul, and she knew it was Ymir, testing his power. She had defenses for that, a mental energy that old Peya had taught her. It was called the Shuke Yuya, or the Iron Mind. Old Peya had joked that Curry could defend herself from everything except for her own thoughts. Curry saw a flaming spear shooting up at her. It was Gatha, trying to break her concentration, The winged warrior easily dodged the flung missile as it evaporated into smoke. Curry then saw the she-orc on a rock with another spear in her hand. Gatha flung it, but again, Curry dodged the missile. The Jataksha warrior flew down, fainted to the left, but struck from the right. She lowered her shoulder and drove it into Gatha, who went stumbling backward and almost fell off the cliff. The she-orc might have gotten very wet if she hadn't been so strong and cunning. Calum Kalarum! Gatha cast the flying magic to avoid a cold bath. She tried to clutch at Curry, but Curry was moving too fast. Snow fell from above, not from the sky, but from Ymir, who was using another of his rings. Curry had flown in snow before. While the snowflakes were thick, she hardly felt the cold. She kept her eyes on Ymir, who was floating there, using a combination of Moon's magic and his own wings. He looked glorious, like the snow king of the sky. Curry flung one of her swords, and Ymir froze it. She threw another, and that one too became ice. They didn't fall, though. He'd extended his magic around them. Curry had only one choice. She went to grab him, but he caught her, held her, and kissed her even as they and her kurichia fell. She looked in wonder at his face, which wasn't covered in ice. No, he was burning from within, with a wonderful heat that warmed every part of her. He touched her cheek. You are a wonder. I've rarely seen such a warrior. You've seen Gatha. You've seen Karibda. I am nothing compared to them. You are just as worthy. Strength of character, strength of mind, strength of wing. You have all three. Why can't you see that? The question made Curry want to cry. She was a fearsome warrior, and she could defend every part of herself, except for her heart. She and Ymir were falling faster and faster and faster. Ymir didn't seem to care, and Curry put all of her faith in him, She knew it wasn't her fate to die that day. She knew it to her bones. Ymir softened their fall, not with any magic she could see, but from catching an updraft of hot air that rose from a cushion of cold. 
He eventually froze the water in the air completely, giving them a slide that was slick under her armor. It was fun, riding that sheet of ice down to the rocks, where Gatha stood with another spear of fire in her hands, covered in armor made of flames. Ymir extinguished both her armor and her spear in seconds. Lutum prolium, Gatha barked. The stone under her seemed to liquefy and rise to her hands, until her arms were covered with rock. She gripped two long blades of sharpened stone. You won't remove my weapons so easily. Ymir laughed. So, you've learned a bit of form magic from Tori. I'm impressed. Curry immediately flew up and caught her two swords, which were wet, but were free of ice now. Then she landed in front of Gatha. Curry couldn't help but look in wonder at the she-orc's thick stone gauntlets and rock daggers. Gatha flung herself at Curry, and instead of flying away, the winged woman parried every blow in a shower of sparks. It was fun anticipating the she-orc's attacks, though her fighting tusks were so fearsome. Curry thought for a moment she might be overwhelmed, but she held her own. Gatha finally relented and retracted her tusks. You would have done well in the fighting pits of Sunash, Curry. I would have bet all my shecks on you. Curry looked away, embarrassed. She sheathed her swords. Fighting is all I can do. I wish I had your wits. You can read. I can't. Gatha marched up to her. You are serious? You can't read? That I will change. If you sharpen your mind as much as you sharpen your sword, you will rule the sky. I will rule the world underneath. Nothing would stop us. It was too much for Curry to hear. No, it's not true. It's the Kopak. He will rule the world, or at least Thera and the skies above. It will be him and not us. Gatha wheeled and grabbed Ymir's arm. Why didn't you tell me Curry can't read? Or did you know? Ymir took that moment to dispel Gatha's form magic. Luta Manonis. Her blades turned to dust. Her stone gauntlets fell in chunks onto the ocean-wet rock underneath them. I didn't know, Ymir said. Perhaps it's time you tell us about your past, Curry. Curry took three steps back. No, I'm no one. My history isn't important. But her future was. Her fateful fruit was vital to the Kopak and to the world. You were a mercenary fighting for the Josens, were you not? Gatha snarled. With this demon king on our continent, just that is important. And you will learn to read. I will teach you. Or you will have to kill me. The thought of hurting, really hurting the she-orc, hurt Curry's soul. I would never do that. Please, it has been very nice today, and very nice with the Kopak since our first, since he helped me with my hookay. I would help you, Gatha raised her chin. You are beautiful. You have passion. I would give you hookay. Curry couldn't help but cover her mouth as she laughed. You're using that word wrong. I have a hookay. But no, you see, the Winkin only find those with wings attractive. A piece of curry died saying the lie. It wasn't the truth. She found Gatha so very attractive, those eyes so full of life, the swell of her green breasts and the roundness of her hips. Then there was the fact that Gatha didn't wear underwear. Curry had caught glimpses of her ruru. Gatha nodded. Then I won't ask again. However, I've caught you looking at me and the other women. Ymir removed a ring and flipped it to Gatha, who caught it. She put it on and smiled. Oh, I like this idea. How do you work it? He took her other hand and pushed on another green finger. The gather breath makes it easier for you to make the change. Reach out, feel for her duja. It's easy to find. Curry is very powerful. Gatha blinked. Yes, I can see it. I can see your soul as well, Ymir. 
All are so very bright. Getha then closed her eyes. Yes, I see. Curry shivered. Again, those ghostly fingers touched her core. Gatha peeled off her leather tunic and stood naked except for her sandals. There was such a marked difference between her muscles and her firm, pert, light green breasts. Her nipples were thick and a darker green. Curry couldn't help but let her eyes travel down Gatha's body to look at her lips between her legs. Again, a dark green. Then Gatha's wings exploded from her back. Her feathers were a bright white, like her hair. Gatha ran and leapt into the air. She caught a gust of wind and went sailing upward. The fierce woman then did something Curry couldn't believe. She giggled. Ymir leaned back, watching the woman circle them in the sky. Then, of course, Gatha summoned weapons, her fire sword and a flaming shield. Curry wanted to go up there, to laugh with Gatha, but she wasn't sure if Ymir would mind. The Kopak saw her indecision. Go to her. I know you want to teach her things, but I must warn you of something. Curry's heart fell. Ymir grinned. Never tell a librarian you can't read. Lessons will begin today. The idea of learning to read frightened Curry, but then she seemed to have some time before her fate claimed her. She took off and flew up to Gatha. They sparred in the heavens. The she-orc did well for the most part, but Curry could have easily defeated her. After all, the Winkin had spent a decade in the skies, training and fighting. When Curry and Gatha landed, Ymir took back the two magical rings. Now, Curry, we'd like to show you a little gift we made for you. We hope you like it. Curry wanted to run. She wanted to fly back to her nest and be alone and sad. But no, she wouldn't do that to Ymir and his green-skinned wife. She would accept their gift, no matter how uncomfortable it made her. And yet, she was curious. What was Ymir's gift? Chapter 26 Ymir led Curry through the skies and back to the zoo. While he flew, he tried changing the color of his wings, from golden brown to red to black to white. He was getting better at using the flesh steel ring. Gatha followed them, using her moon's magic. Ymir heard Curry gasp when he first changed his wings. Then she gasped again when she saw her new nest clinging to the side of the zoo apartments. Tori had formed the rock into a shelf. There was a patio of rock that included a metal rail. Then it was Lily and Jenny Bell who figured out how to weave the grasses to form the nest, which rested on the platform. There was no way their weaving would be as good as Curry's, but then it was Tori again who cast form magic to make the roof waterproof. While Ymir, Curry, and Gatha had been out training at the Stormlight Island, Tori and the rest of Ymir's wives had gone to the Amora Annex and moved Curry's few possessions back to her new home. Inside the roost, a little door opened into the side of Ymir's room. However, they knew the Winkin would mostly come and go using her wings. Ymir could anticipate what Curry would do. She banked to the right and tried to flee the gift. He went after her while Gatha flew to the landing ledge and watched them. Ymir beat his wings and then caught Curry by her arm. She could have flown on, but she paused. He looked into her eyes. Don't throw away the gift I gave you. Don't insist on being alone. Curry collapsed into him, and he held her. She'd surrendered, finally, to his kindness. It had taken a month, but she was finally letting him into her life. They flew to the perch together. Gatha had finished building the fire in the stove, and the cheery flames popped and crackled. Sweet smoke leaked from the chimney. The new nest was bigger. She had her blankets, her pillows, and her mattress. Lily and Jenny Bell were there, as was Tori. Ziziva and Ribby were at the paradise tree, minding the store. Ymir vowed right then to find someone to work the counter so his wives wouldn't miss one more moment of their life together. He would have done it months ago, 
except Ziziva didn't want to relinquish control of any part of their business. They each cast flow magic so they could talk to Curry. Tori brought hot zoka and treats, little pastries filled with a spicy meat and cheese. I'd say this was a housewarming, but this is more a nest warming. It took you forever to come back from training, so everything is a little colder than I would have wanted, but still warm enough, I think. Yatha sat near the entrance. She snapped out her tusks. And where were you two this morning? The elf girl came over and hugged the she-orc. Today was about the crippled cicada. Tomorrow we'll do more spear practice. Or maybe Monday. Things are going well, finally. I want to finish it before... Lily paused. Tears shone in her eyes. I wanted to finish it is all. She was terrified and heartbroken at the thought of her mother's visit. Jenny Bell stood in a red and black dress, leaning against the wall, one that wasn't woven out of grasses. And I wasn't there because of this dumb portal magic. Let me tell you, I don't know what's more frustrating, trying to create a damn portal, or listening to fucking Lucibel Cujan talk bad about my family. Not that I don't talk bad about them myself. She looked uneasy. Luari Bell was now at Old Ironbound. She hadn't reached out to her, and Jenny thought she might send an assassin instead. Jenny on edge put Gatha on edge. Ymir knew why. Gatha had a bad history with her own sister, a terrible, bloody history of murder. She'd had to kill her sister in the pits, all because her mother was jealous of Gatha and thought she'd fail and die herself. It was a family destroyed. Curry took a pastry, ate one, and then sipped from a mug of hot zoka. Tears streamed down her face. For a second, all the women stopped talking. It was Tori that took over. Okay, Curry, let's get you seated next to the stove. I suppose you're cold. Here, we have a blanket for you. Gosh, everything's going to be okay. I know it. Or at least, I'd like to think I do. Jenny Bell went to leave, but Curry did the unexpected. Miss Josen, wait. All of you, you have been so nice to me, and I've kept to myself. I did this for a reason, a reason I can't talk about. But I know all of you have been wondering about the demon armies to the south, what I know about King Shapta, and maybe a bit of my past. I'm still young, only a bit older than Jenny Bell. Curry turned shy. She looked at Ymir. You know, there is a legend of Akoya, a queen, who could change the color of her wings. She is fated to rule our people, the warrior with the wings of the rainbow. When I saw you practicing using your magic ring, I thought of that. And don't think I didn't notice how your eyes change color. You are the Kopak of the world. I am sure of it. Perhaps. Or perhaps one day you will learn to change the color of your wings, and you will be the Koya who rules all of Rata. Curry looked amused, then sad. No, she said finally. Ymir sat next to Curry, against the woven wall, sipping his own drink and eating pastries. He looked upon the winged warrior with pride. He knew she was brave on certain battlefields, but Grandmother Rabbit would say there were many battles we fought in life, and most didn't involve an axe. The important ones were more about tears than blood. The Winkin glanced at Ymir. He looked her in the eyes and didn't need to say another word. She knew what she needed to do. I grew up with my father and his Elu in the city of Zysak. It is a small town, very far south from Almaquataka. We weren't rich, but we were happy and grateful to be living in the Sky City. My father thought the Chambawasi would become great because my older sisters would be great warriors. People were already writing stories about them, singing songs, and there was even talk of them having grand destinies. There were no dragons to kill, no, but there were demons. There was darkness, and the Chamba sisters worked to keep the darkness at bay. My sister, Lysandra, 
She might have done too well as a sky sheriff. She brought a darkness back to my family. All were slaughtered. I should have been too. But I... I tried to get away. Curry's face lost all emotion as she spoke. Her skin looked paper thin. My blood mother told me to run and hide, that she would give her life for me. It was her fate. She knew it. She said it would be worth it because I would do important things. Then the dark things came through Arwasi, ripping through my father first. The shadow cut off his wings, and then it was my sister's, and then it was all my love mother's. My blood mother ran with me to the edge of our perch. She pushed me. Then she was killed. I heard her blood splash on the floor. I can still hear it. I can still smell the demons. Roses. They smelled like roses. I remember seeing green flames flickering. But I don't know. I don't know. I was very young. No one spoke a word. Tears tracked down Lily's face. Gatha had her tusks out. She looked infuriated. Tori wrung her hands. Her brow was furrowed with concern. Jenny Bell's hair covered her face. She slowly shook her head at the girl's tragic night. Ymir knew that very few had heard Curry's life story. They were witnessing something sacred. He felt her sorrow, but he also felt Gatha's anger. He still had all of the rings on his fingers, and he was grateful for them. If any darkness came to kill his family, he would use every bit of power he had to burn down the world. It was strange. She said the darkness smelled like roses. He thought of Linny Lynn Albatross and her time in the gardens, and her involvement in the White Rose Society. Linny mentioned a dream about a demon with a face made of green fire. Now, more than ever, he couldn't trust her, but he was determined to use her. Ymir nodded for Curry to continue. He'd seen Lily fight her battles to tell her truths. It was Curry's turn. I was too scared to run. I didn't know where to hide. I couldn't fly away because I didn't have my wings yet. My mother pushed me off our perch, and I thought I would die. I hadn't felt, I didn't know, she'd tied rope to me. I swung out in the cold night. It was so cold. There were three moons in the sky. The angel moon, the dragon moon, and the demon moon. The demon moon was blood red. I knew it was because my family's blood had colored it so. She closed her eyes. I thought I would die. I thought the demons would come. I thought I would freeze to death. Instead, the sky sheriffs found me. They thought it was bad luck that I didn't die. I should have been killed. No one wanted anything to do with me. The orphan girl, wingless and found at the end of a bit of rope in the dawn sky. Curry's eyes blinked open. She took in the four women and Emir. But I wasn't ever a quickening girl. I wasn't a ground rat. I didn't rob or cheat. I worked hard until old Pea found me. Old Pea had worked with my sister, but she'd gone blind. She got money from a rich family, and it was old Pea and me. She trained me. She loved me. I didn't work cleaning or sweeping or even repairing the marble of the sky castle. My job was to become a warrior, like my father, like my sisters, and to find work as a mercenary. It took a long time. But I found work in General Sharkandrik's Machu's Tensuyuk. We found demons to slaughter in my lands, from the beaches to the deserts to the mountains. I fought things. But whatever darkness we expelled, it never smelled like roses, it was never what had killed my family. She swallowed hard. The tenth Suyuk was sent north to the Swamp Coast Queendom. 
General Sharkandrik's Machu didn't fight at the taking of Almaquataka or any of the cities in the Urqua Mountains. General Sharkan knew that we could find better pay in the north, though I never fought for money. I didn't want to be rich. I just didn't want to be a quickening girl or a cut-purse brigand. I fought for my Suyuk and my general, and I am proud of that. Her voice failed her. Ymir wondered at the next part of her story. Jenny Bell flung the hair from her face. And then you flew through the portal and showed up at Edrin's house, and here we are. I'm sorry, Curry, for all your troubles, but I have to get going. I don't mean to be a bitch, but I'm working on some things. Jenny had her teeth clamped shut. Muscles in her jaw twitched. Curry wiped her dry face, as if she had cried. But she didn't cry. Yes, I saw the portal, and I followed it through. The stories are true about the demon conqueror. He has machines, what you would call knowing lore, to turn Jataksha soldiers into his soldiers, and the women and men of the Swamp Coast Queendom into his warriors. Jenny said she was going to leave, but she couldn't. It was clear Curry's story had gotten to her. Curry looked into Ymir's face. But the Kopak is here, with his magical rings and his warrior wives. When the demon conqueror comes north, the Kopak will kill the demons, and he will rule all the lands. The withering will be gone, and there will be laughter and babies, and the sun will shine, and the rains will fall, cleansing the gardener's world. It will be a true paradise again. It will be the age of union once more. Only this time, it will be all the world around. Again, there was an awkward silence. This time, Tori broke it. I don't know, Curry, about us being warrior wives. I can do some form magic that might be helpful, but I'm better in the kitchen than on the battlefield. And I know that Lily and Jenny Bell don't like the fighting all that much. Gosh, listen to me ramble. Don't know what to say. Can't handle that awful quiet. Gatha went over and hugged Curry, hugged her with a ferocity, and then looked into the winged woman's eyes. It was the farg pang. More than Curry's new nest, it was Gatha welcoming Curry into their lives. For the farg pang was the gruel way of showing love and devotion. Jenny let out a hiss and ran from the nest. Lily went after her. Tori shook her head. Gosh, me underground, but I think our new friend is right. War is going to come to old Ironbound again. I better have potions galore this time, and fuck me Rocky, but I want Fluffy tamed by then. Tori awkwardly patted both the winged woman and the she-orc before leaving the nest. Ymir went over and held both Gatha and Curry to him. He was moved by the winged woman's story. However, she wasn't telling them something important. She spoke with a prophet's authority, and Ymir had the idea that her prophecy might point to a final, tragic chapter in her very sad life. Chapter 27 Ymir sat in the Sunfire Tower classroom and watched the rain trickle down the panes. He felt warm inside, watching the storm, he was comfortable, but at the same time, he couldn't help but brood in frustration. There was still so much they didn't know, not only about Curry, but about King Shapta. Lily still couldn't talk about the vision she'd had during the summer. She said it wasn't time yet. Was that because she knew the timing was important, or was it more her own feelings? It wasn't clear, and the elf girl would simply withdraw to her studio if Ymir brought it up. Lily would wake him up in the middle of the night when she woke from one of the sex dreams they'd all been having since the summer, maybe even before Edrin Hyendel's death. Edrin, like Della, had been plagued by the erotic phantasms. And though they had the information on how to make the eighth and final ring, Ymir couldn't read it, and Serena hadn't appeared in weeks. Could it be the Akira Corps had barred her from contacting them? Serena and those demons were enemies, that was clear, and if Ymir was going to side with anyone, it would be with the former Princept. 
However, Ymir was enjoying his classes. He'd learned how to make a potion that enhanced his duja. This would prove very useful when fighting. He could retain more magical energy, and if he was able to make enough of the potion, he just might be able to power himself up enough to use the black ice ring. Then he wouldn't have to rely on the gathered breath or the magical cores of his harem. Both he and Tori had read The Form Within the Flow by Fief and Rendlam, and the ideas in the book were striking. Tori thought she might be able to make a potion to not only control Fluffy, but to bring the hellhound out of the veil. As for Ymir, Rendlam had certain ideas of energy transfer and demonology. Rendlam was as interested in demons as Linny Lin Albatross. He accepted their reality, and he wanted to brew potions to manipulate them. Ymir's other classes were also going well. After Curry's confession, he saw his history of Raxid class in a whole new light. He sat at his desk, waiting for the class to start. He wasn't sure why the class was being taught in the Sunfire Tower, but then history didn't exactly have a direct tie to any of the four magic colleges. It did give him a chance to see a different part of campus, and he liked to look out over the Sunfire Field. He had so many memories of fighting there. The field was a splash of green against the dark scarlet of the red wall's burned bricks. The rain darkened the stone even farther. Those ramparts hadn't seen war in a thousand years. When Marib Delfino and the Aquaterab attacked, they'd come from the west, not the east. However, the red bricks in that eastern wall still remembered the last siege, and Ymir could see Brodor Bootblack wanting to keep the history, even when he had to clean and repair the stone. One of the best things about his history class was Ribby, who liked to sit behind him and make snarky comments about how dumb dirt worms were. She was joking, of course, since she was no longer the hateful woman she'd been. Still, he enjoyed her comments. Across the room were Daris Bokujin, Odd Corey, and the Viscount, Roger Nelnap. Nellie Bell Tucker was with them. Daris had caught up quickly, in both the history class and the demonology class. He might be a whelp, but Daris did have a keen mind. His intelligence had helped him consolidate power in such a short time. In name, he wasn't the ruler. But everyone knew Ari Bell Josen was too stupid to be queen. Even now, when she could have been plotting to retake her queendom, Ari Bell spent her days shopping in Stormcry. She had a dozen Jataksha warriors guarding her. They were the last of the 10th Suyuk, the only survivors other than Kuri. Even their general, Sharkandrix Machu, had been killed by King Shapta's demonic army. Curry avoided the other Jataksha. She'd broken ranks and disobeyed orders to fly through the portal. She wouldn't say why, since it was so out of character. They'd gotten most of Curry's story, but they hadn't gotten all of it. Most of the class so far had been about Rata, the southern continent. While Professor Fisher King focused on the southern continent, Niall Preet taught them about Ethra to the west. Fisher King had talked about the Jataksha wars with the dragons, who seemed part myth, part historical record. There had been dragons on Raxid, but Ymir didn't know if they were as powerful as Unger had been. He didn't think so. Unger hadn't been born on their world. He'd come here from beyond. That made Ymir think about rumors of the stair far underneath the Librarium Citadel, and it made him wonder about the portal magic that Jenny Bell was studying. Could they journey to other worlds? It seemed so. But why would Ymir leave when Raxid had such interesting people and places there? Fisher King also mentioned how stratified Jataxian society was. In many ways, it was like the Aquaterab, where certain families were more important than others. But in other ways, the Jataksha were like the orcs. The Winkin lived in city-states governed by a central kopak. That was a word Ymir knew quite well. All the city-states had large standing armies, paid for by a vibrant economy. Much of that economy came from Kaif and Zoka beans, so Ymir felt some satisfaction he'd done his part in feeding Curry when she'd been orphaned. While being a part of the army was the most honorable thing a wingkin could do, just below that was local law enforcement and protection in the form of sky sheriffs. These were not part of the army, no, but they took care of the cities. 
Each of the Jatakshya cities had the land city and the sky city, and of course, the very high status lived at the top of the sky cities. Curry's story made sense now. She'd been so fortunate to have been taken under the wing of old Pea. That old woman had saved her from servitude. No, mercenaries weren't as highly respected as the upper echelons of a city-state's military, and they didn't have the same clout as sky sheriffs, but they were honored, especially the older a mercenary was, since their age proved their skill in combat. Fisher King also discussed the legend of the Koya with the wings of the rainbow. It was your typical foundling story, where an unexpected soul rises to power. There was nothing new to that tale. There had been Jataksha over the years that could change the color of their wings, but it was a rare trait, maybe as rare as purple eyes among the clans, or having six toes on each foot. Ymir had known a great uncle who had to make his own boots because of that. Ymir found Rata history interesting, primarily because of the reality of demonic forces there. The darkness that smelled of roses hadn't just killed Curry's family. For centuries, Winken reported similar attacks. For 2,000 years, since around the Night of Fire, the demons troubled the southern continent. One in particular, King Shapta. He was the demon that had wiped out the heavenly Kopax who had ruled the Ninka Empire for thousands of years, all the way back to the Age of Union on Thera. Losing the divine line of kings broke up the empire, which led to the rise of the city-states. Before that, Jataksha had enjoyed peace and prosperity. Many believed that such a stable political realm helped them defeat the dragons. All of that changed with the murders of the heavenly Kopax. Then a drought hit, followed by the withering. Society was reordered, and men married multiple women. The harems were called Elus, and while King Shapta never stepped forward to rule directly, there was talk that he had ruled from behind the scenes, using puppet governors in each of the city-states. Ribby poked him here. I'd find history more interesting if they talked about sex more. You'd think none of these queens ever rode an ut before. Ymir laughed. Professor Preet approached the lectern at the front of the class. She adjusted her glasses and squinted at one of the timepieces on her wrist. Yes, well, let's get started. Today I'll give a brief introduction on Ethra, the continent to the west across the Weeping Sea. Be still, my fucking heart. Ribby whispered. Do you think Preet is hot? I think I like her frizzy hair. Ymir knew the mermaid was kidding. Nevertheless, after the wild dreams they were all having, he might end up in bed with Nile Preet at some point. His demonology professor was a voyeur, and his potions professor was flirting with him. So anything was possible. Niall Preet cleared her throat. Let's start with a very important date. October 9, 4914. We know that as the Night of Fire. But that year was year zero for Ethra. It was the same year the Pentacore kings rose to power. Before year zero, the Ethrans had the good kings who ruled over the good ancients. Yes, this isn't so different from the heavenly Kopax on Rata. And unlike the reign of the Kopax, much has been lost about the good kings. For you see... The Pentacore burned books, slew scholars, and said that all history started at year zero. Preet adjusted her glasses. For us, it is currently the year 5999. For the Ethrans, it is the year 1085. Dearest smirked. So they're 4,000 years behind us? Reductive thinking, Preet barked at the comment. Now, Mr. Kujan... King Kujan, the bully sneered. Ribby gave him a sneer of her own. Wouldn't it be King Josen, Darius? You took your wife's name. Josen Town is the seat of power, so let's call you Mr. Kujan for now. I can see you want to say something mean to me, but I wouldn't. A king without a country is just a boy, and I've killed many boys far younger than you. Ymir grinned at the mermaid. She might have mellowed some, but she still could be so salty. 
Preet put her hand to her mouth. Oh my, let's not threaten murder in my class. We have enough problems as it is. Let's get back to Ethra. Actually, the Ethrans called their land Zid. The old language, the language of the good ancients, is Sayskritch. Instead of calling our world Raxid, the Zidians called it Karanja, which is root in Sayskritch. Ethra is Zid, Thera is Rax, and the continent of Reta they call Ridrita. I know it's confusing. Our world is Raxid, and one of the names of our continent is Rax. However, one interesting thing to note, while we have the withering, they have the great disease, which was one of the things that also brought about the end of the good kings. Fewer and fewer babies were born, and there were fewer and fewer boys. The Pentacore kings experimented on different magic and knowing lore to try to cure the great disease. This created monsters for the most part, poor souls too perverted to continue living. And yet, it also brought forth any number of interesting races on Ethra. For this class, I'll be referring to it as Ethra and not Zid. Ymir thought about the numbers. The Pentacore kings. Five demon kings. Reta had a demon king as well, King Shapta to the south. Ymir felt ice on his spine. The hair on the back of his neck lifted off his skin. Preet continued. While we have magic as sunfire, moons, form, and flow, the Ethrans describe it as fire, air, earth, and water. Instead of focus rings, they have tattoos on their left arms, which they call concentration ink. They also have ways of burning themselves, called brands, that can increase their natural power. But I digress. Let me get back to the Pentacore. Ymir's heart pounded. Cold sweat covered him. He was listening, but at the same time he felt the flow magic pulling at him. It was going to be important. He thought about dispelling the vision, but he fought that inclination. Preet lectured on. The Pentacore kings divided up the lands to the west as follows. Ecom controlled the eastern coast, the Dawn Coast, which included the Prachi Archipelago. There's a very good magic academy there, Kambada University. Ecom's former territory is still the most powerful and the most stable, though Ecom hasn't been seen in centuries. None of the Pentacore still rule. They faded. Their machines stopped working. A great many foolish kings tried to take control of the different regions. Preet glanced at Ymir. She was worried. He must have looked pale. The professor licked her lips and turned. What was I saying, Professor Fisher King? The old woman looked up from her sand parchment. You were discussing the Pentacore kings and their regions. Preet nodded. So, Ecom ruled the coastland. Deve ruled the Nectar Grasslands and its capital city, Sweetleaf. The Nectar Grasslands are known for their horse people, the Winnem. The men are centaurs, the women walk on feet, though they are massive and exceptionally hairy. And beautiful, some say. Ribby laughed under her breath. Giant, hairy women? Are we taking a trip, Ymir? You would have fun with such women. We all would, I think. Ymir reached back and tapped her leg to hush her. He felt his skin tingling. Something was happening. His mind felt like it was working to solve a puzzle that his soul already knew the answer to. The lecture continued. The third Pentacore king was Treen, and he ruled the Morbu Forest and the Score Forest on either side of the Diuvan Mountains. The dwarves there are a forest-dwelling people called the Silvicore. Some say the Morbuscore dug a tunnel under the ocean and simply found a different way to live. Whatever is the case, the Silvicore have grand tree houses and all kinds of ingenious knowing lore. Treen aided them in that. However, the Silvicore, unlike their underground cousins, were affected by the withering, also known as the Great Disease. As for the Diuvan Mountains themselves, that's where Chotvar, the fourth Pentacore king, ruled. In the Diuvan Mountains are Snow Naga, ice serpent men who slide down the slopes on their serpentine tails. Little is known about them, though some think they were merfolk, 
taken from the sea and perverted into nagas. Maybe perverted is the wrong word. I like the word, Ribby whispered. Ymir couldn't comment on her joke. His stomach felt like it was on fire. His organs seemed to be boiling. Preet finished off the list. And then you have Pancham, the last and perhaps the most powerful of the Pentacore, in the Aschima Wastes. Aschima used to be the grandest of the kingdoms of the good ancients, and the Sukra Jin were a rich people. Interesting note, the Sukra Jin have four arms instead of two. Some call them demon people, but most serious scholars agree they are no more demonic than any of the other races. And those are the five long-dead rulers and their kingdoms, Ikam, Deve, Trin, Chatvar, and Pancham, the Pentacore kings. Demon kings, Ymir whispered. But in Seskritch, there would be two others, Shot to the north, Shapta to the south. The minute he said the words, he was taken back to the inner sanctum of the lonely man's cave, only it was more temple than cave. There, on the floor, he saw the pools. Five green pools. Not to the east, but to the west. He had looked at them wrong. A mud pit to the south, a mud pit to the north, and that central place of darkness. That was where the lonely man had been. The demon that had cursed him. Eight pools altogether, eight Akiric rings. King Shapta to the south, King Shot to the north on the axe tundra. He had been the lonely man, and Ymir had killed him. He had killed one of the seven demon kings that had plagued the world. But there were eight pools. The door to the classroom opened and smashed against the wall. Lily stood there, pale, and yet looking far more regal than Daris Bo Kujan could ever hope to be. Or should it be Daris Bo Josen? He'd betrayed and abandoned his family for power, after all. Preet adjusted her glasses. Lily Nahenna, what is the meaning of this? Ymir, the elf girl said. I need to talk with Ymir. Ymir knew exactly what it was about. Lily had come to tell him everything she'd seen the night Edrin died. Given the nature of his new understanding of events, it couldn't have come at a better time. Chapter 28 Of course, Ribby wasn't going to sit in the classroom while Ymir and Lily talked. She walked down with them to the front of the Sunfire Tower, the three of them stood under the eaves as the rain poured down outside. Ymir let Lily talk first. She was having trouble catching her breath. I can't explain it. In my vision, wearing the veiled tear ring, it changed time for me. I couldn't tell you what I saw until this moment. I had to wait until you joined me. You just had a vision, didn't you? Ymir shrugged. Perhaps. It's more like a new understanding. The lonely man was shot, the demon king of the north. That's partly true, I think. But there's more. I know there's more. Ribby laughed. You dirtworms have no idea about the flow of the world. Of course Lily had to wait. And Ymir, of course there's more. But keep talking, sweet Lily. Lily was so very pale. Edrin was there during the night of fire. Like he said, he hid. But he saw the battle and what happened afterwards. I was there with him. It felt like a dream before. But now it feels like my own memory. Ribby didn't joke anymore. She was worried for both Lily and Ymir. Both were caught in a magic that transcended everything they knew. Breathlessly, Lily recounted the battle. A purple-eyed, dark-haired elf warrior led them. Lanalahana wore crackling moon's armor. Wreathed in lightning, she had a spear of blinding energy. Lanala had spent a hundred years hating Egil Acrador for killing her family. She wanted Egil for herself, 
but fought against a figure in black armor. Eyes of green fire burned behind the visor of a raven-shaped helmet. He smelled like roses. The figure in black armor smashed a flail into Linala, and she fell to her knees. The brave elven woman would have been killed, but her friend, a Winkin, flew in to protect her. It was Kursok Keruth, wielding her twin swords, that stabbed the Corvidae soldier in the chest. The blow should have killed the armored fiend. Instead, he was merely knocked back. Only it wasn't a he. It was Horentia the Raven, one of the wives of Egil Acrador. The Corvidae weren't just Egil's private guards. They were his wives, Lily whispered. I'm not sure even Edrin knew that. Ymir knew about the theory. It had just been confirmed. Lily whispered more. Lenala wasn't fated to kill Egil. In fact, she wasn't destined to kill anyone that night. Not even the Corvidae she fought. Seven personal guards for Egil Acrador. Seven governors ruling his provinces. Seven wives in his harem. All were the same. The same seven women, and they didn't die in the night of fire. They couldn't die, just like Egil Acrador couldn't die. The Ring of the Awakened wouldn't let that happen, even after it was destroyed. Lily told them more about that night, but as she talked, Ymir could see it. The icy fingers were back on his spine. He felt the flow magic around them as he watched the night where the Fellowship of the Enraged won their way to the rooftops of Castle Sky Reach. Linala and her dwarf friend, Buckman Saltrock, were on one side of the roof. Buckman fought with a single-bladed axe and gripped a round shield. The Vemper had nearly killed Buckman years earlier, but the dwarf managed to escape. However, Egil stole every sheck of gold Buckman had. The dwarf was left penniless, and full of hate. Prince Zoth of Kreen, a lesser prince of the Sorrow Coast, also held a grudge. The Vemper had raped and killed his wife, Etheria. Lovely Etheria, whose name had been erased by time. Gruul and Grantha of Goyot, orcs, had lost children to the Vemper and his lust for power. Esri Whisperkiss, the fairy who fought with them, had lost her beauty and innocence. She'd been tortured by Egil Acrador himself, but she never betrayed the secrets of the Fae. And with Esri was a Winkin warrior, Kursok Kiruth, fighting with her Kurichia. Why was she there? Kursok Kiruth had left her home, though she could have been a ruler. For Kursok had the wings of the rainbow. She could change the color of her feathers at will, but she knew that Egil was every bit the villain that her ancestors had fought. It was her duty to destroy evil where she could. All seven of the heroes of the Fellowship of the Enraged faced all seven of Egil's wives. Fionn Yamal, though, fought the Vemper himself. He cut off Egil's hands. Unger burned them all with his shadow flame, and Fionn tossed the Akiric rings into the flames. The dragon then murdered everyone on the rooftop. Before she died, Kursak Kiruth screamed in outrage and sorrow. To be slain by a dragon was impossible for her to accept. It destroyed her. We thought the shadow flame killed the Corvidae, but no. Tears leaked down Lily's cheeks. There were portals. The Corvidae escaped through portals but they were hurting, wounded, dying, because the Ring of the Awakened had been destroyed. Their lives were tied to the Ring, but after a thousand years, they wouldn't just fade immediately. They clung to life. Thunder cracked overhead. Lightning flashed around them. It was as if the sky itself didn't want the truth to be known. Ymir had to speak. Five pools to the west, five demon queens of Ethra, only they hid their sexes. It was easy for them to do. They'd been doing it for hundreds upon hundreds of years. 
a demon to the south, on Rata, Queen Shapta. Lily was close to sobbing. They took old names, but they were not the demons of old. Shapta was Horencia the Raven, and it is Horencia the Raven who now sits on the throne in Josentown. Tell me the other name. What is the true name of the lonely man? Ymir demanded. Lily let out a shriek. Brave Curla! Brave Curla went north to become shot. Only she was weak, so very weak. Weaker than the others, because Egil needed her dusha. Egil was hurt more than all the rest. He went to sleep. The sleeper, Ymir hissed. Ribby had changed her legs to tentacles. She was holding both Ymir and Lily, and even the mermaid was weeping. She probably didn't even know why. Lily choked out more names. Shy Amalia is Ecom. Haley Gold is Devay. Bly is Treen. Kyla is Chotvar. Lucy the Last is Puncham. Those five are the Pentacor. Ymir could hardly believe it, but no, he knew it was the truth. He'd not been cursed by the lonely man. It had been the lonely woman, the lonely demon, brave Curla. And he'd killed her somehow, hadn't he? Ymir found himself growling. Fucking demons. If Queen Shapta, Orencia the Raven, is back, then the Pentacor, long dormant, might also return. We need to find someone who can tell us if there are demonic forces on Ethra. Ruby let go of them with her tentacles. Visions can be such a pain in the ass. But you both are looking better, though you're still scaring the fuck out of me. Maybe I was wrong. Maybe you do know about the flow. We'll be fine. Ymir took Lily's face in his hands. He used his thumbs to wipe the tears from her face. Lily is freeing herself from these dark dreams. We heal through our mouths, the elf girl murmured. Ribby sighed. Okay, I have a second cousin, twice removed, named Ibithi Ali Bubano, of the Bubano family. She might be able to tell us if there has been trouble on the Dawn Coast, at least. Ymir nodded. The Corvidae escaped through the portals, like you said. Only, when Egil died and the rings were destroyed, it twisted them. They might be demons now, but at one point, they were women. Why now? Why are the fucking Corvidae coming back now? Ribby asked. Ymir didn't answer the question right away. He grabbed Lily's hand. We have to talk to Curry. I'm recalling something about the night Edrin died. Ymir and Lily put on their hoods and hurried through the rain across campus. Ribby ran after them, not worrying about the rain. She looked better wet, anyway. The three burst into the zoo and quickly traversed the stairs down to Ymir's room. No one else was home. Tori would either be in class or in the feasting hall's kitchen. Ziziva was at the paradise tree. Gatha was in the library, working on the Hyendel collection. Jenny was working on her portal magic, which was more important than ever now. Ymir knocked on Curry's nest door. The Winkin answered it. She knew immediately there was something wrong. Because of the translation magic, and because she was very smart, her pigeon was good enough for her to communicate without a spell. You come. You worried. What is the wrong? Ymir didn't want to get Curry's nest wet. Lily was already getting them towels and mopping up some. Ribby stopped her. Fuck, Lily. You're a fucking princess, remember? We don't need to worry about wet floors right now. We're talking about climactic events that could change everything. Curry grabbed Ymir's arm. What is the wrong? He gazed into her blue, blue eyes. The night the old elf died, when you followed the Hell Knight and the Rat Wings through the portal, who did they attack first? Do you remember? Curry pointed. Lily. The elf girl gasped. Me? Why? Ymir nodded. Because you were wearing the veiled tear ring. All this time, I thought they had come to assassinate Edrin, but he simply died by accident. 
they didn't want you to have your vision. And I bet there has been magic keeping the vision blocked. Today, though, when I realized the truth of the lonely man's lair, it broke that spell. I know now. You know. And I think Horencia the Raven knows as well. I will not be calling her King Shapta again. They are drawn to the rings, Lily said. They know about the rings, and they want you to finish them. Isn't it obvious? You can't do it, Ymir. And we should destroy the rings we have. They were weakened because whatever magic they had was waning. They went to sleep. They waited. Then brave Curla felt you, and she knew that you could do what her husband did two thousand years ago. You could reforge the rings. Curla didn't curse you. She gave you a quest. Lily was right. Ymir could easily see Sativ Kins working for both the Midnight Guild and the White Rose Society. One to kill him, the other to trick him into making the Black Ice Ring. It might have been a gamble, because Ymir had almost decided to destroy his own Duja. But he hadn't. And with each ring, the demons grew more powerful. We should all talk, Ymir said. We should tell everyone, including Della, about all of this. But I have to tell you, Lily, my mind is made up. He didn't say what his final decision was. He didn't want to have to repeat himself, and he figured it wouldn't be very popular. He sent word to the various women in his life, and they all met outside the scrollery gate on the main floor of the Librarium Citadel. Gatha opened the lock, and they walked down. The sunfire lanterns warmed the place, and Gatha had categorized and shelved Edrin's library. The place was as organized as ever. Ymir hadn't requested food nor drink. This wasn't a party. This was the business of war. All the women sat down, including Curry, who stayed near Gatha. While Lily was the kindest of Ymir's wives, Curry had bonded with the she-orc. Both were strong. Both were warriors. Both were falling in love with each other. Ymir could see it. Jenny Bell was a bit drunk. She'd stopped off at the Unicorn's Oot after class to gossip with her old friends from the Swamp Coast Queendom. It had been a good choice. The more information they had, the better. Tori was fidgety, not having anything to serve nor eat. Can't I just pop up to the kitchen? I could make some popcorn. Or I have some sweet cream. I know Gatha likes sweet cream. It's fine, Ymir said sternly. If we are hungry, we can eat later. Gatha nodded. I do like sweet cream. Curry looked confused. Gatha whispered something into the winged woman's ear. Della sat between Jenny Bell and Ribby. She was friendly with both, but still very appropriate. She frowned. I would like to know why we are here. What is the purpose of this little palaver? Such a fun word, Ziziva squealed. She stood on the table in her winkle self, keeping track of Gertie as the tiny little baby crawled around, playing with the fingers of the women at the table. Ymir told them about Lily's vision and his own realization. It was clear that Horencia's rise to power had something to do with Ymir forging the Akiric rings. There was no telling if the Pentacore to the west were stirring, only that Ymir had already killed brave Curla to the north. But what about Egolacrador himself? Would he rise? Ymir remembered a dream, or a vision, along the way. He'd seen a creature crawling from the central mud pit. However, it wouldn't be in brave Curla's lair, no, because the whole cavern had collapsed after her death. Jenny Bell scowled. This is some swamp summoning magic shit, all right. We can't make that last ring, because I'm going to figure out portal magic, both opening impossible doors and making wards to make places safe. If we bring Eagle Acrador back by forging this last ring, I would imagine he'll show up right here. Or am I fucking missing something? Ymir watched Della closely. She wasn't speaking. Gatha snapped out her tusks. I refuse to live in fear. If the Vemper returns, we shall kill him again. We will have all eight of the rings. 
Lily shook her head. What if we can't? What if he takes the ring somehow? She scooped up Gertie in her hand. But then the Fae baby decided she wanted to cuddle with the elf girl. Gertie turned into her verum self so Lily could hold her close. Zizava fluttered around Lily and her baby, smiling at how wonderful they were. It was like the Fae wasn't listening. Ymir knew she was. Zizava was too smart not to listen. Tori wrung her hands. I don't know what to think about all this. I don't like that Ymir was cursed by one of these old women. And they have to be old, don't they? Gosh me underground, it does put a fright in me. We're going to be fighting things a thousand years old or older. Yet, like with Fluffy, just because we can't understand it doesn't mean we should run from it. Jenny Bell rolled her eyes. Yeah, we should run from it. We shouldn't fuck with shit we don't understand. Ribby laughed. We've fucked with shit before. Look, sweetie, we should gather more information. You should work on your magic. I'll check with my cousins on the Dawn Coast in Ethra. If the Pentacore are causing trouble, then we might want to think more carefully about forging the Eighth Ring. And what do you say, Della? Ymir asked. The princept had a wry smile on her face. We don't even know if we'll even be able to forge the final ring. Serena Sia hasn't returned to our halls, and we don't know if the erotic dreams have anything to do with this or not, do we? You aren't wrong, Ymir said quietly. For now, the question is moot. We don't have an option to forge the final ring, but I do believe that the time will come when we will have to make that decision. And I'm certain that Linny Lynn Albatross and the White Rose Society are not on our side. She has been obsessed with demons for most of her life. Demons that smell of roses. Perhaps a demon with a face made from flickering green flames. He remembered the story of how Lanala Hanna had almost been killed by Horencia the Raven. But it was the Winkin princess, Kursaw Kiruth, who saved her. Curry stared into his eyes. For a moment, her profound sadness gave way to fury. She had a right to be angry. Ymir was fairly certain that it was Horencia the Raven herself that murdered Curry's family on that night. But why? It might not matter. What did? Ymir wanted every weapon available to him to fight these demons. He wanted Curry to have her vengeance, and with all eight of the rings, she would get it. For these weren't Egil's Akiric rings. They were Ymir's, and he would wear them when he visited the Axe Tundra, when he was triumphant.